Section 21 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century, by Jules Verne. First Part, Chapter 5, Part 1. Captain Cook's Third Voyage, 1B. On the 29th of May, Cook set sail on his return to Anamuka, thence to Tongatabou, where a feast or keiva, more magnificent than any he had seen, was given in his honor. That is to say, the dances of the night were performed in front of Fina Ou's house. We saw twelve dances during the time. They were executed by women, and in the midst of them we noticed the arrival of a number of men, who formed a ring within that of the dancing women. Twenty-four men, who executed a third, made a movement with the hands, which was greatly applauded, and which we had not previously seen. The orchestra was renewed once. Fina Ou appeared upon the scene at the head of fifty dancers, most magnificently apparelled. His garment consisted of cloth and a large piece of gauze, and round his neck small figures were suspended. Cook, after a stay of three months, thought it well to leave these enchanting islands, he distributed a share of the cattle he had bought at the Cape, and explained, through Mai, the way of feeding them and their utility. Before leaving, he visited a cemetery, or Fiatoka, belonging to the king, composed of three good-sized houses placed on the edge of a sort of hill. The planks of these buildings, and the artificial hills which supported them, were covered with pretty movable pebbles, and flat stones, placed erect, surrounded the whole. One thing which we had not previously seen was that the buildings were open on one side, and within there were two wooden busts, roughly carved, one at the entrance and the other a little within. The natives followed us to the door, but dared not pass the threshold. We asked them the meaning of the busts. They assured us that they did not represent any divinity, but were intended to recall two chiefs who were buried in the Fiatoka. Leaving Tonga Tabo on the 10th of July, Cook repaired to the small of Eoa, where his old friend Tai One received him cordially. The captain learned from him that the property of the various islands in the archipelago belonged to the chiefs of Tonga Tabou, which was known as the land of the chiefs. Thus Poulaho had a hundred and fifty islands under his rule. The most important are Vavao and Hamao. As for the Viti Islands, which are comprised in this number, they were inhabited by a warlike race, very superior in intelligence to those of the friendly islands. We can only refer to some of the many and interesting particulars collected by the captain and the naturalist Anderson, which relate to the gentleness and docility of the natives. Cook could do nothing but praise the welcome accorded to him each time he stayed in the archipelago. But then he did not guess the project entertained by Fina Ou and the other chiefs of assassinating him during the nocturnal feast of Hapae and of seizing his vessels. The navigators who succeeded him were not lavish in their praises, and if we did not know his sincerity, we should be tempted to think that the illustrious mariner gave the name of friendly islands to this group satirically. The inhabitants of Tonga Island always mourned the death of a relation by hitting themselves on their cheeks, and by tearing them with whale's teeth, a custom which explains the many tumors and cicatrices they have on the face. If their friends are dangerously ill, they sacrifice one or two joints of their little finger to propitiate the divinity, and Cook did not meet with one native in ten who was not mutilated. The expression taboo, he says, which plays so great a part in the language of this people, has a very wide significance. When they are not allowed to touch anything, they say it is taboo. They also told us that if the king enters a house belonging to one of his subjects, the house becomes taboo, and the owner of it may not live in it any longer. Cook fancied he had made out their religion. Their principal god is Kalafotonga, and in his anger he destroys plantations and scatters illness and death. The religious ideas of all the islands are not alike, but the immortality of the soul is unanimously admitted. Although they do not offer fruit or other productions of the earth to their divinity, they sacrifice human victims. 
cook lost sight of the tonga islands on the seventeenth of july and the expedition arrived in sight of an island called tabouai by the inhabitants upon the eighth of august after a series of tempestuous winds which caused serious damage to the discovery all the eloquence of the english failed to bring the natives on board nothing would induce them to leave their boats and they contented themselves with inviting the strangers to visit them but as time pressed and cook had no need of provisions he passed the island without stopping although it appeared to him fertile and the natives assured him that it abounded in pigs and fowls strong tall and active the natives had a hardy and savage appearance they spoke the tahitan language which made intercourse with them easy some days later the verdant summits of tahiti appeared on the horizon and the two vessels were not slow in stopping opposite the peninsula of tairabon where the welcome Mai received from his compatriots was as indifferent as possible his brother-in-law chief oati would scarcely consent to recognize him but when Mai showed him the treasures he brought back amongst them all the famous red feathers which had been so successful in cook's last voyage oati changed his demeanour treated Mai affably and proposed to change names with him Mai was overcome by these demonstrations of tenderness and but for cook's interference would have been robbed of all his treasures the ships were well supplied with red feathers therefore fruits pigs and fowls appeared in great abundance during the stay in port cook however soon proceeded to matavai bay where king otto left his residence at panay to pay his old friend a visit mai was disdainfully received by his friends there also and although he threw himself at the king's feet when he presented him with a tuft of red feathers and three pieces of gold cloth he was scarcely noticed but as at takabo the treatment changed suddenly upon the discovery of mai's fortune but he being only happy in the company of vagabonds who laughed at him good-naturedly even while they robbed him was unable to acquire the influence over otto and the principal chiefs which was necessary to the development of civilization cook had long heard that human sacrifices were common in tahiti but he had always refused to believe it a solemn ceremonial which he saw at atahor no longer allowed him to doubt the existence of the practice in order to gain the favourable assistance of the atoua or godon in an expedition against the island of Emeo, a man of the lowest social rank was killed by blows with clubs in the king's presence as an offering the hair and one eye of the victim was placed before the king last signs of the cannibalism which formerly existed in this archipelago at the end of this barbarous ceremony which was a blot in the memoirs of so peaceable a people a kingfisher alighted in the foliage it is atoua cried otto delighted at the happy augury next day the ceremony was to be continued by a holocaust of pigs the priests like the roman augurs sought to read the history of the expedition in the dying struggles of the victims cook who had silently assisted at the ceremony could not conceal the horror with which it inspired him mai interpreted for him eloquently and forcibly toha could scarcely contain his anger if the king had killed a man in england said mai as he has done the unhappy and innocent victim he has offered to his gods it would have been impossible to save him from hanging a punishment reserved for murderers and assassins mai's severe reflection was a little out of place cook should have remembered that manners vary with countries it is absurd to attempt to apply to tahiti as punishment for that which is their custom a punishment reserved in london for what is considered a crime every man's house is his castle says a popular proverb which european nations have too often forgotten under the pretext of civilization they have often shed more blood than would have flowed if they had not interfered before he left tahiti cook bestowed all the animals he had had so much difficulty in bringing from europe upon otto they were geese ducks turkeys goats sheep horses and cattle otto was at a loss to express his gratitude to the areke no pretonne king of britain especially when he found that the english could not take a large pirogue on board which he had constructed as an offering for his friend the king of england it being too large the resolution and the discovery left tahiti on the thirtieth of september and anchored at Emeo. in this place their stay was marked by a painful incident 
Frequent thefts had occurred for several days when a goat was stolen. To make an example, Cook burned five or six cabins and set fire to a large number of pirogues, threatening the king with his anger if the animal were not immediately produced. As soon as he had obtained satisfaction, the captain started for Huajene with Mai, who was to settle on that island. A sufficiently large space of land was ceded by the chiefs of the Oware settlement in return for such presents. Upon this, Cook had a house built and planted a garden, where he planted European cabbages. Mai was left with two houses, two goats, and fowls. At the same time, he was presented with a present of a coat of mail, of a complete set of armor, powder, balls, and guns, a portable organ, an electrical machine, fireworks, and domestic and agricultural implements completed the collection of useful and ornamental presents intended to give the Tahitans an idea of European civilization. Mai had a sister married at Huajene, but her husband occupied too humble a position for him to attempt to despoil him. Cook then solemnly declared that the native was his friend, and that in a short time he should return to ascertain how he had been treated, and that he should severely punish those who had acted badly to him. His threats were likely to be effective, as a few days earlier some robbers, caught in the act by the English, had had their heads shaved and their ears cut. A little later, at Rayatea, in order to force the natives to send back some deserters, Cook had carried off the entire family of the chief Oreo on one rope. The moderation exhibited by the captain in his first voyage constantly diminished. Every day he became more severe and exacting. This change in his conduct was fatal to him. The two Zealanders who had asked to accompany Mai were landed with him. The elder readily consented to live at Huajene, but the younger conceived such an affection for the English that it was necessary to use force, as it were, to land him, amid the most touching demonstrations of affection. At the last moment, as anchor was weighed, Cook bid farewell to Mai, whose expression and tears testified to his comprehension of all he was to lose. Although Cook left satisfied with having loaded the young Tahitan, who had trusted himself to him with benefits, he was also full of anxious fears as to his future. He knew his light and inconstant character, and he left him weapons with some regret, fearing that he might make a bad use of them. The king of Huajene gave Mai his daughter in marriage, and changed his name to Paori, by which he was afterwards known. Mai profited by his high station to show his cruelty and inhumanity always armed he began to try his skill with pistol and gun upon his fellow countrymen his memory therefore is hated in huajene and the memory of his crimes was for a long time associated with that of the english cook visited rayatea before leaving the island he found his friend ore deprived of supreme authority then he went to Bolabole on the 8th of December, and bought of the king pony and anchor, which Bougainville had lost in the roadstead. During his long sojourns in the different islands of the Society Archipelago, Cook completed his geographical, hydrographical, and ethnological investigations, as well as his studies of natural history. In this difficult task he was seconded by Anderson and by his entire staff, who invariably showed the greatest zeal in their efforts for the advancement of science. On the 24th of December, Cook discovered another low island. It was uninhabited, and the crew obtained abundance of turtle there. It was named Christmas Island, in honor of the solemn anniversary of the morrow. Although seventeen months had passed since he had left England, Cook considered his voyage as only begun. Indeed, he had not as yet been able to put the part of his instructions relating to the exploration of the southern Atlantic and the search for a north passage into execution. End of section 21section twenty two of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne first part chapter five part two captain cook's third voyage two a Discovery of the Sandwich Islands Exploration of the Western Shore of America From thence to Bering Straits 
Return to the Hawaiian Group. History of Rono. Death of Cook. Return of Expedition to England. On the 18th of January, 1778, in longitude 160 degrees and latitude 20 degrees north, the two vessels perceived the first islands of the Sandwich or Hawaiian archipelago. It did not take long to convince the navigators that they were inhabited. A large number of pirogues left Atoi or Tavai Island and surrounded the ships. The English were not a little surprised at hearing these natives speak in the Tahitan language. On this account the intercourse between them was soon friendly, and next day numbers of the islanders agreed to go on board. They showed their astonishment and admiration at the sight of so many unknown objects by their looks, gestures, and continual exclamations. Iron they were acquainted with, and called Hamaite. But their covetousness was soon excited by so many curiosities and precious things, and they tried to appropriate them both by honest and by illicit means. Their cleverness and their taste for thieving was as keen as is usual with the natives of the southern seas. It was necessary to take a thousand precautions, and they were often taken in vain, to guard against their larceny. The English, when they approached the shore, under charge of Lieutenant Williamson, to sound and search for anchorage, were forced to repulse the attempts of the natives by force. The death of one of them repressed their turbulence in a measure, and gave them an exalted opinion of the strength of the new arrivals. As soon, however, as the resolution and discovery had cast anchor in Owai Mea Bay, Cook had himself taken on shore. He had scarcely touched land, when the natives assembled in a crowd upon the strand, prostrated themselves at his feet, and welcomed him with signs of the most profound respect. This extraordinary reception gave promise of a pleasant stay, for provisions appeared to be abundant. Fruits, pigs, fowls began to arrive from all parts. At the same time a party of natives assisted the English sailors in filling the casks with water, and in carrying them on board. Anderson and the draftsman Weller were encouraged by this friendly conduct to advance into the interior. They were not long in coming upon a morai, similar in every respect to the Tahitian morais. This discovery confirmed the English in the ideas induced by the similarity of the language with that of the Tahiti. An engraving in Cook's narrative represents the interior of this morai. In it two figures may be seen, standing, the top of the heads disappearing in high cylindrical hats, similar to those on the statues in the Easter Island. In any case, the singular resemblance gives rise to reflection. Cook remained two days more in this anchorage, and could only extol the traffic with the natives. He then explored the neighboring island of Onihau. In spite of his great wish to explore the interesting archipelago, he set sail, and from a distance perceived Oahu Island, and the reef of Tahura, which he designated by the general appellation of Sandwich Archipelago. This name has been superseded by the native appellation of Hawaii. Strong and vigorous, although of medium height, the Hawaiians are represented by Anderson as being of frank and loyal character, not so serious as the natives of the friendly islands, they are less frivolous than the Tahitans. Clever, industrious, and intelligent, their plantations showed a knowledge of rural economy, and an extensive taste for agriculture. They not only abstained from showing the childish and common curiosity, which the English had so often noticed, but they inquired into their customs, and evinced a certain regret for their own inferiority. The population appeared considerable, and was estimated at 30,000 in Tavai Island alone. In their style of dress, their choice of food, their manner of preparing it, and their general habits, they conform to the customs of Tahiti. This identity of two populations separated by a large stretch of sea gave the English much food for reflection. During his first stay, Cook did not become acquainted with any chief, but Captain Clerk, of the Discovery, at last received a visit from one. He was a young and well-made man, wrapped up from head to foot. The natives testified their respect by kneeling before him. Clark made him several presents, and in return received a vase decorated with two small figures, fairly well sculptured, which served for the kava, a favorite drink of the Hawaiians, as well as the natives of Tonga. Their weapons comprised bows, clubs, and lances, the latter made of a strong and durable wood, and a sort of poignard called papoa 
terminating in a point at both ends the custom of taboo was just as universally practised as in the friendly islands and the natives were always careful to ask if things were taboo before they touched them on the twenty seventh of february cook continued his course to the north and soon fell in with the sea rack of the rocks mentioned by the narrator of lord anson's voyage on the first of march he steered for the east in order to approach the american coast and five days later he recognized new albion so named by francis drake the expedition coasting at a distance surveyed cape blanc already seen by martin d'aguilar on the nineteenth of january sixteen o three and near which the geographers placed a large opening to the strait the discovery of which they attributed to him shortly afterwards the latitude of juan de fuca was reached but nothing resembling it was discovered although this strait really exists and divides the continent from vancouver's island cook soon reconnoitred a bay in latitude forty nine degrees fifteen minutes to which he gave the name of hope bay he anchored there to obtain water and give a little rest to his worn-out crews the coast was inhabited and three boats approached the vessel one of the savages he says rose up and with many gesticulations made a long speech which we understood as an invitation to land in addition he threw feathers towards us and many of his companions threw us handfuls of dust or red powder the native who usurped the post of orator was clothed in a skin and in each hand he held something which he shook and which emitted a sound like that of a child's rattle when he was tired of haranguing and exhorting of which we did not understand a word he rested but two other men took up the speech in succession their speeches were not so long and they did not declaim so vehemently many of the natives had their faces painted in an extraordinary way the feathers fixed in their heads although they appeared friendly it was impossible to persuade any of them to come on board however as the vessels had cast anchor the captain had the sails furled took in the topmasts and unrigged the mizzenmast of the resolution in order to allow of repairs barter with the indians soon commenced and the most rigorous honesty prevailed the objects offered were bear and wolf skins and those of foxes deers and polecats weasels and especially otters which are found in the islands east of kamchatka also clothes made by a kind of hemp bows lances fish-hooks monstrous figures and a kind of stuff of hair or wool bags filled with red ochre trinkets of copper and iron shaped like horseshoes which they wore hung from the nose human ears and hands not yet free from flesh struck us most among the things they offered us they made us clearly understand that they had eaten the portions that were missing and we indeed perceived that these hands and ears had been on the fire the english were not long in ascertaining that these natives were as habitual robbers as any they had hitherto met with they were even more dangerous as possessing iron implements they could easily cut the cords they combined their thefts with intelligence and one of them amused the sentinel at one end of the boat whilst another snatched the iron from the other end they sold a quantity of very good oil and a great deal of fish especially sardines when the numerous repairs needed by the ships were made and the grass required for the few goats and sheep remaining on board had been shipped cook set sail on the twenty sixth of april seventeen seventy eight he gave the name of king george's sound to the spot where he had stayed although it was called nutka by the natives the vessels had scarcely gained the open sea when a violent tempest overtook them during which the resolution sprang a leak on the starboard side below the water line carried away by the storm cook passed the spot selected by geographers as the situation of the strait of admiral de fonte although he greatly wished to dispel all doubts on the subject the captain therefore continued along the american coast surveying and naming the principal points during this cruise he had constant intercourse with the indians and was not slow in noticing that their canoes had been replaced by boats of which only the framework was wood and over which were spread sealskins after a stay at prince william's sound where the leak of the resolution was repaired cook resumed his voyage reconnoitred and named elizabeth and st hermogene capes banks point capes douglas and bead san augustine's mount the river cook kodiak island trinity island and the islands called shumagin by bering 
afterwards he passed bristol bay round island calm point newenham cape where lieutenant williamson landed and anderson island so called in honour of the naturalist who died there of disease of the chest later king island and prince of wales cape the most western extremity of america cook then passed the asiatic coast and entered into communication with the chukchis entered bering strait on the eighteenth of april and next week came in contact with ice he tried in vain to survey in various directions the iceberg presented an insuperable barrier on the seventeenth of april seventeen seventy eight the expedition was in latitude seventy degrees forty one minutes during an entire month he coasted the iceberg in the hope of finding an opening which might enable him to proceed to the north but in vain it was remarked that the ice was clear and transparent except in the upper part which was slightly porous i supposed says cook that it was frozen snow and it appeared to me that it must have been formed in the open sea both because it is improbable or rather impossible that such enormous masses could float down rivers which contain too little water for a boat and also because we perceived no produce of the earth which we must have done if it was so formed up to this date the passage through bering strait had been the least used to reach the northern latitudes cook's observation is valuable as it proves that beyond this aperture a vast extent of sea without land must exist it may possibly be this was the view held by the lamented gustave lambert that this sea is open no greater distance north has ever been attained since cook's time except on the siberian coast where plover and long islands were discovered and where at this moment as we write professor nordenskjold is exploring translator's note on the fifth of september eighteen seventy nine a telegram from stockholm announced that the swedish arctic expedition under professor nordenskjold had made the northeast passage from europe to japan and that the swedish exploring vessel the vega had arrived at yokohama by way of bering straits the end of note after most careful exploration and repeated efforts to reach higher latitudes cook seeing that the season was advanced and encountering more icebergs daily had no choice but to seek winter quarters in a more clement country before continuing his expedition the following summer he therefore retraced his route as far as the unalaska island and on the twenty sixth of october steered towards the sandwich islands hoping to complete his survey of them during his wintering there an island was discovered on the twenty sixth of november the natives sold the quantities of fruits roots breadfruits potatoes taro and eddy roots which they exchanged for nails and iron implements it was moi island which forms part of the sandwich archipelago shortly afterwards ohaihi or hawaii was sighted the summits of which were covered with snow the captain says we never met savages so liberal as these in their views they usually send the different articles they wish to sell to the ships they then come on board themselves and finished their trade on the quarter-deck the tahitans in spite of our constant stays there have not the same confidence in us i conclude from this that the inhabitants of ohaihi are more accurate and true in their reciprocal trade than those of tahiti for the latter have no honour among themselves and are thus not inclined to believe in the honour of others End of section twenty two section twenty three of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne first part chapter five part two captain cook's third voyage two b on the seventeenth of january cook and clerk cast anchor in a bay called by the natives karakakoa the sails were unbent from the yard the yards and the topmast struck the vessels were crowded with visitors and surrounded by pirogues and the shore was covered by a curious multitude cook had never previously seen so much excitement among the chiefs who came on board the resolution a young man named parea was soon remarked he said he was yakane but it was not known that was the title of office or if it suggested a degree of relationship or reliance with the king however he evidently had great authority over the common people some presents opportunely given 
attached him to the english and he rendered them more than one service if cook on his first visit to hawaii pronounced that the natives were little disposed to robbery he was not of the same opinion this time their large numbers gave them many facilities for thieving trifles and encouraged them to think that their larceny would not be punished it became evident at last that they were encouraged by their chiefs for several stolen objects were found in the possession of the latter parea and another chief named kanena brought an old man on board whose name was koa he was very thin and his body was covered with white scruff from immoderate use of ava he was a priest when he was presented to cook he put a sort of red mantle which he had brought upon his shoulders and gravely delivered a long discourse as he gave him a little pig it was soon proved that it was intended as a form of adoration for all the idols were clothed in similar stuff the english were immensely astonished at the whimsical ceremonies of homage presented to cook they only understood them later through the researches of the learned missionary ellis we shall give a brief account of his interesting discovery it will make the recital of the events that followed plainer according to tradition a certain rono who lived under one of the ancient kings of hawaii had killed his wife whom he tenderly loved in a transport of jealousy the grief and sorrow which followed upon his act drove him mad he ran about the island quarrelling with and striking everybody at last tired out but not satiated with murder he embarked promising to return one day upon a floating island bringing coconuts pigs and dogs this legend had been embodied in a national song and became an article of faith with the priests who added rono to their list of deities confident in the fulfilment of the prediction they awaited his coming every year with a patience which nothing could exhaust is not there a strange resemblance between this legend and that relating to the mexican god quetzalcoatl who forced to fly from the wrath of a more powerful god embarked upon a skiff of serpent skin promising those who accompanied him to return at some later time and visit the country with his descendants as soon as the english ships appeared the high priest koa and his son onela declared that it was rono himself fulfilling his prediction from that moment cook was a divinity for the entire population as he went about the natives prostrated themselves the priests made him speeches or addressed prayers to him they would have sprinkled him with incense had that been fashionable at hawaii the captain felt that there was something extraordinary in these demonstrations but unable to understand it he resigned himself for the sake of the crew and for the advancement of science to the mysterious circumstances he was unable to unravel he was obliged to give himself up to all kinds of ceremonies which appeared to him at least ridiculous thus he was taken to a morai a solid construction of stone forty rods long and fourteen high the summit was well built and was surrounded by a wooden balustrade upon which were hung the ears of the captives sacrificed to the gods at the opening of the platform were two large wooden figures with grinning faces and bodies draped in red stuff the heads surmounted by a large piece of sculpted wood the shape of a reversed cone there koa mounted with cook upon a sort of table under which lay a rotten pig and a quantity of fruit some men brought a living pig in a procession and some scarlet cloth in which it was wrapped the priests then sang some religious hymns while the assistants were devoutly prostrated at the entrance of the morai after various ceremonies which it would take too long to describe a pig cooked in the oven was presented to the captain with fruits and the roots which were used in the preparation of ava the ava says cook was then handed round and when he had tasted it koa and parea divided the flesh of the pig into several pieces which they placed in their mouths i felt no repugnance when parea who is very clean gave me something to eat says lieutenant king but cook to whom koa offered the same attention could not swallow a morsel as he thought of the putrid pig the old man wishing to redouble his politeness tried to give him pieces already chewed and one can easily imagine that the disgust of our captain increased after the ceremony cook was conducted to his boat by four men carrying sticks who repeated the same words and phrases as at the landing in the midst of a kneeling host of the natives the same ceremonies 
were observed every time the captain landed. One of the priests always walked before him, announcing that Rono had landed, and ordering the people to prostrate themselves. If the English had reasons to feel satisfied with the priests, who loaded them with attentions and presents, it was otherwise with the carries or warriors. The latter encouraged the robberies which were perpetrated daily, and in other ways exhibited disloyalty. Still, up to the 24th of January, 1779, no important event occurred. Upon that day the English were surprised to see that none of the pirogues left the river to trade with the ships. The arrival of Terre Obo had made the bay taboo, and prevented any communication with the strangers. Upon the same day the chief, or rather king, went without ceremony to the ships. He had but one pirogue, in which were his wife and children. On the 26th, Terre Obo paid a second visit, which was official. Cook, says the narrative, noticing that the prince landed, followed him and arrived about the same time. He conducted them to the tent. They were scarcely seated when the prince rose, and in a graceful manner threw his mantle over the captain's shoulders. He further placed a hat of feathers upon his head, and a curious fan in Cook's hands, at whose feet he also spread five or six very pretty mantles of great value. Terre Obo and the principal chiefs of his suit asked many questions of the English as to the time of their leaving. The captain wished to ascertain the opinion the Hawaiians had formed of the English, but he could only learn that they supposed them to be the natives of a country where provisions were scarce, and that they had simply come there to fill their stomachs. This conviction arose from the emaciated appearance of some of the sailors, and from the desire to ship fresh victuals. There was no fear, however, of exhausting their provisions, in spite of the immense quantity which had been consumed since the English arrived. It is very likely that the king wished for time to prepare the present he intended to offer the strangers upon their leaving, and accordingly, the day before the one fixed upon, the king begged Captains Cook and Clerk to accompany him to his residence. Enormous heaps of every kind of vegetable, parcels of stuff, yellow and red feathers, and a herd of pigs were collected together. All of this was a gratuitous gift to the king from his subjects. Terreobo chose about a third of these articles and gave the rest to the two captains, a more valuable present than they had ever received either at Tonga or Tahiti. On the 4th of February the vessels left the bay, but the damage received by the resolution forced her to put in again in a few days. The vessels had scarcely cast anchor before the English noticed a change in the conduct of the natives. Still, all went on peaceably until the afternoon of the 13th. Upon that day, several chiefs wished to prevent the natives from assisting the English in filling their casks. A tumult ensued. The natives armed themselves with stones and became threatening. The officer in command of the detachment was ordered by Cook to draw upon the natives if they persisted in throwing stones or became insolent. Under these circumstances a pirogue was fired into, and it was soon apparent that a robbery had been committed by its crew. At the same time a still more serious dispute arose. A sloop belonging to Parea was seized by an officer who took it to be the discovery. The chief hastened to claim his belongings and to protest his innocence. The discussion grew animated, and Parea was overthrown by a blow from an oar. The natives, who had hitherto been peaceable observers, armed themselves with stones, forced the sailors to retire precipitately, and took possession of the pinas which had brought them. Parea, forgetful of his resentment at the moment, interposed, and restored the pinas to the English, together with several things which had been stolen. I am afraid the Indians will force me to violent measures, said Cook upon learning what had passed. We must not allow them to believe that they have gained an advantage over us. The boat of the discovery was stolen upon the 13th or 14th of February. The captain determined to possess himself of the person of Terreobo or some other of the leading persons, and to keep them as hostages until the stolen objects were restored to him. He therefore landed with a detachment of marines, and pursued his way to the king's residence. He was received with the usual marks of respect on the road, and perceiving Terreobo and his two sons, to whom he said a few words on the theft of the sloop, he decided to pass the day on board the resolution. The matter took a happy turn, and the two young princes embarked upon the pinnace, 
when one of terreobo's wives begged him with tears not to go on board two other chiefs joined her and the natives frightened by the hostile preparations they saw began to crowd round the king and captain the latter hurried to embark and the prince appeared willing to follow him but the chiefs interposed and used force to prevent his doing so cook seeing that his project had failed and that he could only put it into execution by bloodshed gave it up and walked quietly along the shore to regain his boat when a rumour spread that one of the principal chiefs had been killed the women and children were therefore sent away and all directed their attention to the english a native armed with a pahoa defied the captain and as he would not cease his threats cook discharged his pistol the native protected by a thick mat did not feel himself wounded and so became more audacious several others advanced and the captain discharged his gun at the nearest and killed him this was the signal for a general attack the last that was seen of cook was his signing to the boats to cease firing and to approach that his small troop might embark in vain the captain was struck and fell to the earth the natives says the narrative uttered cries of joy when they saw him fall they at once dragged his body along the shore and taking the poniard one after the other they all attacked him with ferocious blows until he ceased to breathe thus perished this great navigator assuredly the most illustrious produced by england the boldness of his undertakings his perseverance in carrying them out and the extent of his knowledge all made him a type of the true sailor of discovery what immense service he had rendered to geography in his first voyage he reconnoitred the society islands proved that new zealand is formed of two islands explored the strait that separated them and surveyed its coast and lastly he visited the entire eastern coast of new holland in his second voyage he proved the chimerical character of the long talked of antarctic continent the dream of stay-at-home geographers he discovered new caledonia southern georgia the sandwich islands and penetrated farther into the southern hemisphere than any one had done before him in his third expedition he discovered the hawaiian archipelago and surveyed the eastern coast of america to the forty-third degree that is to say an extent of three thousand five hundred miles he passed through bering straits and ventured into the arctic sea which was the horror of navigators until the icebergs opposed an impenetrable barrier to his progress it is needless to praise his qualities as a seaman his hydrographical works remain but above all his careful treatment of his crews deserves to be remembered to it was due their ability to bear the long and trying voyages which he made with so little loss of life after this fatal day the english folded their tents and returned on board their offers for the recovery of the body of their unfortunate captain were in vain in their anger they were about to have recourse to arms when two priests friends of lieutenant king brought a piece of human flesh at the instance of the other chiefs which weighed from nine to ten pounds it was all they said that remained of rono's body which had been burned according to custom this sight of course made the english still more anxious for reprisals and the natives on their side had to avenge the death of five chiefs and a score of men every time the english landed at their wandering place they found a furious crowd armed with stones and sticks in order to make an example captain clerk who had taken the command of the expedition set fire to the abodes of the priests and massacred those who opposed them on the nineteenth of february however an interview was arranged and the remains of cook his hands recognizable by a large scar his head stripped of flesh and various other debris were made over to the english who three days later paid them the last honours after that barter was resumed as if nothing had happened and no other incident occurred during the remainder of the stay in the sandwich islands captain clerk had relinquished the command of the discovery to lieutenant gore and hoisted his flag upon the resolution after completing the survey of the hawaiian islands he set sail for the north touched at kamchatka where the russians made him heartily welcome passed through bering strait and advanced as far as latitude sixty nine degrees fifty minutes north where his further progress was barred by icebergs on the twenty second of april captain clerk died of pulmonary phthisis aged thirty eight captain gore then assumed the command in chief put in again at kamchatka again at canton and at the cape of good hope 
and anchored in the thames on the first of october seventeen eighty after more than four years absence the death of captain cook caused a general mourning throughout england the royal society of london of which he was a member struck a medal in his honour the cost of which was covered by public subscription to which persons of the highest rank subscribed the admiralty petitioned the king to provide for the family of the deceased captain the king granted a pension of two hundred pounds to his widow and twenty-five pounds to each of his three sons the charts and drawings relating to his last voyage were engraved at the expense of the government and the proceeds of their sale divided among cook's family and the heirs of captain clerk and captain king although the family of the great navigator is extinct a proof of the esteem in which his memory is held was given in the solemn meeting of the french geographical society on the fourth of february eighteen seventy nine a large number assembled to celebrate the centenary of cook's death amongst them were many representatives of the australian colonies which are now so flourishing and of the hawaiian archipelago where he met his death a quantity of relics belonging to the great navigator his charts weber's magnificent water colors and the instruments and weapons of the oceanic islanders decorated the walls this touching homage after the lapse of a hundred years was accorded by a people whose king had bidden them not to thwart cook's scientific and civilizing mission and was well calculated to awake an echo in england and to draw yet closer the bonds of that good fellowship which exists between england and france End of section twenty three Section twenty four of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume two. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by Jules Verne. Second part, Chapter one, Part one. French Navigators, one A discoveries made by bouvet de lozier in the southern seas surville the land of the alsacides incident during the stay at port praslin arrival upon the coast of new zealand death of surville marion's discoveries in the antarctic ocean he is murdered at new zealand kerguelen in iceland and the antarctic regions the contest between the watches florian and verdun de la crene in the earlier half of the eighteenth century a discovery had been made which was destined to exercise a favorable influence upon the progress of geographical science jean baptiste charles bouvet de lozier a captain of one of the east india company's ships was so struck by the immensity of the space surrounding the southern pole known to geographers as terra australis incognita that he begged for the privilege of prosecuting discoveries in these unknown regions his importunities were long disregarded but at length in seventeen thirty eight the company consented in the hope of opening new facilities for trade two small frigates the aigle and the marie fully equipped left brest upon the nineteenth of july seventeen thirty eight under command of bouvet de lozier after a stay of a month at st catherine's island upon the coast of brazil they put to sea again upon the thirteenth of november and steered for the southeast on the twenty sixth heavy fog set in so that the vessels could only keep in company by constant firing and were obliged to tack about continually at the risk of running foul of each other upon the fifth of december although it would have appeared impossible the fog increased in density to such an extent that those on board the aigle could hear the movement of the marie though they could not see her the sea was covered with kelp and seagulls never found at the distance from land were shortly afterwards seen upon the fifteenth of december says m favre in his memoir de bouvet in forty eight degrees fifty minutes southern latitude paris is the northern latitude forty eight degrees fifty minutes and in the seven degrees western longitude the meridian of tenerife an enormous iceberg was perceived towards five or six in the morning shortly afterwards many others were seen surrounded by ice floes of various sizes the marie signalling danger tacked about 
but bouvet annoyed by this action which was likely to affect the confidence of the crews crowded sail on the aigle and by passing the marie showed his determination to maintain his southern course to reassure his men he asserted that it was considered a lucky omen to meet with ice as it was a certain indication of land at hand the course was continued to the south and bouvet's perseverance was soon rewarded by the appearance of land to which he gave the name of cape circumcision it was steep covered with snow and so shut in by large icebergs that it was impossible to approach to within seven or eight leagues it appeared to measure from four to five leagues from north to south this land was supposed says m favre judging from pieter gosse's charts which were used by bouvet to be situated in forty five degrees southern latitude and twenty six degrees and twenty seven degrees east of the meridian of tenerife or between five degrees thirty minutes and six degrees three minutes east of that of paris bouvet would much have liked to make closer acquaintance with this region but the fogs and contrary winds prevented his reaching it and he was obliged to satisfy himself with observing it from a distance upon the third of january seventeen thirty nine says bouvet in his report to the company we made up for what we had lost during the preceding days and about four in the afternoon the fog clearing somewhat we distinctly saw land the coast broken throughout its entire length formed several bays the summits of the mountains were covered with snow the sides appeared wooded after several fruitless attempts to near the coast bouvet was forced to relinquish his idea his sailors were worn out with fatigue discouraged and enfeebled by scurvy the marie was sent to the isle of france and the aigle directed her course to the cape of good hope which she reached upon the twenty eighth of february we had penetrated says bouvet in his report already cited twelve or fifteen thousand leagues into the unknown sea for seventy days we had encountered almost continuous fog we had been for forty days in the midst of ice and we had had snow and hail almost every day several times our decks and rigging were covered with them our shrouds and sails were frozen on the tenth of january it was impossible to work our fore topsail the cold was severe for men accustomed to a warm climate and who were lightly clad many had chilblains on the hands and feet still they were forced constantly to tack about bring to get under way and tack soundings at least once a day one of the sailors belonging to the aigle having been sent to loosen the fore topsail became frozen in the foretop he had to be lowered by a whip and circulation was with difficulty restored i have seen others with tears gushing from their eyes as they handled the sounding line and all this was in the fine season and i ameliorated their condition by every means in my power we can readily understand that such small results did not tempt the east india company to continue their efforts in these latitudes if they were productive of no good they cost heavily in the loss of men and ships they entailed still bouvet's discovery was a first blow to the existing belief in an antarctic continent he gave the start and various navigators amongst them two frenchmen followed it up in our short record of this expedition which is scarcely known we have testified to an appreciation of our countrymen who was the pioneer of antarctic navigation and who deserves the credit of furnishing an example to the great english explorer james cook another of the east india company's captains who had distinguished himself in various battles against the english jean francois marie de surville was destined to make important discoveries in oceania some thirty years later and to rediscover almost simultaneously with cook the lands first seen by tasman and which he called staten island the following is an account of the circumstances messieurs law and chevalier governors in french india determined to send a vessel at their own risk to trade in the southern seas they admitted surville to their schemes and sent him to france to obtain their needful authority from the company and to superintend the equipment of the vessel the saint jean baptiste was made ready for sea at nantes and provisioned for three years with every requisite for a distant expedition surville then reached india where law provided him with twenty-four native soldiers 
leaving angley bay on the third of march seventeen sixty nine the saint jean baptiste put in successfully at masulipatam yanaon and pondichery where her equipment was completed surville left the last named port on the second of june and steered his course for the philippines on the twentieth of august he cast anchor off the bashis or bashi islands dampierre had so named them after an intoxicating drink which the natives compounded from the juice of the sugar cane into which they infused a certain black seed several of dampierre's crew had formerly deserted in these islands they had received from the natives a field agricultural instruments and wives the recollection of this fact incited three of the sailors belonging to the saint jean baptiste to follow their example but surville was not the man to allow his crew to melt away in such a manner he seized twenty-six indians and signified his intention of keeping them as hostages until his men were brought back to him among the indians thus seized says crozet in his narrative of surville's voyage there were several courageous enough to throw themselves into the sea and much to the surprise of the crew they had sufficient courage and skill to swim to one of their pirogues which was far enough from the vessel to be secure from danger pains were taken to make the savages understand that they had been treated in this way in order to make their comrades bring back the three deserters they made signs that they understood and were then released with the exception of six who had been taken on shore the haste with which they left the ship and flung themselves into their pirogues augured badly for their return much surprise was therefore felt when in a short time they were seen returning with joyful acclamations doubt was no longer possible they could only be bringing the deserters back to the commander they came on board and proceeded to deposit on deck what three magnificent pigs tied and bound surville did not appreciate and he obdurated the natives so fiercely that they jumped into their pirogues and disappeared twenty-four hours later the saint jean baptiste left the bashis taking three captive indians to replace the deserters upon the seventh of october after a lengthened route to the southeast land to which the name of premier vue was given was sighted in six degrees fifty six minutes southern latitude and one hundred and fifty seven degrees thirty minutes longitude east of paris the explorers coasted along it until the thirteenth of october upon which day an excellent port was discovered shielded from every wind and formed by a number of small islands m de surville cast anchor and tainted port praslin it is situated in seven degrees twenty five minutes southern latitude and one hundred and fifty one degrees fifty five minutes eastern longitude reckoning from the paris meridian upon entering this port the french saw several indians armed with spears and carrying a sort of shield the saint jean baptiste was very soon surrounded by pirogues manned by a crowd of indians who were profuse in menacing gestures however they were pacified at last about thirty of the boldest clambered on to the deck and examined everything they saw with close attention it soon became needful to check their advances as there were many sick among the crew and it was unwise to allow too many natives on board in spite of the welcome they received the natives were still doubtful and their looks expressed distrust the slightest movement on board the vessel was sufficient to make them jump into their pirogues or the sea one only showed a little more confidence and surville gave him several presents the indian acknowledged the attention by saying he could point out a spot where good water was to be had the captain gave orders to arm the boats and entrusted the command to his lieutenant labbe the savages appeared impatient for the departure of the boats from the ship says florian in his découverte de francais and they were no sooner lowered than they were followed by all the pirogues one of these appeared to lead the others in it was the indian who had offered his services to serville at the back of the pirogue a man stood erect holding in his hands a bunch of herbs raising them above his head with a rhythmical movement in the centre of the same pirogue stood a young man resting upon a spear who gravely watched all that went on red flowers were in his ears and passed through the cartilage of his nose and his hair was powdered with white lime certain thrilling symptoms aroused the suspicion of the french who soon found themselves in a cul-de-sac where the natives persisted in declaring that fresh water was to be found 
l'abbé in spite of all the persuasions of the natives did not wish to imperil his boats in two or three feet of water with a muddy bottom and therefore allowed only a corporal and four soldiers to disembark they soon returned asserting that they had seen on all sides nothing but marsh in which the men would sink to the waist it was evident that the natives had meditated treason l'abbé took good care not to let them suspect that he had detected their design and asked them to point out a spring the natives then led the boats some three leagues away to a spot from whence it was impossible to see the ship the corporal was again sent forward with some men but he found only a very poor spring barely affording sufficient water to slake the thirst of his party during his absence the natives did all in their power to induce l'abbé to land pointing out to him the abundant coconuts and other fruit trees and even attempting to possess themselves of the boat hook more than two hundred and fifty of these natives says the narrative armed with spears from seven to eight feet long with swords or wooden clubs arrows and stones and some carrying shields were assembled on the shore observing the movements of the boats when the detachment consisting of five men proceeded to re-embark the natives fell upon them, wounding one soldier with a blow from a club, the corporal with a spear, and many others in different ways. M. Labbé himself was hit by two arrows in the thigh, and on the leg by a stone. The traitors were fired upon. The first volley so astonished them that they remained motionless. It was the more fatal, as, being fired only three or five fathoms from the boats, every shot took effect the amazement of the natives gave the opportunity for a second discharge which completely routed them the death of their chief greatly hastening their flight m labbé who had recognized him apart from the others with his hands raised to heaven striking his breast and encouraging the assailants by his voice aimed at him and shot him dead the natives carried off their wounded leaving thirty or forty dead upon the field of battle it was then possible to land and picking up such of the enemy's weapons as were scattered about the victors contented themselves with towing away one of their pirogues and destroying the others surville was extremely anxious to capture an indian who might serve him as a guide and who convinced of the superiority of european weapons might warn his countrymen against opposing the french with this view he hit upon a singular expedient he ordered two negro sailors to be placed on board the pirogue he had seized had their heads powdered and disguised them so cleverly that the natives were likely to be deceived in fact a pirogue soon after approaching the saint jean baptiste the men who were in it seeing what they took to be two of their own people trafficking with the strangers drew nearer so soon as the french imagined they were at a fair distance they launched two boats in pursuit the natives gained ground it was then decided to fire in order to stop them one of the natives was killed at once and his boat capsizing he fell into the sea and the other who was only fourteen or fifteen years of age endeavoured to reach the shore by swimming he defended himself most courageously says the narrative sometimes making believe to bite himself but really biting those who held him his hands and feet were tied and he was taken on board he counterfeited death for an hour but when he was made to sit up and he fell back on deck he took good care to fall on his shoulders instead of his head when he was tired of playing this game he opened his eyes and seeing that the crew were eating he asked for a biscuit ate it with a good appetite and made many expressive signs he was bound securely so that he might not throw himself overboard during the night it was necessary to resort to firing to disperse the pirogues which approached with a view to surprising the ship next day the native was taken in a boat to a small islet since called aiguada island scarcely had he landed when it was perceived that he had almost cut through the ropes with a sharp shell the young savage was taken by a different route to the shore when he perceived that he was to re-embark and biting the sand in his fury the sailors succeeded at last in finding an abundant spring and plenty of wood one of the trees they cut appeared to have dying properties for it tinged the sea with red some of the bark was boiled and pieces of cotton steeped in the decoction turned deep red welcome refreshment was afforded to the crew by the palm cabbages good oysters and various shellfish which abounded 
there were indeed many sufferers from scurvy on board the saint jean baptiste surville had looked forward to this stay to cure them but the rain which fell ceaselessly for six days aggravated their complaint to such a degree that three of them died before they left the anchorage the port was named praslin and the large island or archipelago to which it belonged arsacides in reference to the deceitful nature of its inhabitants port praslin says florian would be one of the finest ports in the world if the bottom were better it is of circular shape reckoning all the islands discovered from the spot where the saint jean baptiste cast anchor the ferocity of the people inhabiting the islands of port praslin was such that it was impossible to penetrate into the interior and it was only possible to examine the sea-coast we perceived no cultivated ground either in the trip we made to the further end of the port nor upon the aiguade island which was explored throughout such are the superficial particulars which surville and his crew were able to collect fortunately they were supplemented by those furnished by the captive native whose name was lova salega and who possessed a great faculty for learning languages according to his account the island produced palms coconut trees various almond trees wild coffee the ebony tree the takamahak as well as numerous resinous and gum trees the banana sugar-cane yams aniseed and lastly a plant called binao which is used by the natives as bread cockatoos wood pigeons lorries and blackbirds somewhat larger than those of europe abounded in the woods in the marshes the curlew sea lark a species of snipe and ducks were to be found the only quadrupeds the country produced were goats and half wild pigs the natives of port praslin says florian quoting from the manuscript in his possession are of ordinary height but strong and muscular they do not appear to be all of one origin a valuable remark for some are perfectly black whilst others are copper colored the former have woolly hair which is very soft to the touch their foreheads are small their eyes slightly sunken while the lower parts of their face is pointed and adorned with a small beard their expression is fierce some of the copper-colored natives have smooth hair they usually cut it round the head as high as the ear a few only retain a little shaped like a cap on the top of the head shaving off the remainder with a sharp stone and leaving only a circular fringe about an inch deep at the bottom their hair and eyebrows are powdered with lime which gives them a yellowish hue both men and women are stark naked but it must be allowed that their nudity is not so startling as would be that of an european without clothes for the faces arms and generally every part of their bodies are tattooed sometimes the taste of these designs is really wonderful they pierce their ears and the cartilage of their nose and the nostrils often hang down from the weight of the ornaments to the upper lip the commonest ornament worn by the natives of port praslin is a necklace made of men's teeth it was at once concluded that they were cannibals although the same customs had been met with among people who were not lova's confused replies and the half-broiled head of a man found by bougainville in a pirogue in choiseul island placed the existence of this barbarous practice beyond the possibility of doubt End of section twenty four Section twenty five of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume two. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by Jules Verne. Second part, Chapter one, Part one. French Navigators, one B. On the 21st of October, after nine days' rest, the Saint-Jean-Baptiste left port Praslin. On the next and ensuing days, lofty and mountainous land was constantly in sight. Upon the 2nd of November, Surville descried an island which received the name of Contrariété from the contrary winds which for three days checked the progress of the ship. This island presented a delightful appearance. It was well cultivated, and, judging from the number of pirogues, which constantly surrounded the saint jean baptiste it must have been well populated the natives could scarcely be persuaded to go on board at last a chief sprang on deck 
His first act was to possess himself of a sailor's clothes. He next visited the poop, and took the white flag, which he wished to appropriate. It was only after some difficulty that he was dissuaded from the attempt. Lastly, he climbed up the mizzenmast, and from that elevated position observed all parts of the vessel. Then, coming down, he began to jump about, and, addressing himself to those he had left in the canoes, he invited them, by words and gestures, to join him on deck. About a dozen ventured. They resembled the natives of Port Praslin, but they spoke a different language, and could not make themselves understood by Lova Salega. Their stay on board did not last long, for one of them, having possessed himself of a bottle and thrown it into the sea, the captain showed some annoyance, which induced them to return to their pirogues. The land appeared so inviting, and the sufferers from scurvy were in such pressing need of green provisions, that Surville determined to send a boat to test the disposition of the natives. It had no sooner left the vessel than it was surrounded by pirogues, manned by a number of warriors. Hostilities were imminent, but a few shots dispersed the assailants. During the night a flotilla advanced towards the Saint-Jean-Baptiste, and Surville, from motives of humanity, did not wait until the natives were close, but at once fired several pieces, charged with grape-shot, which put them to flight. It was useless to think of landing, and Surville regained the open sea. He discovered successively the Three Sisters Island, and Gulf and Deliverance Islands, the last of the group. The archipelago, just explored by Surville, was no other than that of the Solomon Islands, which, as we have mentioned, was discovered in the first instance by Mendana. That skilful navigator had traced and surveyed a hundred and forty leagues, besides drawing a series of fourteen very curious views of this sea-coast. If Surville's crew were not to be decimated by death, it was necessary at all risks to reach land, where he might disembark the sick and procure fresh provisions for them. He resolved to steer for New Zealand, which had not been visited since the time of Tasman. On the 12th of December, 1769, Surville descried land in 35 degrees 37 minutes southern latitude, and five days later he cast anchor in a bay which he called Loriston. At the extremity was a creek which received the name of Chevalier. Cook had been in search of this land since the beginning of October, and was fated to pass by Loriston Bay a few days later without observing the French vessel. Whilst anchoring in Chevalier Creek, Surville was overtaken by a frightful tempest, which brought him within an ace of destruction. But his sailors had such confidence in his nautical ability that they felt no anxiety, and obeyed his orders with a sang-froid of which, unfortunately, the Maoris were the sole spectators. The sloop which was conveying the sick to the land had no time to reach the shore before the storm broke in all its fury, and she was driven into Refuge Creek. The sailors and invalids were cordially welcomed by a chief called Naginoui, who received them into his cabin, and bestowed upon them all the green provisions which he could procure during their stay. One of the boats, which was towed behind the Saint-Jean-Baptiste, was carried away by the waves. Surville saw it stranded in Refuge Creek. He sent in search of it, but only the rudder was found. The natives had carried it off. The river was searched in vain. There was no trace of the boat. Surville would not allow this theft to go unpunished. He made signs to some Indians who were near their pirogues to approach him. One of them ran to him at once, and was immediately seized and carried on board. The others fled. He seized one pirogue, says Crozet, and burned the other, set fire to the huts, and returned to the ship. The Indian who was taken was recognized by the surgeon as the chief who had so generously assisted them during the storm. It was the unfortunate Naginoui, who, after the services he had rendered the whites, could hardly have anticipated such treatment at their hands when he obeyed Surville's signal. He died on the 24th of March, 1770, near the island of Juan Fernandez. We will pass over the observations made by the French navigator upon the natives and upon the productions of the New Zealand, as they are merely a repetition of those of Captain Cook. Surville, convinced that he could not obtain the provisions he needed, put to sea a few days later, and steered between the parallels of 27 degrees and 28 degrees southern latitude. But the ravages of the scurvy, which increased daily, decided him on steering for the coast of Peru without delay. 
he sighted it on the fifth of april seventeen seventy and three days later cast anchor off the chilica bay at the entrance of callao in his haste to reach the land and seek help for the sick surville was unwilling to allow any one else to visit the governor unfortunately his boat was capsized by the waves that break over the bar and only one of the crew was saved surville and all the rest were drowned thus miserably perished this great navigator too early for the services he might have rendered to his country and to science as for the saint jean baptiste she was detained for three years before lima by the interminable delays of the spanish customs labbe assumed the command and took her back to lorient on the twenty third of august seventeen seventy three as we have already related messier de bougainville had taken a tahitan named auturu to europe when this native expressed a desire to return to his native land the french administration had sent him to mauritius with orders to the governor of that colony to facilitate his return to tahiti a naval officer marion dufresne availed himself of this opportunity and offered poivre the governor of mauritius and bourbon to send the young uturu to tahiti at his own expense and in a vessel belonging to him he only required that a vessel belonging to the state might be assigned to him and a small sum of money advanced to assist him in the preparations for the expedition nicolas thomas marion dufresne was born at saint malo on the twenty second of december seventeen twenty nine and had entered the naval service very young on the sixteenth of october seventeen forty six he was made lieutenant of a frigate and at the time of his offer was still only captain of a fire-ship still he had served everywhere with distinction and nowhere more successfully than in the indian seas the mission for which he offered himself was merely a pretext for a voyage of discovery in the southern seas poivre an intelligent governor and a friend to progress approved of dufresne's project and gave him detailed instructions for the enterprise he was about to undertake in the southern hemisphere at this time cook had not yet proved the non-existence of an antarctic continent poivre would dearly have liked to have discovered the northern portions of the land he imagined to lie near the french colonies and where he hoped to meet with a more temperate climate he calculated upon finding timber for masts and many other necessities there such as provisions which he was now obliged to obtain at heavy cost from the metropolis moreover there might be a safe port where vessels could find shelter from the storms which almost periodically ravaged the islands of mauritius and bourbon the government had just sent a ship's lieutenant m kerguelen to make discoveries in these unknown seas marion's expedition which was to try a different route could not fail to aid in the solution of the problem on the eighteenth of october seventeen seventy one the mascarin commanded by marion and the marquise de castrier under the chevalier de clusmer midshipman set sail they put in first at bourbon island there they took auturu on board he was unfortunately infected with smallpox which he had caught in the mauritius and the illness soon declared itself so that it was necessary to leave bourbon lest he should communicate it to the inhabitants the two vessels then made for port du pain on the coast of madagascar in order to allow the malady to run its course before proceeding to the cape where they were to complete provisioning young auturu soon died of the disease under these circumstances was it necessary to return to mauritius disarm the ship and give up the expedition morion thought not with greater freedom of action he determined to make himself famous by a new voyage and he inspired his companions with enthusiasm like his own he soon reached the cape of good hope when he completed in a few days the provisioning necessary for the eighteenth month's journey a southerly route was chosen towards the land discovered in seventeen thirty nine by bouvet de lozier and which was to be looked for east of the meridian of madagascar nothing remarkable occurred from the twenty eighth of december seventeen seventy one the day upon which the vessels had left the cape until the eleventh of january it was then discovered by taking the longitude twenty degrees forty three minutes east of the paris meridian that they were in the parallel forty to forty one degrees south of the islands named in van keulen's chart as dina and marvezen and not marked at all upon french maps 
although the presence of land birds induced marion to suppose that he was not far from the islands he left these latitudes on the ninth of january convinced that his search for the southern continent ought to occupy his entire attention the eleventh of january found him in forty five degrees forty three minutes southern latitude and although it was summer in these regions the cold was severe and snow fell without ceasing two days later in a dense fog which was succeeded by rain marion discerned land which extended a distance of five leagues from the west southwest to the east northeast the soundings gave a depth of eighty fathoms with a bottom of coarse sand mixed with coral this land stretched away till it could be seen behind the vessels that is to say over a distance of six to seven leagues it appeared to be very lofty and mountainous it received the name of hope marking marion's great desire to reach the southern continent four years later cook called it prince edward's island to the north lay another territory crozet editor of marion's voyage says i noticed in coasting along this island that to the northeast there existed a creek opposite to what appeared to be a large cavern all around the cavern he remarked a number of large white spots which looked like a flock of sheep had time allowed he might have found anchorage opposite the creek i fancied i saw a cascade issuing from the mountains in rounding the island we discovered three islets detached from it two of them situated in the large bay formed by the coast and the third on its northern extremity the island itself was about seven or eight leagues in circumference without verdure and apparently barren the coast was healthy and safe Monsieur marion named it cavern island these two southern territories are situated in forty five degrees forty five minutes southern latitude by thirty four degrees thirty one minutes east of the paris meridian half a degree east of the route pursued by bouvet next day about six leagues of the coast of the land of hope was made out it looked fertile the mountains were lofty and covered with snow the navigators were about to look for anchorage when during the sounding operations the two ships ran foul of each other and were both damaged three days were occupied in repairs the weather which had hitherto been fine broke up and the wind becoming violent it was necessary to continue the course following the forty-sixth parallel new lands were discovered on the twenty fourth of january at first says crozet they appeared formed of two islands i took a sketch at a distance of eight leagues and shortly afterwards we took them for two capes imagining we could see in the far distance a stretch of land between them they are situated in forty degrees five minutes southern latitude and about forty eight degrees eastern longitude reckoning from the meridian of paris monsieur marion named them les îles froides or the cold islands although little progress was made during the night the islands were invisible next morning upon this day the castrier signaled land which stretched some ten or twelve leagues east southeast but a dense fog lasting no less than twelve hours continued rain and cold which was severe and trying to lightly clad men made any approach nearer than six or seven leagues impossible the coast was seen again upon the twenty fourth as well as new land which received the name of the arid island and is now known as crozet island marion was at length able to lower a boat and ordered crozet to take possession of the larger of the two islands in the name of the king it is situated in forty six degrees thirty minutes southern latitude and forty three minutes eastern longitude reckoning from the paris meridian Monsieur marion called this land la prise de possession it is now known as marion island this was the sixth island discovered by us in these southern waters from a height i discerned snow in many of the valleys the land appeared barren and covered with very small grass i found neither tree nor bush in the island exposed to the continual ravages of the stormy west winds which prevailed the entire year in these latitudes it appeared uninhabitable i found nothing there but seals penguins seagulls mother carries chickens and every variety of aquatic birds usually met with by navigators in the open sea when passing the cape of good hope these creatures never having seen a man were not wild and allowed us to take them in the hand the female birds sat tranquilly upon their eggs 
others fed their youngs whilst the seals continued their gambols in our presence without appearing in the least alarmed marion continued to steer between forty six degrees to forty seven degrees latitude in the midst of a fog so dense that it was impossible to see from one end of the deck to the other and without constant firing the ships must have parted company upon the second of february the two ships were in forty seven degrees twenty two minutes eastern longitude that is to say without one degree ten minutes of the lands discovered upon the thirteenth of the same month by the king's vessels la fortune and la Grosventre, commanded by monsieur de kerguelen and saint wallard doubtless but for the accident to the castrier marion would have fallen in with them having reached ninety degrees east of the paris meridian marion changed his route and directed his course to van diemen's land no incident occurred during the cruise and the two vessels cast anchor in frederick henry bay boats were at once lowered and a strong detachment made its way to the shore where some thirty natives were found and the country judging from the fires and smoke must have been well populated the natives of the country says crozet came forward willingly they picked up wood and formed a sort of pile then they presented the newcomers with pieces of dried wood which they had lighted and appeared to invite them to set fire to the pile no one knew what the ceremony might mean and it was accordingly tried the natives did not appear surprised they remained about us without making any demonstration either of hostility or friendship and their wives and children were with them both men and women were of ordinary height black in color with woolly hair and all were naked some of the women carried their children tied on to their backs with rushes all the men were armed with pointed sticks and stones which appeared to us to be sharp like hatchets we attempted to win them over by small presents they disdainfully rejected all that we offered even iron looking-glasses handkerchiefs and pieces of cloth fowls and ducks which had been brought from the ship were shown to them as evidence that we wished to trade they took them looked at them as if they had never seen such things before and threw them aside with an angry air an hour had been spent in the attempt to gain the goodwill of the savages when marion and duclesmer landed a lighted brand was also presented to them and fully persuaded that it was a peaceful ceremony they did not hesitate to light the pile which was prepared they were mistaken for the natives immediately retired and flung a volley of stones which wounded the two captains they retaliated by a few shots and the whole party re-embarked after another attempt at landing which the natives opposed with great bravery it was necessary to repulse them by a volley which wounded several and killed one the crew then landed and pursued the natives who made no attempt to resist them two detachments were sent in search of a watering place and of trees suitable for repairing the masts of the castrier six days passed in fruitless search fortunately not wholly wasted as many curious observations were made on behalf of science from the considerable number of shells which we found at short distances says crozet we concluded that the ordinary food of these savages was mussels cockles and various shellfish End of section twenty five section twenty six of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr natter celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter one part one french navigators one c is it not strange to find among new zealanders the remains of food similar to that which we are now familiar on the scandinavian coasts is not man everywhere the same and incited by the same needs to the same actions finding it waste of time to seek for water and wood with which to remast the castrier and repair the mascarin which leaked a good deal marion started on the tenth of march for new zealand and reached that island fourteen days later new zealand discovered by tasman in sixteen forty two and visited by cook and surville in seventeen seventy two was now becoming known the two vessels made for land at mont egmont but the shore was so steep at that point that marion put back to sea and returned to reconnoitre the land upon the thirty first of march in thirty six degrees thirty minutes latitude 
he coasted along the shore and in spite of contrary winds returned northward as far as the three kings islands he found it impossible to land there it was therefore necessary to reach the mainland and anchor was cast opposite cape maria van diemen the most northerly extremity of new zealand the anchorage was soon perceived to be bad and after many attempts marion stopped at cook's island bay on the eleventh of may tents were erected on one of the islands where wood and water were found and the sick were installed there under a strong guard the natives came on board some of them even slept there and trade facilitated by the use of a tahitian vocabulary was carried on in grand style i remarked with surprise says crozet that among the savages who came on board were three distinct species of men one of these appeared to be the original native and was of a yellowish white color taller than the others the usual height being from five foot nine to five foot ten inches he had smooth black hair the more swarthy and somewhat smaller men had slightly curling hair and lastly the genuine negro with woolly hair and of smaller stature than the others but usually broader chested the first have very little beard whilst the negroes have a great deal the curious observation was afterwards verified it is unnecessary to linger over the customs of the new zealanders or over marion's minute description of their fortified villages their arms clothing and food these details are already known to our readers the french pitched three camps on land the first for the sick upon matuaro island the second upon the mainland which served as a depot and as a means of communication with the third which was workshop of the carpenters and was some two leagues away in the midst of a wood the crew persuaded by the friendliness of the natives made long excursions into the interior and received a hearty welcome everywhere confidence was at length so fully established that in spite of crozet's representations marion ordered the sloop's boats to be disarmed this was unpardonable imprudence in a country where tasman had given the name of assassin bay to the first point on which he landed where cook had met with cannibals and had been nearly massacred on the eighth of june marion landed and was received with even greater demonstrations of friendship than usual he was proclaimed head chief of the country and the natives placed four white feathers in his hair as insignia of royalty four days later he again landed with two young officers monsieur de vadricourt and leo a volunteer and captain of arms and a few sailors seventeen persons in all evening approached but no one came back to the ship at first no anxiety was felt for the hospitable customs of the natives were well known it was supposed that marion had slept on shore to be ready to visit the workshops in the morning on the thirteenth of june the castrier sent her boat for the daily supply of wood and water at nine o'clock a man was seen swimming towards the ships a boat was lowered to help him on board it was one of the rowers the only one who had escaped from the massacre of his comrades he had received two lance thrusts in his side and been much ill-treated from his account it appeared that the natives had at first shown their usual friendliness they had even carried the sailors who feared getting wet ashore upon their shoulders but when the crew dispersed to pick up their cargo of wood the natives reappeared armed with spears tomahawks and clubs and threw themselves in parties of six and seven upon each of the sailors the survivor had been attacked by two men only who had wounded him with two lance thrusts and as fortunately he was not far from the sea he had succeeded in reaching the shore where he hid himself in some brushwood from thence he had witnessed the massacre of all his companions the savages had the bodies stripped and commenced cutting them up when he stole noiselessly from his concealment and threw himself into the sea hoping to reach the ship by swimming had all the sixteen men who accompanied marion and of whom no news was received met a like fate it seemed probable in any case it was needful to take immediate precautions for the safety of the three camps chevalier du clusmer at once took the command and thanks to his energy the disaster did not assume worse proportions the sloop of the mascarin was armed and sent in search of marion's boats and sloop with orders to warn all the camps and carry help to the most distant where masts and spars were being made on the road upon the shore the two boats were discovered near the village of takuri they were surrounded by natives who had pillaged them after massacring the sailors 
without waiting to regain possession of the boats the officer put on all speed in the hope of reaching the workshop in time fortunately it had not yet been attacked by the natives all work was immediately stopped the utensils and weapons were collected the guns were loaded and such objects as could not be removed were buried beneath the ruins of the shed which was set on fire the retreat was accomplished among crowds of natives crying in sinister voices takuri mate marion takuri has killed marion two leagues were traversed in this manner during which no aggression was attempted against the sixty men who composed the detachment upon their arrival at the sloop the natives approached them crozet first sent all the sailors who carried loads on board then tracing a line on the ground he made it understood that the first native who passed it would immediately be fired upon an order was then given to the natives to seat themselves and it must have been an imposing spectacle to see thousands obeying unresistingly in spite of their desire to seize the prey which was escaping before their eyes crozet embarked last and no sooner had he set foot in the sloop then the war cry was uttered whilst javelins and stones were thrown from every direction hostilities had succeeded threats and the savages rushed into the water the better to aim at their foes crozet found himself obliged to prove to these wretches the superiority of his weapons and gave orders to fire the new zealanders seeing their comrades fall wounded or dead without their appearing to have been touched were quite amazed they would all have been killed had not crozet stopped the firing the sick were taken on board without accident and the encampment reinforced and put on guard was not molested next day the natives who had an important village upon matuaro island endeavoured to prevent the sailors from fetching the water and wood they needed the latter then marched against them bayonet in hand and followed them up to their village where they shut themselves in the voice of the chief inciting them to battle was heard firing was commenced as soon as the village was within range and that was so well directed that the chiefs were the first victims as soon as they fell the natives fled some fifty were killed the rest were driven into the sea and the village was burned it was useless to dream of bringing to the shore the five masts made with great difficulty from the cedars which had been cut down and the carpenters were obliged to repair the mast with pieces of wood collected on the ships the provisioning of the ships with the seven hundred barrels of water and seventy loads of wood necessary for the voyage would infallibly occupy at least a month for there remained only one sloop the fate of marion and the men who had accompanied him was still unknown a well-armed detachment therefore started for the village of takuri it was abandoned only men too old to follow the flight of their companions remained and were seated in the doors of their huts an effort was made to take them one of them without any apparent effort at once struck a soldier with a javelin he held in his hand he was killed but no injury was inflicted upon the others who were left in the village all the houses were thoroughly searched in takuri's kitchen a man's skull was found which had been cooked some days before some fleshy parts still remained which bore the impress of the cannibal's teeth on a wooden spit a piece of human thighs three parts eaten was found in another house a shirt was recognized as having belonged to the unfortunate marion the collar was soaked in blood and two or three holes were found in the side also blood-stained in various other houses portions of the clothes and the pistols belonging to young vadricourt who had accompanied the captain were brought to light the boat's arms and quantities of scraps of the unfortunate sailor's clothing were also discovered doubt was unfortunately no longer possible an account of the death of the victims was drawn up and chevalier du clusmer searched marion's papers to discover his projects and the plans for the prosecution of the voyage he found only the instructions given by the governor of mauritius a council was held with the ship's officers and bearing in mind the lamentable condition of the vessels it was decided to abandon the search for new lands and to make for amsterdam or rotterdam island then for the mariana and philippines where there was a chance of disposing of the cargo before returning to mauritius on the fourteenth of july du clusmer left treason port as he named the bay of these islands and the vessels steered towards amsterdam and rotterdam islands to the north of which they passed on the sixth of august 
navigation was aided by splendid weather a fortunate circumstance as scurvy had made such ravages among the sailors that very few of them were in a condition to work at length on the twentieth of september guaham island the largest of the mariana group was discovered it was impossible to cast anchor until seven days later the account published by crozet contains very precise and circumstantial details regarding the island with its productions and inhabitants we will only transcribe from it one phrase as explicit as it is short guaham island he says appeared to us a terrestrial paradise the air was excellent the water good the vegetables and fruits were perfect the herds of cattle goats and pigs innumerable every species of fowl abounded amongst the vegetable productions crozet mentions rima the fruit of which is good to eat when it has attained its full growth and is still green in this condition he says the natives gather for food they remove the rough skin and cut it in slices like bread when they wish to preserve it they cut it in round pieces and dry it in the sun or in oven in the form of very small cakes this natural biscuit preserves its bread-like qualities for several years and far longer than our best ship's biscuits from port agana crozet reached the philippine islands and anchored off cavit in manila bay this was the spot where the castrier and mascarin parted to go back to mauritius separately some years previously a gallant officer of the royal navy chevalier jacques raymond de geron de grenier who was one of that group of distinguished men the chazelles the bordas the floriens the dumarts de gompy the chaberts de verdens de la Crens, who contributed so zealously to the progress of navigation and geography had employed his leisure during a stay in the isle of france in exploring the adjacent seas he had made a very profitable cruise in the corvette de heure de berger during which he rectified the position of st brandon's rock and of the saya de malia sandbank examined separately saint michel roque pier and agalega in the seychelles archipelago and corrected the charts of adu and diego garcia islands convinced of the connection of the currents with the monsoon which he had thoroughly studied he proposed a shortened route always open from the isle of france to the indies it would be a saving of eight hundred leagues and was well worth serious consideration the minister of marine who had seen grenier's proposition well received by the naval academy decided to entrust its examination to the ship's officer who was accustomed to work of the kind he selected yves joseph de kerguelen during two expeditions undertaken in seventeen sixty seven and seventeen sixty eight for the encouragement and protection of the cod fisheries on the coast of iceland the navigator had surveyed a great number of ports and roadsteads collected astronomical observations rectified the map of iceland and accumulated a mass of particulars concerning this little-known country it was he indeed who gave the earliest authentic account of geysers those springs of warm water which occasionally reach to such great heights and he also supplied curious details of the existence of fossil wood which prove that at an early geological period iceland now entirely devoid of trees possessed enormous forests kerguelen had at some time published novel details of the manners and customs of the inhabitants the women he said have dresses jackets and aprons made of a cloth called vadmal which is made in iceland they wear an ample robe above their jackets rather like that of the jesuits but not so long as the petticoats which they allow to be seen these robes are of different color but generally black they are called hempe they are trimmed with velvet or some other ornament the head dresses look like pyramids or sugar loaves two or three feet high the women ornament the head with a large handkerchief of very coarse cloth which stands upright and cover it with another finer one which forms the shape of which i spoke lastly kerguelen had collected very interesting documents relating to denmark the laplanders the samoyeds the faroe islands the orkney and shetland islands which he had thoroughly explored kerguelen entrusted with the examination of the route proposed by grenier asked permission of the minister to employ his ship to explore all the southern lands discovered in seventeen thirty nine by bouvet de Lozier the abbe Théoré, who had just succeeded the duke of praslin gave him command of the ship le Berrier, which brought three hundred able-bodied seamen and provisions for fourteen months from lorient together with some ammunition for mauritius 
the abbe rochon was associated with kerguelen for making astronomical observations upon reaching mauritius on the twentieth of august seventeen seventy one kerguelen exchanged the berrier for the la fortune to which a small vessel the gros ventre with sixteen guns and a crew of a hundred men was attached under command of monsieur de saint aluarn as soon as the two vessels were equipped kerguelen set sail and steered northward in search of the mahe islands during a great storm the sounding lines of the fortune gave an ever decreasing depth first thirty then twenty and at last only fourteen fathoms anchor was then cast and it held fast throughout the tempest daybreak at least relieved our anxieties says kerguelen we perceived neither land nor rock the gros ventre was three leagues distant her captain could not believe that i was at anchor for the noise of the thunder and dazzling lightning prevented his hearing or seeing my signals this is the sole instance of a vessel anchoring in the night in the open sea upon an unknown coast i set sail and allowed the vessels to drift taking constant soundings i at first found fourteen then twenty then twenty-five at last twenty-eight fathoms then i suddenly lost the bottom altogether proving that we had passed above a submarine mountain this new bank which i called fortune bank stretched northwest and southeast it is situated in seven degrees sixteen minutes southern latitude and fifty five degrees fifty minutes eastern longitude the fortune and the gros ventre then made for fifty degrees southern latitude which was the route recommended by the chevalier de granier the two captains were aware that the winds constantly blew from the east at this season of the year and therefore went to the maldives and coasted along ceylon from point de galais to tricomale upon their return the monsoon had changed the prevailing winds were west and southwest as grenier had predicted the route suggested by him had undeniable advantages and these have been so amply confirmed by experience that no other is now followed End of section 26. Section 27 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2 great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter one part one french navigators one d returning to mauritius on the eighth of december kerguelen hurried his preparation for departure to such an extent that he was able to start upon the twelfth of january seventeen seventy two he steered southward for supposing that he found land in that direction the nearest would naturally be the most useful for the french colony from the first of february numbers of birds seemed to indicate the proximity of land hail succeeded snow the vessels experienced foul weather boisterous winds and a heavy sea the first land was sighted upon the twelfth next day a second was discovered and shortly afterwards a very lofty and extensive cape the following day at seven o'clock in the morning the sun having dispelled the clouds a line of coast extending some twenty-five leagues was clearly seen the vessels were then in forty nine degrees forty minutes southern latitude and sixty one degrees ten minutes eastern longitude unfortunately storm succeeded storm and the two vessels with great difficulty escaped being cast ashore kerguelen was driven northward by currents shortly after he had sent a boat to attempt a landing finding myself so far from land says kerguelen i reflected upon the best course to be pursued I remembered that the state of my mast was too bad to allow me to crowd sail and leave the coast, and that, having no sloop to carry my anchors, I was exposed to extreme danger whilst near the shore, that in the dense fog it was all but impossible to find the gros ventre from which I had been separated for several days. It was the more difficult on account of the tempest we had experienced, and the variable winds that prevailed these reflections and my conviction that the gros ventre was an excellent sailor and that she was provisioned for seven months determined me to return to mauritius which i reached upon the sixteenth of march fortunately no accident had happened to the gros ventre her boat had returned in time monsieur de boisguienec 
who had landed, had taken possession of the land with all the usual formalities, and left some writing in a bottle, which was found by Captain Cook in 1776. Kerguelen returned to France, but his successful enterprise had gained him many enemies. When, upon the 1st of January, 1772, the king nominated him captain, and Chevalier de Saint-Louis, the attacks upon him increased. The most malignant slanders were circulated. They even went the length of accusing him of having scuttled the Gros Ventre in order to derive all the benefit accruing from the discovery which he had made, in concert with Monsieur de saint wallarn The minister, however, was not influenced by these slanders, and decided to entrust the command of a second expedition to Kerguelen the roland and the frigate oiseau left brest upon the twenty sixth of march seventeen seventy two the latter under command of monsieur de saux de rosnevet upon reaching the cape kerguelen was obliged to put in for forty days the entire crew was suffering from putrid fever probably owing to the dampness of the new vessel this appeared the more probable says the narrative because all the dried vegetables such as peas beans lentils etc together with the rice and a quantity of biscuits were spoiled in the storeroom the vegetables emitted a kind of steam which was infectious and the storerooms became infested with number of white worms the roland left the cape upon the eleventh of july but she was almost immediately overtaken by a frightful tempest which carried away two topsails the jib and the mizen mast finally mauritius was reached by means of jury masts Monsieur de rochet and poivre who had contributed so essentially to the success of the first expedition had been succeeded by messieurs de ternay and the intendant maillard they appeared determined to offer every possible obstacle to the execution of kerguelen's orders they gave him no fresh victuals of which the crew had pressing need and there were no means of replacing the masts destroyed by the tempest in lieu of the thirty-four sailors who had to go to the hospital he was provided only with the disgraced or maimed soldiers of whom he was glad to rid himself an expedition to the southern seas so equipped could only come to a disastrous end and that was precisely what happened on the fifth of january kerguelen sighted the lands he had discovered in his first voyage and between that date and the sixteenth he recognized various points croy island reunion island roland island which in his estimation made more than eighty leagues of coast the weather continued extremely severe thick fogs snow hail and gales succeeding each other on the twenty first the vessels could only keep in company by constant firing upon that day the cold was so severe that several of the sailors fainted on deck the officers says kerguelen insisted that the ordinary ration of biscuit was not enough and that without more the crew could not possibly resist the cold and fog i increased each man's rations by four ounces of biscuit daily upon the eighth of january seventeen seventy four the roland signalled the frigate at reunion island communication with her was opened and m rosnevet declared that he had found an anchorage in a bay behind cape Française, that he had sent a boat on the sixth to take soundings and that upon landing to take possession the man had killed a sea lion and some penguins once again the prostrate conditions of the crew the bad quality of the victuals and the dilapidated state of the vessels prevented kerguelen from making a thorough investigation of this desolate archipelago he was forced to return but instead of returning to mauritius he landed in anton Bay, madagascar where he was sure of obtaining lemons limes custard apples and other antiscorbutics as well as fresh meat an adventurer named benyovsky whose history is sufficiently curious had just founded a french colony there but he was in need of everything kerguelen gave him ammunition bricks iron implements shirts blankets etc and finally ordered his carpenters to build a store-shed for him thirty-four of the crew of the roland had died since leaving the southern regions and if kerguelen had remained another week in these latitudes he would have lost a hundred men on his return to france kerguelen met with nothing but ill-will and calumny in return for so much fatigue so bravely borne the feeling against him was so strong that one of his officers was not ashamed to publish a memoir in which all the facts were dressed up in the most unfavourable shape and the failure of the enterprise thrown upon kerguelen we do not assert that he was entirely free from blame 
but we consider the verdict of the council of war which deprived him of his rank and condemned him to detention in the chateau of Saumur most unjust no doubt the judgment was found to be excessive and the government discerned more malice than justice in it for a few months later kerguelen was restored to liberty the gravest charge against him was that of having abandoned his sloop and a portion of his crew in the southern seas who but for the opportune arrival of the fortune must have perished probably however even this was much exaggerated for a letter exists from the abandoned officer m de rosilly afterwards vice-admiral in which he begs to serve again under kerguelen the account of these expeditions is an extract from the apology published by kerguelen during his imprisonment a work which was confiscated by government and on that account is extremely rare we must now turn our attention to the account of expeditions which although they did not result in discoveries had an importance of their own they contributed to the rectification of charts to the progress of navigation and geography but above all they solved a long-standing problem the determination of longitude at sea to decide upon the position of a locality it is first necessary to obtain its latitude that is to say its distance north or south from the equator and its longitude or in other words its distance east or west from some known meridian at this period no instrument for determining the position of a ship existed but the rope known as a log which thrown into the sea measured the distance which the ship made every half minute the proportionate speed of the vessel per hour was deduced from it but the log is far from immovable and the speed of a vessel is not always the same hence arose two important sources of error the direction of the route was determined by the mariner's needle or compass but every one knows that the compass is subject to variations and that the vessel does not invariably follow the course it indicates and it is no easy matter to determine the exact difference these inconveniences once admitted the question was to find a method exempt from them with headley's quadrant latitude could be determined within a minute that is to say to the third of a league but such an approximate exactitude was not possible in deciding longitudes when once the different phenomena of the variation of the magnetic needle either of declination or inclination should be fully understood it would be easy but how to obtain this knowledge it was well known that in the indian sea between bourbon madagascar and rodriguez a variation of four degrees in the declination of the needle was equivalent to a variation of five degrees in the longitude but it was equally admitted that the declination of the magnetic needle was subject to variations in the same localities for which no cause could be assigned verdun de la crenne writing in seventeen seventy eight says a declination of twelve degrees from north to south twenty years ago indicated a longitude of sixty one degrees west of paris in any given latitude it is very probable that within the last twenty years the declination has varied two degrees which makes the longitude deduced from it wrong by two and a half degrees or nearly fifty nautical miles if the right time is known on board that is to say the correct time by which the meridian could be computed at the moment of any given observation and if at the same time the exact time at the port from which the ship had started or that if any known meridian could be ascertained the difference of time would evidently give that of the meridians at the rate of fifteen degrees per hour or one degree per four minutes the problem of the longitude could thus be reduced to a determination at a given moment of the time at any given meridian to achieve this it was necessary to have a watch or clock which should preserve a perfect isochronism in defiance of the state of the sea or differences of temperature many attempts had been made besson in the sixteenth century huygens in the seventeenth century and again sully harrison dutertre galland rivas leroy and ferdinand Berthoud had attempted to solve the problem the english and french governments moreover convinced of the value of a perfect instrument had offered a high reward for its invention the academy of sciences had instituted a competition in seventeen sixty five leroy sent in two watches for competition whilst Berthoud, who was in the king's service was unable to do so leroy's watches passed successfully through the various trials to which they were subjected on land it remained to be proven whether they would be equally trustworthy at sea 
the marquise de constanvaux had the frigate aurora built at his own cost for the experiment leroy however decided that a cruise with constant stoppages at calais dunkirk rotterdam amsterdam and boulogne lasting only from the twenty fifth of may to the twenty ninth of august was far too short and he demanded a second trial this time his watches were sent on board the frigate of enjouet which leaving havre put in at st pierre near tenerife at salé in africa at cadiz and finally after a voyage of four months and a half at brest the trial had been a serious one the latitudes and the state of the sea having both changed constantly if the watch had neither lost nor gained it won the prize which was in fact assigned to le Roy. the academy however knew that many other scientific men had bestowed their attention upon the subject and for various causes had been unable to exhibit they therefore proposed the same subject for the competition of seventeen seventy one and in seventeen seventy three they doubled the prize f pertou imagined that he had reached perfection but his watch had still to be tested by the trial of a long sea voyage the isis a frigate of eighteen guns was equipped at rochefort at the latter end of seventeen sixty eight and placed under command of chevalier de vaux de florienne known later as carré de florienne florienne then a midshipman was already though only thirty years of age a well-known savant we have already mentioned his name and shall find further occasion to do so but that his disinterestedness might be above suspicion he selected several officers to assist him in observing the motions of the watch which was entrusted to him starting in november seventeen sixty eight the isis put in successfully at cadiz the canary islands gori the cape Verde islands martinique san domingo terra nuova the canaries cadiz again and reached as island on the thirty first of october seventeen sixty eight the watches carried through climates alternately cold hot and temperate had experienced every vicissitude of climate and at the same time had been exposed to all the variations of the sea in the roughest season of the year after the trial which had redounded so much to his honour bertu obtained the rank and pension of an inspector of nautical watches the expedition had other results which concern us more particularly florian took a number of astronomical observations and hydrographical surveys which resulted in a well-founded condemnation of the maps of his country for a long time he says in his account of his voyage i did not attempt criticism of the maps belonging to the society i wished to limit myself to giving new details by which they might be rectified but i found such numberless and dangerous mistakes that i should have considered myself culpable towards mariners if i had neglected fully to point them out a little further on he justly criticizes the maps of a geographer who had at one time been famous i will not undertake he says to enumerate all the errors which i had found in Monsieur Bellin's maps their number is infinite i shall content myself simply with proving the necessity for the work i did by indicating the more glaring faults either by comparing the positions of various places upon his maps with the positions they should have occupied if m bellin had been willing to use the astronomical observations which have been published at various times or by comparing other positions with those which we have determined by our own observations lastly after giving a long list of errors in the situation of the most frequented places of europe of africa and america he winds up with these judicious words upon glancing at a list of the various errors i have discovered in Monsieur bellin's maps one is led to a reflection sad but true and inevitable if the maps of the best-known part of the globe and on which the greater number of observations have been taken are so far from correct what exactitude can we hope to find in maps representing less frequented shores and islands drawn and arranged by guesswork up to this time the watches had been examined separately and by different judges now arose the question of submitting them simultaneously to the same test and of seeing which one come out victorious for this purpose the frigate la fleur was equipped at brest and the command was given to a most distinguished officer verdun de la crene who was to become vice-admiral in seventeen eighty six the various stages of the expedition were cadiz madeira the selvage islands tenerife gore martinique terra nuova iceland which our explorers had some trouble to find the faroe islands denmark and dunkerque 
the narrative published by Verdun de la Crenne, like that of Florian, abounds in rectifications of every kind. It is easy to see how carefully and exactly the soundings were taken, with what care the coasts were surveyed, but not a little interesting also is that which is altogether wanting in Florian's publication, descriptions of the countries and critical reflection upon the manners and customs of the different peoples visited amongst the most interesting particulars contained in two large quarto volumes we must mention those relating to the canary islands and their ancient inhabitants the seders and yolofs on iceland and the accurate remarks made by verdun upon the subject of the meridian of faroe islands it was the most easterly meridian of these islands he says that ptolemy chose for the first meridian it would doubtless have been easy for him to have selected alexandria for the first meridian but this great man was aware that such a choice would bring no real honour to his country that rome and other ambitious towns might covet this imaginary glory that every geographer every narrator of voyages arbitrarily choosing his own meridian would engender confusion or at least embarrassment in the mind of the reader clearly verdun regarded the question of the first meridian from a high standpoint as all really disinterested minds still do it gives him yet another claim to our sympathy let us conclude with a quotation from this author the watches came out of the contest with honour they had borne heat and cold they had been becalmed they had endured shocks as well as the vessels which carried them when it was wrecked at antigua and when it received charges of artillery in a word they fulfilled the hopes we had indulged they deserve the confidence of navigators and lastly they are of great service in the determination of longitude at sea the solution of the problem was found End of section 27section twenty eight of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter one part two French navigators 2a the expedition of la perouse st catherine's island conception island the sandwich islands survey of the american coast french port loss of two boats monterey and the indians of california stay at macao cavite and manila en route for china and japan formosa quelpert island the coast of Tartary, Ternay Bay, the Tartars of Segalian, the Orochis, Straits of La Perouse, Ball at Kamtschatka, Navigator Islands, Massacre of Monsieur de Longo and several of his companions, Botany Bay, no news of the expedition, D'Entrecasteaux sent in search of La Perouse, false news, D'Entrecasteaux Channel the coast of new caledonia land of the arsades the natives of buca stay in port carteret admiralty islands stay at omboan lewin land Nudes archipelago stay in tasmania fate in the friendly islands particulars of the stay of la perouse at tonga at tonga tabu stay at balado traces of la perouse in new caledonia vanicoro sad fate of the expedition the result of cook's voyage except the fact of his death was still unknown when the french government resolved to make use of the leisure which the peace just concluded had secured to the navy the french officers desirous of emulating the success of their old rivals the english were fired with a noble emulation to excel them in some new field the question arose as to the fittest person for the conduct of an important expedition there was no lack of deserving candidates indeed in the number lay the difficulty the minister's choice fell upon jean francois gallo de la perouse whose important military services had rapidly advanced him to the rank of captain during the last war 
he had been entrusted with the difficult mission of destroying the english posts in hudson's bay and in this task he had proved himself not only an able soldier and sailor but a man who could combine humanity with professional firmness second to him in the command was monsieur de Longle, who had ably assisted him in the expedition to hudson's bay a large staff embarked upon the two frigates la boussole and l'astrolabe on board the boussole were la perouse clenard who was made captain during the expedition moneron an engineer bernizet a geographer rollin a surgeon le pont d'agelet an astronomer of the academy of sciences lamanon a physicist duchet de vancy and prevost the younger draughtsman collignon a botanist and guerry a clockmaker the astrolabe in addition to her commander captain de Longle, carried lieutenant de monte who was made captain during the voyage and the celebrated mange who fortunately for the interests of science landed at tenerife upon the thirtieth of august seventeen eighty five the academy of sciences and the society of medicine had drawn up reports for the minister of marine in which they called the attention of the navigators to certain points lastly fleurion the superintendent of ports and naval arsenals had himself drawn up the maps for the service of the expedition and added to it an entire volume of learned notes and discussions upon the results of all known voyages since the time of christopher columbus the two ships carried an enormous amount of merchandise for trade as well as a vast quantity of provisions and stores a twenty-ton boat two sloops masts and reserve sets of sails and riggings the two first frigates sailed upon the first of august seventeen eighty five and anchored off madeira thirteen days later the french were at once charmed and surprised at the kind and cordial welcome accorded them by the english residents upon the nineteenth la perouse put into tenerife the various observations he says made by messieurs de florian Vedou, and Borda, upon madeira the salvage islands and tenerife leave nothing to be wished for our attention was therefore confined to testing our instruments this remark proves that la perouse was capable of doing justice to his predecessors and we shall have other opportunities of observing that quality in him while the astronomers devoted themselves to estimating the regularity of the astronomical watches the naturalists with several officers ascended the peak and collected some curious plants moneron succeeded in measuring this mountain with much greater accuracy than his predecessors herberdin fouillet bouguer verdun and border who calculated its heights respectively at two thousand four hundred and nine two thousand two hundred and thirteen two thousand one hundred and one thousand nine hundred and four fathoms unfortunately his work which would have settled the discussion never reached france upon the sixteenth of october the isles or rather rocks of martin vas were seen la perouse ascertained their position and afterwards made for the nearest trinity island which was only some nine leagues to the west the commander of the expedition sent a sloop on shore in charge of an officer in the hope of finding water wood and provisions the officer had an interview with the portuguese governor whose garrison consisted of about two hundred men fifteen of whom wore uniforms and the rest merely shirts the poverty of the land was obvious and the french re-embarked without having obtained anything after a vain search for ascension island the expedition reached st catherine's island off the coast of brazil after ninety-six days navigation we read in the narrative of the voyage published by general millet Moreau, we had not one case of illness on board the health of the crew had remained unimpaired by change of climate rain and fog but our provisions were of first-class quality i neglected none of the precautions which experience and prudence suggested to me and above all we kept up our spirits by encouraging dancing every evening among the crew whenever the weather permitted from eight o'clock till ten 
st catherine's island of which we have more than once had occasion to speak in the course of this narrative extends from twenty seven degrees nineteen minutes ten seconds south latitude to twenty seven degrees forty nine minutes it is only two leagues wide and is divided in its narrowest part from the mainland by a channel of two hundred fathoms the town of nostra senora del destera the capital of the colony where the governor resides is built at the point of this narrow entrance the population amounts at the utmost to three thousand and there are about four hundred houses the appearance of the town is very pleasant according to frisia's account this island was a refuge in 1712 for the vagabonds who fled there from different parts of Brazil. These were Portuguese subjects in name only and recognized no other authority. The country is so fertile that the inhabitants can live quite independently of any neighboring colony. The ships in the harbor gave them shirts and coats, of which they had absolutely none, in exchange for provisions this island is extremely fertile and the soil can easily be made to grow sugar-cane but inhabitants are so poor that they cannot buy the needful slaves for the labor the french vessels found all that they needed in this spot and their officers were cordially received by the portuguese authorities the following fact will give an idea of the hospitality of these people my boat says la perouse having been upset in a creek where i was having wood cut the inhabitants after assisting in saving it insisted on our shipwrecked sailors using their beds and themselves slept on mats upon the floor of the room where they received them so hospitably a few days later they brought to my vessel the sails mast grapnel and flag of the boat which would have been of great use to them for their pirogues the boussal and the astrolabe weighed anchor upon the nineteenth of november and directed their course to cape horn after a violent storm during which the frigates behaved very well and after forty days fruitless search for the large island discovered by a frenchman antoine de la roche and called georgia by captain cook la perouse crossed the straits of le maire finding the winds favorable he decided not to remain in good success bay at this advanced season of the year but immediately to double cape horn in the hope of avoiding a possible delay that would have exposed his ships to injury and his crew to useless fatigue the friendly demonstrations of the fuegians the abundance of whales which had never before been disturbed the immense flocks of albatross and petrels did not change his resolve cape horn was rounded more easily than could have been expected upon the ninth of february the expedition was in the straits of magellan and upon the twenty fourth anchor was cast in concepcion harbour which la perouse preferred to that of juan fernandez on account of the exhaustion of his provisions the robust health of the crews astonished the spanish governor possibly this was the first time a vessel had rounded cape horn and arrived in chile without any sick on board the town which was destroyed by an earthquake in seventeen fifty seven had been rebuilt three leagues from the sea upon the shore of the river biobio the houses are of one story and the town of la concepcion contains ten thousand inhabitants the bay is one of the most commodious in the world the sea is smooth and almost free from currents this part of chile is wonderfully fertile one ear of corn reproduces sixty vines are equally prolific and the country teems with innumerable flocks which multiply beyond all credence in spite of these prosperous conditions the country made no progress on account of the prohibitive system which at this time prevailed chile with its productions which might easily have fed the half of europe its wool which might have sufficed for the manufactures of france and england its meats which might have been preserved had no commerce whatever at the same time the duty upon imported goods was excessive so that living was very dear the middle class as the bourgeoisie is now called did not exist the population consisted of two classes the rich and the poor as the following passage shows Quote, 
the dress of the women consists of a plaited skirt of the ancient gold or silver tissues which were formerly manufactured at lyon these petticoats which are kept for grand occasions are often inherited like diamonds and are handed down from generation to generation they are only worn by a small number of the highest class the others have scarcely the means of clothing themselves at all End quote. We will not follow La Perouse into his details of the enthusiastic reception given to him, and we will pass over in silence his description of balls and toilettes, which never for a moment induced him to lose sight of the object of his voyage. So far, the expedition had only passed through regions often before visited by Europeans. It was now about to penetrate to less known realms. Anchor was raised upon the 15th of March, and after a voyage entirely free from incident the two frigates anchored upon the ninth of april in cook's bay easter island la perouse affirms that mr hodges the painter who accompanied the celebrated english navigator has given a very unjust representation of the inhabitants generally their physiognomies are pleasing but they cannot be said to have much character this is by no means the only point upon which the french navigator differs from captain cook he believed the famous statues of which one of the draughtsmen made an excellent sketch to have been the work of the present generation whose numbers he estimates at two thousand it appeared to him also that the absolute lack of trees and therefore of lakes and rivers was due to the extravagant waste of wood by the earlier races no disagreeable incident occurred during the stay robberies it is true were frequent but as the french intended remaining only one day on the island they thought it superfluous to give the population stricter ideas of honesty after leaving easter island upon the tenth of april la perouse followed the same route as cook had done in seventeen seventy seven when he sailed from tahiti to the american coast but he was a hundred leagues farther west la perouse indulged in the hope of making discoveries in this little known region of the pacific ocean and he promised to reward the sailor who should first sight land upon the twenty ninth of may the hawaiian archipelago was reached the naval watches proved of great assistance upon this occasion and justified the opinion entertained of them upon reaching the sandwich islands la perouse found a difference of five degrees between the longitude given and that obtained by him without the watches he would have placed this group five degrees too far east this explains why the islands discovered by the spanish mendana queros etc are much too near the american coast and also the non-existence of the group called by the spaniards la mesa los majos and las desglaciada which there is every reason to suppose was none other than the sandwich archipelago as mesa in spanish means table and captain king compares the mountain called mauna loa to a plateau or tableland he did not however trust to conjecture he crossed the reputed site of los majos and found not the slightest trace of land the aspect of monet says la perouse is delightful we saw water tumbling in cascades from the summit of the mountains and reaching the sea after watering the indian plantations of which there are so many that each village extends over three or four leagues all the huts are however on the seashore and the mountains are so close that the habitable portion of the land appeared to me to be less than half a league in depth one must be a sailor and like us have been reduced to a bottle of water per day in a burning climate to realize the sensations we experienced the trees which crowned the mountains the green fields the banana trees which surrounded the dwellings all combined to charm our senses with an inexpressible delight but the sea broke violently on the shore and like tantalus we were obliged to devour with our eyes what was completely beyond our reach the two frigates had no sooner anchored than they were surrounded by pirogues full of natives offering pigs potatoes bananas taro etc clever traders they attached most value to bits of old iron rings their acquaintance with iron and its use for which they were not indebted to cook is another proof that this people had known the spaniards to whom the discovery of the group is probably due 
the welcome accorded to la perouse was most cordial in spite of the military force by which he had thought proper to protect himself although the french were the first to land on monet island la perouse did not think it his duty to take possession the usual european custom in such matters he says is perfectly ridiculous philosophers may well sigh when they see men simply because they have guns and bayonets thinking nothing of sixty thousand of their fellow men and without the least respect for the most sacred rights looking upon a land whose inhabitants have cultivated it in the sweat of the brow and whose ancestors lie buried there as an object fit for conquest la perouse does not pause to give any details about the inhabitants of these sandwich islands he only passed a few hours there whilst the english remained for four months he therefore rightly refers to captain cook's narrative during their short stay the french bought more than a hundred pigs mats fruits a pirogue ornaments made of feathers and shells and handsome helmets decorated with feathers the instructions furnished la perouse before his departure enjoined him to survey the american coast of which a portion extending to mount elias had with the exception of nootka port been merely sighted by captain cook on the twenty third of june he reached sixty degrees north latitude and in the midst of a long chain of snow-covered mountains recognized the mount elias of bering after skirting along the coast for some time la perouse sent three boats under command of one of his officers monsieur de mont who discovered a large bay to which he gave his name following the coast at a short distance surveys were taken which were uninterrupted as far as an important river which received the name of bering apparently it was that to which cook had given this name End of section 28section twenty nine of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter one part two french navigators to b upon the second of july in fifty eight degrees thirty six minutes latitude and a hundred and forty degrees three minutes longitude what appeared to be a fine bay was discovered boats under command of messieurs de pierre Vert, de flasson and boutevilliers were sent to examine it their report being favourable the two frigates arrived at the entrance of the bay but the astrolabe was driven back to the open sea by a strong current and the boussole was forced to join her at six o'clock in the morning after a night passed under sail the vessels again approached the bay but says the narrative at seven in the morning when we were close to it the wind veered so suddenly to west northwest and north northwest that we were forced to give way and even to bring our ships to the wind fortunately the tide carried our frigates into the bay and we escaped the rocks on the east by half a pistol's range i anchored in three and a half fathoms with a rocky bottom half a cable's length from the shore the astrolabe had anchored in the same depth and upon a similar bottom in all the thirty years i have spent at sea i have never seen two vessels in greater danger our situation would have been safe had we not anchored upon a rocky bottom which extended several cables length around us and which was different from what messieurs de flasson and boutevilliers had reported we had no time to make reflections it was above everything necessary to get out of our dangerous anchorage to which the rapidity of the current was a great obstacle however by dint of much skilful tacking la perouse succeeded ever since their entry into the bay the vessels had been surrounded by pirogues swarming with savages the natives showed a decided preference for iron in exchange for fish and the skins of otters and other animals after a few days stay their number increased rapidly and they became if not dangerous at least a nuisance 
la perouse established an observatory upon one of the islands in the bay and set up tents for the sailmakers and smiths although these posts were most carefully watched the natives gliding along the ground like snakes scarcely stirring a leaf managed in spite of our sentinels to commit various thefts and one night they were clever enough to enter the tent where messieurs de Lonston and darbo who were in charge of the observatory slept they carried off a silver mounted gun as well as the clothes belonging to the two officers who had placed them for safety under their pillows they escaped the notice of a guard of twelve men and the two officers were not even awakened but now the stay of the expedition in this port drew to a close the soundings surveys plans and astronomical observations were completed but before finally leaving the island la perouse wished thoroughly to explore the depths of the bay he imagined that some large river must empty itself into it which would enable him to penetrate into the interior but in all the openings he entered he found only vast glaciers which extended to the very summit of fairweather mount no accident or sickness marred the success which had so far attended the expedition we thought ourselves said la perouse the most fortunate of navigators for having reached so great a distance from europe without having had one invalid or a single sufferer from scurvy but the greatest misfortune and one it was impossible to foresee now awaited us upon the chart of the port des francais drawn up by messieurs monneron and bernizet the soundings alone remained to be indicated the naval officers were bound to accomplish the task and three boats under the orders of messieurs d'escure de marchainville and boutin were selected for the undertaking la perouse acquainted with the somewhat rash zeal of messieurs d'escure advised him on the eve of departure to act with most careful prudence and only to attempt the soundings in the channel if the sea was smooth the boats left at six o'clock in the morning it was as much a party of pleasure as of duty as the crews were to hunt and breakfast under the trees at ten in the morning says la perouse i saw our little boat return somewhat surprised for i had not expected it so soon i asked monsieur boutin before he came on deck whether he had any news at first i feared an attack from the natives and monsieur boutin's expression was not calculated to reassure me for it was profoundly sad he soon related to me the terrible disaster he had just witnessed and from which he had escaped by the presence of mind which enabled him to see the best course to pursue in the dreadful peril carried whilst following his commander into the midst of breakers caused by the tide rushing with a speed of three or four leagues per hour out of the channel he thought he could place his boat stern on the breakers the boat yielding to their force and being impelled by this tide would not fill but would be carried safely outside soon however he saw breakers ahead of his boat and found himself in the open sea more concerned for the safety of his companions than for his own he again approached the breakers and in the hope of saving some life he again braved them but was repulsed by the tide finally he mounted on monsieur mouton's shoulder in the hope of finding a wider opening all was in vain everything had been swallowed up and monsieur boutin returned with the ebb of the tide the sea becoming quieter this officer had still some hope of finding the boat of the astrolabe he had only witnessed the loss of ours monsieur de marchainville was now a quarter of a mile from the danger that is to say in a sea as still as the quietest harbour but impelled by an imprudent generosity for all help was quite impossible under the circumstances this rash young officer being too high-spirited and too courageous to pause in presence of his friend's danger flew to their help threw himself among the breakers and a victim to his imprudence and disregard of his chief's orders perished with him monsieur de Langle shortly after came on board my ship as much overcome as myself and informed me with tears that the misfortune was even greater than i had supposed we had always made a point ever since leaving france of never allowing the two brothers monsieur laborde marchainville and monsieur laborde boutevilliers to go on the same service 
but on this one occasion he had yielded as they desired to hunt together and it was almost wholly on this account that we had both of us directed our boats in the way we did thinking there was as little danger as there is in brest harbour in fine weather several boats were at once dispatched in search of the shipwrecked crew rewards were offered to the natives if they saved any one but the return of the sloops destroyed all hope all had perished eighteen days after this catastrophe the two frigates left the port des francais la perouse erected a monument to the memory of his unfortunate countrymen in the middle of the bay on an island which he called the cenotaph it bore the following inscription at the entrance of this port twenty-one brave sailors perished whoever you are mingle your tears with ours a bottle containing an account of this deplorable accident was buried at the foot of the monument the port des francais which is situated in fifty eight degrees thirty seven minutes north latitude and a hundred and thirty nine degrees fifty minutes west longitude presents many advantages but also many inconveniences foremost among them the currents of the channel the climate is much milder than in hudson's bay which is in the same latitude the vegetation is vigorous pines six feet in girth and a hundred and forty in height are not rare celery sorrel lupine wild pea chicory and mimulus are met with in every direction as well as many pot herbs the use of which helped to keep the crews in health the sea supplied abundance of salmon trout cod and place in the woods are found black and brown bears the lynx ermine weasel miniver squirrel marmot beaver fox elk and the wild goat the most precious skins are those of the otter wolf and sea bear but if the vegetable and animal productions of this country says la perouse are similar to those of many others its aspect cannot be compared with them and i doubt whether the deep valleys of the alps and pyrenees offer so terrible and at the same time so picturesque a prospect were it not at one of the extremities of the world it should be visited by every one as to the inhabitants la perouse gives an account of them which is worth preserving the indians in their pirogues surrounded our frigates hovering about for three or four hours before beginning to exchange a few fish or two or three otter skins they seized every opportunity of robbing us they tore off all the iron which could be easily carried away and they took every precaution to elude our vigilance at night i invited some of the principal personages on board my frigate and loaded them with presents and the very men i distinguished in this manner did not scruple to steal a nail or an old pair of trousers whenever they assumed a particularly lively and pleasant air i was convinced that they had committed a theft and i often pretended not to see it the women make an opening in the thick part of the lower lip the whole length of the jaw they wear a sort of wooden bowl without a handle which rests on the gums to which this split lip forms an outer cushion in such a way that the lower part of the mouth protrudes some two or three inches the forced stay which la perouse had just made in port des francais prevented his stopping elsewhere and reconnoitring the indentations of the coast for at all hazards he was to reach china during the month of february in order to secure the following summary for a survey of the coast of tartary he successively reconnoitred upon this coast cross sound where the high snow-covered mountains cease cook's island bay engamio cape low land partly submerged and containing mount hyacinthine mount edgecombe of cook norfolk sound where the following year the english navigator dixon was to anchor ports necker and guibert cape cheery cow Quayer islands so called after the brother of the famous geographer de lille companion of cheery cow the san carlos islands la touche bay and cape hector la perouse imagined that these various coastlines were formed by a vast archipelago and in this he was correct they contained george the third's island prince of wales and queen charlotte's islands 
Cape Hector forming the southern extremity of the latter. The season was far advanced, and too short a time remained at La Perouse's disposal to allow of his making detailed observations of these countries, but his instinct had justly led him to imagine that the series of points he had discovered indicated a group of islands, and not a continent. Beyond Cape Fleurian, which formed the extremity of an elevated island, he passed several groups which he named Sartines, and then returning, he reached Nootka Sound on the 25th of August. He afterwards visited parts of the continent which Cook had been unable to approach, and which had left a blank on his chart. This navigation was attended with a certain amount of danger on account of the currents, which rendered it impossible to make more than three knots an hour at a distance of five leagues from land. Upon the 5th of September, new islets were discovered, about a league from Cape Blanco, to which the captain gave the name of Necker Islands. The fog was very thick, and more than once the fear of running upon some islet or rock, the existence of which could not be suspected, obliged the vessel to deviate from the land. Until they reached Monterey Bay, the weather continued bad. At that port, La Perouse found two Spanish vessels. At this time, Monterey Bay abounded in whales, and the sea was literally covered with pelicans, which were very common upon the Californian coast. A garrison of 280 men was sufficient to keep in order a population of 50,000 Indians, wandering about this part of America. It must be admitted that these Indians were usually small and insignificant, and not endowed with that love of independence which characterizes the northern tribes, and, unlike them, they have no appreciation of art and no industry. These Indians, says the narrative, are very expert in the use of the bow and arrow. They killed the smallest birds in our presence. It is true that they approach them with wonderful patience, hiding themselves, gliding somehow close to their prey, and aiming at them only when within fifteen paces. Their skill in the capture of larger animals is even more wonderful. We saw an Indian with a stag's head over his own, walking on all fours, appearing to graze, and carrying out the pantomime, with such truth to life that our hunters would have fired at him at thirty paces had they not been prevented by this means the natives approach quite close to a herd of deer and then kill them with their arrows la perouse gave many details of the presidency of loretto and of the californian missions but these are rather of historical interest and are out of place in a work of this kind his remarks upon the fertility of the country are more within our programme the harvest of maize barley corn and peas he says is comparable only to that of chile our european husbandmen could not conceive of such abundance the most moderate yield of corn is at the rate of from seventy and eighty to one and the largest from sixty to a hundred upon the twenty second of september the two frigates returned to sea after a cordial welcome from the spanish governor and the missionaries they carried with them a quantity of provisions of all sorts which would be of the greatest value to them during the long trip to be taken before reaching macao the portion of the ocean now to be crossed by the french was almost unknown the spaniards had navigated it previously but their political jealousy prevented their publishing the discoveries and observations they had made la perouse wished to steer southwest as far as twenty eight degrees latitude where some geographers had placed the island of Nuestra Señor de la Gorta, but he looked for it in vain during a long and difficult cruise, with contrary winds, which sorely tried the patience of the navigators. We were daily reminded, he says, by the condition of our sails and rigging, that we had been sixteen months at sea. Our ropes gave way, and the sailmakers could not repair the sails, which were fairly worn out upon the sixth of november a small island or rather rock some five hundred fathoms long upon which not a single tree grew and which was thickly covered with guano was discovered it was named necker island and is in a hundred and sixty six degrees fifty two minutes longitude west of paris and twenty three degrees thirty four minutes north latitude never had the expedition seen a more lovely sea or a more exquisite night 
when suddenly at about half past one in the morning breakers were perceived two cable lengths ahead of the Boussal. the sea only broken here and there by a slight ripple was so calm that it scarcely made any sound the ship's course was altered immediately but the manoeuvre took time and when it was accomplished the vessel was but a cable's length off the rocks we had just escaped one of the most imminent dangers to which navigators are subject says la perouse and i must do my crews the justice to say that less disorder and confusion in such a position would have been impossible the slightest neglect of the execution of the manoeuvres which were necessary to carry us from the breakers would have been fatal these rocks were unknown it was therefore needful to determine their exact position for the safety of succeeding navigators la perouse after fulfilling this duty named them the reef of the french frigates upon the fourteenth of december the astrolabe and the boussole sighted the mariana islands a landing was effected upon the volcanic island of assumption here the lava had formed ravines and precipices bordered by a few stunted coconut trees alternately with tropical creepers and the fruit shrubs it was almost impossible to advance a couple of hundred yards in an hour landing and re-embarkation were difficult and the few coconut shells and bananas of a new variety which the naturalists obtained were not worth the risk it was impossible to remain longer in this archipelago if china were to be reached before the vessels returned to europe they were to take back an account of the results of the expedition upon the american coast and of the crossing to macao after taking the position of the bashis without stopping la perouse sighted the coast of china and next day cast anchor in the roadstead of macao here la perouse met with a small french cutter commanded by monsieur de richerie midshipman whose business it was to cruise about the eastern coast and protect french trade the town of macao is so well known that it is needless for us to give la perouse's description of it the constant outrages and humiliations to which europeans were daily subjected under the most despotic and cowardly government in the world aroused the indignation of the french captain and made him heartily wish that an international expedition might put a stop to so intolerable a state of things the furs which had been collected upon the american coasts were sold at macao for ten thousand piastres the sum produced should have been divided among the crews and the head of the swedish company undertook to ship it at mauritius but the unfortunate sailors themselves were never to receive the money leaving macao on the fifth of february the vessels directed their course to manila and after sighting the shoals of pratis bulinao manseloc and marivel wrongly placed upon dapre's maps they were forced to put into the port of marivel and wait for better winds and more favourable currents although marivel is only one league to windward of cavito three days were consumed in reaching the latter port we found says the narrative different houses where we could repair our sails salt our provisions construct two boats lodge the naturalists and geographical engineers and the governor kindly lent us his own for the establishment of our observatory we enjoyed as much liberty as if we had been in the country and in the market and arsenal we found the same resources as in the best european ports Cavito, the second town of the Philippine Islands and the capital of the province of the same name, was then but a miserable village where only Spanish military and government officers resided. But although the town was nothing but a mass of ruins, it was none the less a port and afforded the French every possible resource. Upon the morrow of his arrival, La Perouse, accompanied by de Longle and his principal officers, paid a visit to the governor, reaching Manila by boat the environs of manila are delightful he says a most beautiful river flows through it separating into different canals one of which leads to the famous bay lake which is distant seven leagues in the interior surrounded by more than a hundred indian settlements in the midst of a most fertile territory manila built on the shore of the bay of that name which is more than twenty-five leagues in circumference is at the mouth of a river navigable as far as the lake in which it rises 
it is probably the most fortunately situated town in the whole world provisions are found there in the greatest profusion and very cheap but clothing european cutlery and furniture fetch an enormous price want of competition the prohibitive tariffs and commercial restrictions of every sort tend to make the productions and manufactured goods of india and china at least as dear as in europe and although the various duties on imports bring to the treasury some eight hundred thousand piastres the colony costs the spanish government at least fifteen hundred thousand francs per annum which are sent from mexico the immense possessions of the spanish in america have prevented the government from bestowing much attention upon the philippines they are still like the possessions of great lords which remain uncultivated though they might provide fortunes for many families i do not hesitate to state that a great nation with no colony but the philippine islands supposing that colony to be as well governed as possible need not envy all the european colonies in africa and america upon the ninth of april after having heard of the arrival at macao of m d'entrecasteaux who had come from mauritius with the contrary monsoon and received dispatches from europe by the frigate la subtile messieurs guillet midshipman and le gobien naval officer and a reinforcement of eight sailors the two vessels set out for the coast of china End of section twenty nine Section 30 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2, Great Navigators of the 18th Century, by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 1, Part 2, French Navigators, 2C upon the twenty first la perouse sighted formosa and at once entered the channel which separates that island from china he discovered a very dangerous bank unknown to navigators and carefully examined the soundings and approaches shortly afterwards he passed in front of the bay of the ancient dutch fort of zealand where the capital of the island taiwan is situated the monsoon was unfavorable for ascending the channel and la perouse therefore resolved to pass to the east of the island he rectified the position of the pescadores islands a mass of rocks which assume various shapes reconnoitred the small island of botol tobacco chima where no navigator had landed coasted kinin island which forms part of the kingdom of lichen whose inhabitants are neither chinese nor japanese but appear to be of both races and sighted hoa pinsu and tiaoisu islands the latter form part of the lichen archipelago known only through the letters of father goubil a jesuit the frigates then entered the eastern sea and directed their course to the channel which divides china and japan la perouse there encountered fogs as thick as those which prevail upon the coast of labrador with variable and violent currents the first point of interest before entering the sea of japan was quelpert island first made known to europeans by the shipwreck of the sparrow hawk upon its coast in sixteen thirty five la perouse determined its southerly extremity and surveyed it for a distance of twelve leagues it is scarcely possible he says quote, to find an island of pleasanter aspect a peak of about four thousand five hundred feet high visible at a distance of eighteen or twenty leagues rises in the centre of the island the land slopes gently from thence to the sea so that the houses look like an amphitheatre the soil seemed to be highly cultivated by the aid of our glasses we clearly made out the divisions of the fields they are in very small allotments which augurs a large population the different shades of the various cultivated patches give a very agreeable variety to the view the explorers had ample opportunity for taking the longitude and latitude which was the more important as no european vessel had navigated these seas which were only indicated upon the maps in accordance with the chinese and japanese maps published by the jesuits upon the twenty fifth of may the frigates entered the channel of korea 
which was minutely explored, and in which soundings were taken every half hour. As it was possible to keep close in shore, it was easy to observe some fortifications in the European style, and to note all their details. On the 27th an island was perceived which was not to be found upon any map, and which seemed to be about twenty leagues distant from the coast of Korea. It received the name of Dajale Island. The course was now directed towards Japan, but it was very slow on account of the contrary winds that prevailed. On the 6th of June, Cape Noto and the island of Tsutsima were discovered. Quote, Cape Noto, upon the Japanese coast, says La Perouse, is a point on which geographers may rely, reckoning from it to Cape Kona on the eastern coast, the position of which was determined by Captain King, the width of the northern half of the empire may be ascertained. Our observations have the greater value for geographers, as they determine the width of the Gulf of Tartary, to which I now directed my course." End quote. Upon the 11th of June, La Perouse sighted Tartary. He made land precisely at the boundary between the Korea and Manchuria. The mountains appeared to be six or seven thousand feet high. A small quantity of snow was visible on the summits. No trace of inhabitants or cultivation could be seen, nor was any river's mouth found upon a length of coast extending for forty leagues. A halt would have been desirable to enable the naturalists and lithologists to make observations. Quote, Up to the 14th of June, the coast had run to the northeast by north, we were now at 44 degrees latitude, and had reached the degree which geographers assign for the so-called Strait of Tassoy, but we were five degrees farther west than the longitude given for this spot. These five degrees should be taken from Tartary and added to the channel which separates it from the islands north of Japan. End quote. Whilst coasting along this shore, no sign of habitation had been perceived. Not a pirogue left the shore. The country, although covered with magnificent trees and luxuriant vegetation, appeared to be uninhabited. On the 23rd of June, the Boussole and the Astrolabe cast anchor in a bay situated in 45 degrees 13 minutes north latitude and 135 degrees 9 minutes east longitude. It was named Ternay Bay. Quote, we burned with impatience, says La Perouse, to reconnoitre this land, which had occupied our imagination ever since we left France. It was the only portion of the globe which had escaped the indefatigable activity of Captain Cook, and perhaps we owe the small advantage of having first landed there to the sad event which ended his days. This roadstead was formed of five little creeks, separated one from the other by hillocks covered with trees of a more delicate and varied green than is to be seen in France in the brightest spring. Before our boats reached the shore, our glasses had been directed to the coast, but we perceived nothing but stags and bears quietly grazing. Our impatience to disembark increased at the sight. The ground was carpeted with plants similar to those of our climate, but more vigorous and green. Most of them were in flower. At every step we found roses, red and yellow lilies, lilies of the valley, and almost all our field flowers. The summits of the mountains were crowned with pines, and oak trees grew halfway up, decreasing in size and vigor as they neared the sea. The rivers and streams were planted with willows, birches, and maples, and skirting the larger woods we saw apple trees and azaroles in full bloom, as well as clumps of nut trees, the fruit of which was beginning to form." End quote. Upon returning from a fishing excursion, the French met with a tartar tomb curiosity induced them to open it, and they found in it two skeletons laying side by side. The heads were covered with stuff caps, the bodies were wrapped in bearskins, and from the waists hung several little Chinese coins and copper ornaments. They also found half a score of silver bracelets, an iron hatchet, a knife, and other things, amongst which was a small bag of blue nanking filled with rice. Upon the morning of the 27th, La Perouse left this solitary bay, after depositing there several medals, with an inscription giving the date of his arrival. A little further on, 
more than eight hundred cod which were at once salted were caught and an immense quantity of oysters with superb mother of pearl were also obtained after a stay in saffron bay situated in forty seven degrees fifty one minutes north latitude and one hundred thirty seven degrees twenty five minutes east longitude la perouse discovered upon the sixth of july an island which was no other than saghalian the shore here was as wooded as that of tartary lofty mountains arose in the interior the highest of which was called laminin peak as huts and smoke were seen m de langle and several officers landed the inhabitants had recently fled for the ashes of their fires were scarcely cold just as the french were re-embarking after leaving some presents for the natives a pirogue landed seven natives who showed no signs of fear amongst them says the narrative quote, were two old men with long white beards dressed in stuff made from the bark of trees very like the cotton drawers worn in madagascar two of the seven natives had coats of padded nankeen differing little in shape from those of the chinese others wore long gowns which were fastened by means of a waist belt and some little buttons so that they had no need of drawers their heads were bare but one or two of them wore bearskin bands they had their forelocks and faces shaven but the back hair kept about eight or ten inches long in a different fashion from the Chinese, however, who leave only a round tuft of hair, which they call pentasec. All had sealskin boots, with the feet artistically worked a la chinois. Their weapons were bows, spears, and arrows tipped with iron. The oldest of the natives, to whom the others showed the most respect, had his eyes in a dreadful state. He wore a shade around his head to protect them from the sun these natives were grave in manner and friendly m de langle appointed a meeting for the morrow la perouse and most of his officers attended the facts they learned about these tartars were important and decided la perouse to pursue his discoveries further north quote, we succeeded in making them understand he says that we wished them to draw their country and that of manchuria one of the old men then arose and with the point of his spear traced the coast of tartary westward running nearly north and south to the east via v in the same direction he represented his island and placing his hand upon his breast made us understand that he had indicated his own country he left an opening between his island and tartary and pointing to our vessels showed us by signs that they could pass through it at the south island he delineated another and left a second opening indicating that this too was a route for our ships his quickness in understanding us was great but not equal to that of another islander about thirty years of age who seeing that the figures traced on sand were rubbed out took one of our pencils and some paper he traced out his island which he called choka and made a line for the little river upon the shore of which we were placing it two-thirds of the length of the island from north to south. He then drew Manchuria, leaving, as the old man had done, a strait at the extreme end, and to our surprise he added the river Saghalian, the name of which the natives pronounce like ourselves. He placed the mouth of this river a little to the south of the northerly point of his island. We afterwards wished to ascertain whether this strait was very wide, we tried to make him understand our idea he caught it at once and placing his two hands upright at a distance of three inches one from the other he made us understand that he meant to indicate the width of the little river which formed our watering place and then holding them wider apart he indicated that the second width was to represent that of the river saghalian and separating them still more he gave the breadth of the strait which divides his country from Tartary. M. de Langle and I thought it of the greatest importance to ascertain whether the island we were coasting was that to which geographers had given the name of Saghalian, without guessing its extension southwards. I ordered all hands on board, and prepared to sail in the morning. The bay in which we had anchored received the name of Langle, from the captain who discovered it and was the first to put foot on land in another bay upon the same shore 
called Estangbe, our boats landed close to ten or twelve huts. They were larger than those we before had seen, and were divided into two rooms. That at the back contained the stove, cooking utensils, and the bench running all round. That in front was absolutely bare, and probably destined for the reception of strangers. The women fled when they saw the French land. Two of them, however, were caught, and, whilst they were being reassured, time was found to sketch them. Their faces were peculiar but pleasant. They had small eyes and thick lips, the upper one being painted or tattooed. End quote. M. de Langle found the natives gathered about four boats that were loaded with smoked fish, which they were helping to put in water. They were Manchurians from the shores of Saghalian River. In the corner of the island was a kind of circus planted with fifteen or twenty stakes, each surmounted by the head of a bear. It was supposed, not without some show of reason, that these trophies were intended to perpetuate the memory of a victory over this wild beast. Quantities of codfish were obtained upon this coast, and at the mouth of the river a prodigious quantity of salmon was caught. After reconnoitering the bay of La Jonquière, La Perouse cast anchor in Castor's Bay. His water supply was nearly exhausted, and he had no more wood. The further he penetrated into the strait which separates Saghalian from the continent, the more the depth diminished. La Perouse, recognizing that he could not double the island of Saghalian by the north, and afraid of not being able to leave the defile in which he now found himself, excepting by the strait of Sangar, which was much further south, determined to remain only five days in Castor's Bay, a period which he absolutely needed to take in provisions. The observatory was set up in a small island, while the carpenters cut down wood, and the sailors filled the water-barrels. The huts of these islanders, who call themselves Orochis, says the narrative, are surrounded by a drying ground for salmon, which were exposed to the sun upon perches, after having been smoked for three or four days at the stove which is in the centre of the hut. The women who have charge of this operation take them, as soon as they are smoked through, into the open air, where they become as hard as wood. The natives joined us in our fishing with nets or hooks, and we saw them voraciously devouring the head, gills, and sometimes the skin of raw salmon, tearing it up very cleverly. They sucked out the mucilage, much as we eat oysters. Their fish seldom reach the shore without having first paid toll, unless the catch is very large. And the women show the same eagerness to seize upon the whole fish, and in the same ravenous way devour the mucilaginous parts, which appear to be their tidbits. These people are revoltingly dirty. It would be impossible to find a race farther removed from our ideas of beauty. In height they are less than four foot ten, their bodies are emaciated, their voices are weak and shrill like children's. They have projecting cheekbones, bleared and sunken eyes, large mouths, flat noses, short and almost beardless chins, and olive skins shining with oil and smoke. They allow their hair to grow long, and dress it somewhat in the European style. The women wear it loose over their shoulders, and the description we have given applies to them as well as to the men, from whom they are scarcely to be distinguished, except for a slight difference in their apparel. The women are not subject to any labor, which, as in the case of the American Indians, might have accounted for the inelegance of their appearance. All their time is occupied in cutting out and making their clothes, in drying fish and nursing their children, whom they suckle to the age of three or four years. It rather astounded me to see a child of this age, who had been shooting with bow and arrows, beating a dog, etc., throw himself upon his mother's bosom, and take the place of an infant of five or six months who was lying asleep upon her knees." The Beaches and the Orochis confirmed much of the information which La Perouse had already obtained. From them he ascertained that the northern part of Saghalian was connected with the continent merely by a sandbank, on which grew seaweed, and where there was but little water. This concurrence of testimony left no room for doubt, especially as he never found more than six fathoms in the canal. 
there remained but one point of interest to determine and that was the survey of the southern point of saghalien which he had only explored as far as langle bay in forty seven degrees forty nine minutes upon the second of august the astrolabe and the boussole left castor's bay and returned southwards successively discovering and reconnoitring manorone island and langle peak doubling the southern point of saghalien called cape Crillon, which led to a strait between oku gesso and gesso this they named after la perouse hitherto the geography of this part of the world had been most fanciful and imaginary sanson was of opinion that korea was an island and that gesso oku gesso and kamchatka existed only in imagination whilst delisle insisted that gesso and oku gesso were merely an island ending at sangar strait and lastly buach in his considerations geographiques page one hundred five says quote, gesso after being placed first in the east then in the south and finally in the west was at last to be found in the north end quote. To this confusion the discoveries of the French expedition were destined to put an end. La Perouse had some intercourse with the natives of Crillon Cape, and stated that they were handsome men, far more industrious than the Orochis of Castor's Bay, but less liberal in their dealings. They have, he says, quote, one most important article of commerce, unknown in the channel of Tartary, from which they derive their riches, namely whale oil of this they collect considerable quantities they extract it in a way which is far from economical they cut the flesh into pieces and dry it upon a slope in the open air by exposing it to the sun the oil which flows from it is caught in vessels made of bark or into bottles of dried sealskin after sighting the cape arniva of the dutch the vessels coasted along the barren, treeless, uninhabited country in possession of the Dutch company, and shortly reached the Kuril Islands. They then passed between Maracone Island and the island of the Four Brothers, calling the strait, the finest amongst the Kuril Islands, through which they penetrated, La Baudouze. On the 3rd of September, the coast of Kamchatka was reached. This coast was uninviting enough, quote, there the eyes rest painfully and often fearfully upon enormous masses of rock which are already covered with snow in the beginning of september and which never appear to have had any vegetation three days later avacha bay or the bay of st peter and st paul was reached the astronomers at once proceeded to take observations the naturalists made the perilous and arduous ascent of a volcano some eight leagues inland whilst those of the crew who were not engaged upon the vessels gave themselves up to hunting and fishing thanks to the welcome accorded by the governor their pleasures were varied we were invited says la perouse quote, to a ball which the governor wished to give to all the women whether from kachatka or russia if the ball was not large it was at least mixed thirteen females clothed in silk ten of whom were natives of kamchatka with large faces small eyes and flat noses were seated upon benches round the room both they and the russians wore silk handkerchiefs wrapped round the head in a way similar to those worn by mulattoes the ball opened with russian dances the airs for which were very lively and like those of the cossack dances given a short time since in paris these were followed by the kamachka dances which were comparable only to the convulsionists of the famous tomb of St. Medard. The dancers of this part of Asia scarcely require legs, they make such vigorous use of the shoulders and arms. The impression made upon the spectators by the convulsive and contorted movements of the Kamchatka dancers is painful, and is rendered more so by a pitiful cry which escapes them at intervals, and which is the sole music by which they measure their time the exertions they made are so formidable that they are completely covered with sweat and at the conclusion they lie upon the ground unable to move a limb the exhalations from their bodies permeate the atmosphere with the smell of fish and oil so strong as to be disagreeable to the unaccustomed nostrils of europeans 
the arrival of a courier from Ototsk interrupted the ball. The news he brought was pleasant for every one, but particularly for La Perouse, who learned that he was promoted. During their stay in this port, the navigators found the tomb of Louis de Lisle de la Croyer, member of the Academy of Sciences, who died in Kamchatka in 1741, upon his return from an expedition undertaken by command of the Tsar for the survey of the American coast. His fellow countrymen honored his memory by placing an engraved copper slab over his grave. They paid the same homage to Captain Clerk, Captain Cook's second-in-command and successor. Avacha Bay, says La Perouse, quote, is certainly the best, most commodious, and safest to be found in any part of the world. The entrance is narrow, and forts might easily be constructed to command vessels entering it. The anchorage is excellent, the bottom muddy, and two large harbors, one on the eastern shore and one on the west, would hold all the vessels of the French and English navy. End, quote. End of section 30section thirty one of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter one part two french navigators two d the Boussole and the Astrolabe set sail on the 29th of September, 1787. Monsieur de Lesseps, vice-consul for Russia, who had accompanied La Perouse thus far upon his expedition, was charged to return to France by land, at that time a most perilous journey, and to convey dispatches from the expedition to the government. The question now arose of finding land discovered in 1620 by the Spaniards. The two frigates passed south of 37 degrees 30 minutes, some 300 leagues, without finding any trace of it. Crossing the line for the third time, they passed the site given by Byron as that of the dangerous islands, without finding them, and, upon the 6th of December, entered the Navigator Archipelago, the merit of discovering which belongs to Bougainville. The vessels were at once surrounded by pirogues, the natives who manned them did not give La Perouse a very favorable idea of the beauty of the inhabitants. Quote, I saw but two women, he says, and they had no delicacy of feature. The younger, who may have been eighteen years of age, had a frightful ulcer upon her leg. Many of these islanders were covered with sores, which may have been the commencement of leprosy for I noticed two men, whose ulcerated and swollen legs left no doubt as to their malady. They approached us fearlessly and unarmed, and appeared as peaceable as the natives of the Society or Friendly Islands." Upon the ninth of December, anchor was cast off Mauna Island. Next day the weather was so promising that La Perouse resolved to land to take in water, and then set sail at once, as the anchorage was too bad to admit of a second night's stay. Every precaution having been taken, La Perouse landed, and proceeded to the spot where his sailors were obtaining water. Captain Langle penetrated to a small creek about a league from the watering place, quote, and this excursion, from which he returned delighted with the beauty of the village he had seen, was, as will be seen, the cause of our misfortunes, end quote upon the shore meantime a brisk trade was going on men and women sold hens parrots fruits and pigs at the same time a native getting into one of the sloops possessed himself of a hammer and commenced dealing vigorous blows upon a sailor's back he was speedily seized by four strong fellows and thrown into the sea la perouse penetrated into the interior accompanied by women old men and children he enjoyed a delightful excursion through a charming country which rejoiced in the double advantage of a soil which required no culture and a climate in which clothing was superfluous quote, bread fruits cocoa nuts bananas guavas and oranges afforded a wholesome and sufficient nourishment to the inhabitants 
while chickens pigs and dogs which lived upon the surplus fruits afforded a necessary change of diet the first visit passed over without serious danger there were a few quarrels it is true but thanks to the prudence and reserve of the french who kept on their guard they did not amount to anything serious la perouse had given orders to re-embark when monsieur de langle insisted upon sending for a few more casks of water he had adopted captain cook's views he thought fresh water preferable to all other things which he had on board and as some of his crew showed signs of scurvy he was right in thinking that every help should be given them la perouse from the first had a presentiment against consenting but he yielded when m de langle persisted that a captain is responsible for the health of his crew that the spot which he named was perfectly safe that he himself would command the expedition and that three hours would suffice for the work Quote, m de langle says the narrative was a man of so much judgment that his representation influenced my decision more than anything else next day two boats under command of m boutin and m moton conveying all the sufferers from scurvy under charge of six armed guards and a captain in all twenty-eight men left the astrolabe to be under m de langle's orders m de langle was accompanied in his boat by m de lorinan and m colonnet who were invalids and m de varignas who was convalescent m de gobien commanded the sloop m de la motinere m levant and the elder Risseveur, were amongst the thirty-three persons sent by the boussole the entire force amounted to sixty-one and those the picked men of the expedition m de langle ordered every one to be armed with guns and six swivel guns were placed in the sloop m de langle and all his companions were greatly surprised when instead of a large and commodious bay they found a creek filled with coral which it was only possible to reach through a tortuous channel where the surf broke violently m de langle had only seen this bay at high tide and as soon as this new sight met his view his first idea was to regain the former watering-place but the friendly appearance of the natives the number of women and children he observed among them the quantities of pigs and fruit they offered for sale put his prudent resolutions to flight the water casks of the four boats were landed quietly the soldiers keeping order upon the shore and forming a barrier which left a free space for the workers but this peaceful condition of affairs did not last long many of the pirogues having disposed of their wares to our vessels returned to the shore and landing in the bay of our watering-place it was soon entirely filled by them in place of the two hundred natives counting women and children whom de langle had found an hour and a half previously there were now at the end of three hours a thousand or twelve hundred m de langle's situation became more perilous every moment he succeeded however seconded by m de varignas m botin m collier and gobien in embarking the water casks but the bay was almost dry and he could not hope to get his boats off before four o'clock in the afternoon however followed by his detachment he attempted it and leading the way with his gun and the soldiers he forbade firing until he should give the order he felt that he would soon be forced to fire already stones were flying and the indians who were in shallow water surrounded the sloops for a distance of at least two hundred yards the soldiers who were already in the boats tried in vain to drive them back m de langle was anxious to avoid beginning hostilities and fearful of being accused of barbarity otherwise he would no doubt have ordered a general discharge which would effectually have scattered the multitude but he believed he could subdue the natives without bloodshed and he was the victim of his humanity very soon a storm of stones thrown at short distances with the force of a sling struck almost all who were in the sloop m de langle had only time to discharge his gun he was thrown over and unfortunately fell outside the sloop he was at once massacred by more than two hundred indians who assailed him with clubs and stones as soon as he expired they fastened him by one arm to the sloop 
no doubt with a view to despoiling the body. The sloop of La Boussole, under M. Botin, was run aground within four yards of that of the astrolabe, and parallel between them was a narrow channel not yet occupied by the Indians. By this outlet all the wounded who were fortunate enough to avoid falling into the open sea escaped by swimming. They reached our boats, which fortunately had remained afloat, and we succeeded in saving forty-nine out of the sixty-one men who had composed the expedition. M. Botin had imitated M. de Langle. He would not fire, and only gave orders for a discharge after his commander's shot. Naturally, at the short distance of four or five paces, every shot killed an Indian. But there was no time to reload. M. Botin was knocked down by a stone, and fortunately fell between the two stranded boats. Those who had escaped by swimming towards the two boats had received many wounds, mostly on the head, whilst those who, less fortunate, had fallen overboard upon the side near the Indians, were killed instantaneously. The safety of forty-nine of the crew is due to the good order which M. de Varignas was wise enough to maintain, and to the punctuality with which M. Moton, who commanded the boats of the Boussole, carried out his orders. The boat belonging to the astrolabe was so overloaded that it grounded. The natives at once decided to harass the wounded in their retreat. They hastened in great numbers towards the reefs, within six feet of which the boats must necessarily pass. The little ammunition which remained was exhausted upon these savages, and the boats at last emerged from the creek." La Perouse's first idea was naturally to avenge the death of his unfortunate companions. But M. de Botin, who, although severely wounded, retained all his faculties, begged him to desist, representing to him that if by any mishap one of the boats ran aground, the creek was so situated, being bordered with trees which afforded secure shelter to the natives, that not a Frenchman would come back alive. La Perouse remained for two days upon the scene of this terrible disaster, without being able to gratify the vindictive desires of his crew. No doubt, says La Perouse, quote, it will appear incredible that during this time five or six pirogues left the shore, bringing pigs, pigeons, and coconuts, and offering them in exchange. I was forced to control myself, or I should have disposed of these natives summarily enough. End quote. It may readily be supposed that an event which deprived La Perouse of a large number of officers, and of thirty-two of his best sailors, was calculated to upset the plans of the expedition. At the slightest approach of danger, it would now be necessary to destroy one frigate, in order to arm the other. But one course remained for La Perouse, to set sail for Botany Bay, reconnoitering the various islands he passed, and taking their astronomical positions. Upon the 14th of December, Oyolava, another island belonging to the same group, and which Bougainville had seen from a distance, was sighted. It was larger than Tahiti, and exceeded that island in beauty, fertility, and in the number of its inhabitants. The natives resembled those of Mauna in every particular, and quickly surrounded the two frigates, offering the multifarious productions of their island. It appeared that the French must have been the first to trade with them, for they were quite unacquainted with the use or value of iron, and preferred a single colored bead to a hatchet, or a nail six inches long. Some of the women had pleasant features and elegant figures. Their eyes were gentle, and their movements quiet, whilst the men were wild and fierce in appearance. Pola Island, also belonging to the Navigator Archipelago, was passed upon the 17th of December. Probably the news of the massacre of the French had already reached this people, for no pirogue approached the vessels. Coconut Island and Schouten's Trader Island were recognized upon the 20th of December. The latter is divided by a strait, which the navigators would not have perceived had they not coasted close in shore. About a score of natives appeared, bringing the finest coconuts La Perouse had ever seen, with a few bananas and one small pig. These islands, which Wallace calls Boscoen and Capel Islands, and which he places one degree thirteen minutes too far west, 
may also be considered part of the navigator archipelago la perouse considers the natives of this group as belonging to the finest polynesian race tall vigorous and well formed they are of a finer type than those of the sandwich islands whose language is very similar to theirs under other circumstances the captain would have proceeded to explore oyolava and pola islands but the memory of the disaster at mauna was too recent and he dreaded another encounter which might end in massacre Quote, painful associations he says met us with every succeeding island in the recreation islands east of the navigator archipelago ragavine's crew had been attacked and stoned to death at trader island which was now in sight Schouten's crew were the victims and in the south was mauna island where we ourselves had met with so shocking a calamity these recollections affected our way of dealing with the indians we now punished every little theft and injustice severely we demonstrated by force of arms that flight would not save them from our vengeance we refused to allow them to come on board and threatened to punish all who did so without permission with death End quote. these remarks prove that la perouse was right in preventing all intercourse between his crews and the natives we cannot sufficiently praise the prudence and humanity of the commander who in the excited condition of his men's minds knew how to curb the desire for vengeance from the navigator islands the route was directed to the friendly archipelago which cook had been unable to explore entirely upon the twenty seventh of december vavau island was discovered one of the largest in the group which had not been visited by the english navigator as large as tonga tabu it is higher and not wanting in fresh water la perouse reconnoitred many of these islands and entered into relations with the natives who however did not offer sufficient provisions to make it worth his while to trade he therefore resolved upon the first of january seventeen eighty eight to go to botany bay following a route not yet attempted by any navigator pilstart island discovered by tasman or rather the rock of pilstart for its entire length is but a quarter of a league presents but a steep and broken appearance and serves only as a resting place for seabirds on this account la perouse having no reason for remaining wished to hasten on to new holland but there was another power to be consulted the wind and by it la perouse was detained for three days before pilstart norfolk island and its two islets were sighted upon the thirteenth of january la perouse cast anchor within easy distance of shore intending to allow the naturalists to land and inspect the productions of the island but the waves broke with such violence upon the beach that landing was impossible yet cook had landed there with the greatest facility an entire day was passed in vain attempts and was quite unproductive of scientific results next day la perouse started afresh and upon entering the roadstead of botany bay encountered an english vessel under command of commodore philip who was engaged in constructing port jackson the embryo of that powerful colony which in our day after only a quarter of a century's growth has attained to such a height of civilization and prosperity here the journal kept by la perouse terminates a letter written by him from botany bay upon the fifth of february to the naval minister informs us that he intended building two sloops to replace those which had been destroyed at mauna all his wounded amongst them m lavaux the surgeon of the astrolabe who had been trepanned were perfectly recovered m de clenard had assumed command of the astrolabe and had been succeeded upon the boussole by m de monti in a letter of two days later date giving particulars of his intended route la perouse says quote, i shall regain the friendly islands and carry out the instructions i have received with regard to the northern portion of new caledonia to santa cruz de mendana to the land south of the arsacides of serville and to the louisiade of bougainville and also ascertain if possible whether the latter constitutes a portion of new guinea or is a separate continent at the end of july seventeen eighty eight 
i shall pass between new guinea and new holland by some other channel than the endeavour that is to say if there be another during september and the early part of october i propose to visit the gulf of carpentaria and the eastern coast of new holland as far as van diemen's land so as to allow of my return to the north in time to arrive at mauritius in the beginning of december seventeen eighty eight End quote. not only did la perouse fail to keep the rendezvous he himself appointed but two entire years passed away and no news whatever of his expedition were received although at that epoch france was passing through a terrible crisis the interest of the public in the fate of la perouse was so intense that it found vent in an appeal to the national assembly from the members of the society of natural history in paris upon the ninth of february seventeen ninety one a decree was passed enjoining the fitting out of two or more armed vessels to be sent in search of la perouse it was argued that had shipwreck overtaken the expedition a number of the crews might still survive and that it was only just to carry help to them as soon as possible men of science naturalists and draughtsmen were to take part in the expedition with the view to obtaining valuable information for navigation geography and commerce as well as for the arts and sciences such were the terms of the decree to which we have alluded the command of the expedition was entrusted to vice admiral bruni d'entrecasteaux who had attracted the attention of government by his conduct in india two vessels the recherche and the esperance the latter under the orders of m juan de kermadec ship's captain were placed at his command the staff of these vessels comprised many officers who later attained to high military positions amongst them were rosset willemez trobrian la grandiere lignel and jurien amongst the men of science on board were la Biardier, naturalist bertrand and pearson astronomers ventant and richet naturalists boutem beaupre hydrographer and juvenet engineer the vessels were stocked with provisions for eighteen months and a quantity of merchandise for trading purposes leaving brest upon the twenty eighth of september they reached teneriffe upon the thirteenth of october an ascent of the famous peak followed as a matter of course la billardier noticed a phenomenon which had already been observed by him in asia minor his figure was reflected upon the clouds below him opposite to the sun in every colour of the rainbow upon the twenty third of october the necessary provisions having been shipped anchor was weighed and the start made for the cape during the cruise la billardier discovered that the phosphorescent appearance of the sea is caused by minute globular animalculi floating on the waves the voyage to the cape where the vessels arrived upon the eighteenth of january seventeen ninety two was barren of incident if we accept the unusual quantity of bonitos or tunny and other fish that were met with and a small leakage which occurred but was quickly remedied at the cape d'entrecasteaux found a letter from m de saint felix commanding the french forces in india which seemed likely to upset all his plans and exercise an unfavourable influence upon the expedition from this communication it appeared that two french captains from batavia had stated that commodore hunter in command of the english frigate sirius had seen quote, near the admiralty islands in the pacific ocean men dressed in the european style in what he took to be french uniforms end quote. it is clear wrote m de saint felix quote, that the commodore was convinced they were the remnants of la perouse's company end quote. when d'entrecastro arrived at the cape hunter was still in the roadstead but within two hours of the arrival of the french vessels he weighed anchor this conduct appeared very strange the commodore had had time to hear that the vessels just arrived were those sent in search of la perouse and yet he had made no communication to the commander upon the subject but it was soon ascertained that hunter had declared himself quite ignorant of the facts stated by m de saint felix were they then to be regarded as unfounded incredible as m de saint felix's communication appeared 
D'Entrecasteaux could not suppose so. The naturalists had availed themselves of their stay at the Cape to make many excursions in the neighborhood. La Biardier had penetrated as far into the interior as the short stay of the frigates in the roadstead permitted. Anchor was weighed upon the 16th of February, and D'Entrecasteaux decided upon reaching the southern seas by doubling Cape Horn, and steered for the passage between St. Paul and Amsterdam Islands. Captain Valming had discovered these islands in 1696, and they had been recognized by Cook in his last voyage. When the Recherche and the Esperance passed St. Paul Island, it was enveloped in a thick smoke, through which the summits of the mountains were visible. The forests were on fire. Upon the 21st of April, the two vessels entered a bay upon the coast of Van Diemen's Land, which was supposed to be Adventure Bay, but which in reality was Storm Bay. The extreme point of this bay was named after D'Entrecasteaux. Wood was easily obtained there, and fish was very abundant. Amongst the magnificent trees of the country, La Biardier mentions various species of the eucalyptus, the many uses of which were then unknown. The hunting parties caught black swans and kangaroos, creatures also but little known. End of section 31section thirty two of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter one part two french navigators two e Upon the 16th of May, the vessels left the port, and made for a strait, afterwards named after D'Entrecasteaux. M. Creton and M. Aribot, says the narrative, quote, were encouraged to land by the sight of fires close to the shore. They had gone but a short distance when they came upon four natives, attending to three small fires, by which they were seated. They took to flight on seeing the strangers, in spite of every friendly demonstration, leaving the lobsters and shellfish which they had been broiling. As many huts as there were fires were close by. One of the natives, in his hurry, left a small basket full of pieces of silica behind him. He was not afraid to return in search of it, but approached Creton with a bold air, possibly owing to his confidence in his own strength. Some of these savages were naked, and others wore only a kangaroo skin upon the shoulders. In color they were nearly black, they had woolly hair and allowed the beard to grow. End quote. Upon leaving D'Entrecasto Strait, the vessels proceeded to survey the southwestern coast of New Caledonia, which La Perouse should have visited. A portion of Pine Island, which stretches to the north of that country, was the first to be recognized. The Recherche narrowly escaped destruction upon the coral reefs which surround the coast leaving only a narrow passage between them and the main land. At the northern extremity several mountainous islands and detached rocks were perceived, which rendered the navigation extremely dangerous. The navigators, grateful for their escape, named them the Entrecasto Reefs and Juan Islands. The survey of this perilous coast lasted from the 16th of June to the 3rd of July, a true service was thus rendered to geographers and navigators, though it was perhaps the least profitable part of the voyage of discovery. As the favorable season was now approaching, D'Entrecasteaux determined to avail himself of it to reach the land of the Aracides, which had been seen by Surville and visited some years later by Shortland, who, imagining he was making a new discovery, named it New Georgia. Upon the ninth of July, says Biardier, quote, towards half past four o'clock, we perceived, about ten miles to the northwest, a rock called Eddystone. We took it at first, as Shortland had done, for a sailing vessel. The illusion was the greater, as in color it much resembles the sails of a ship. A few shrubs crowned the summit. The land of the Aracides, opposite this rock, is steep and covered with large trees. End quote. 
after rectifying the position of eddystone rocks and that of the treasury islands which are five in number though so close together that bougainville took them for one island d'entrecasteaux coasted bougainville island it is separated from bouca island by a narrow strait and is covered with plantations it appeared to be well populated some trade was done with the natives but nothing would induce them to venture on board the vessels the color of their skins says la billardier quote, is nearly black they are of medium height and wear no clothes they are muscular and strong although their features are not pleasant they are very expressive they have large heads and broad foreheads their faces especially in the lower part are flat they have thick chins rather prominent cheekbones flat noses large mouths and thin lips their ugliness is increased by the color with which the betel nut stains their mouths they appear very skilful in the use of bows and arrows one of them brought a gannet which he had just killed on board and the hole made by the arrow could easily be seen these natives have bestowed particular attention upon their weapons which are all very well finished we could not but admire the skill with which they coated the strings of their bows with resin in such a way that at first sight they looked like cat gut the centre was protected with a piece of bark to lessen the wear in projecting the arrows the survey of the western coast of these two islands was completed upon the fifteenth of july bougainville had already surveyed the eastern shore next day the french navigators sighted first the island to which cataret had given the name of sir charles hardy and then the southeastern extremity of new ireland the two vessels cast anchor in carteret bay and the crews were established upon coco island this island is covered with evergreen trees which in spite of the volcanic nature of the soil grow vigorously the coconuts from which it received its name were procured with difficulty on the other hand it afforded the naturalists so many varieties of plants and insects as to charm Bardia. rain fell abundantly during the stay it was like a ceaseless torrent of tepid water after obtaining the necessary food and water the recherche and esperance set sail from port carteret upon the twenty fourth of july seventeen ninety two in so doing the esperance unfortunately lost an anchor the cable having been cut by the coral reefs the two vessels then entered st george's strait which at the southern extremity is only about forty-two miles in width about half the extent assigned to it by carteret the currents were so rapid that the ships were carried past man and sandwich islands without being able to stop after sighting portland islands low lands seven in number which stretch from two degrees thirty nine minutes forty four seconds south latitude to one hundred forty seven degrees fifteen minutes east longitude d'entrecasteaux continued his route towards the admiralty islands which he intended to visit it was upon the most easterly of these islands that according to the report received by commodore hunter the natives wearing french naval uniforms had been seen the natives appeared in crowds says the narrative quote, some ran along the shore others fixing their eyes upon our vessels invited us by signs to land the cries they uttered were intended to express their joy at half past one the vessels anchored and a boat was dispatched from each containing articles for distribution among the natives of this small island the frigates were so placed as to protect the boats as they neared the land in the event of any attack by the savages for our recollection of the treachery of the natives of the islands south of the admiralty made us distrustful the coast abounded in reefs the boats could only approach within a hundred yards of the shore numbers of the natives crowded to the beach and invited the french by signs to land quote, one of the savages distinguished by a double row of small shells upon his forehead appeared to exercise a good deal of authority he ordered one of the natives to jump into the water and bring us some coconuts fearing to approach strangers swimming in defenseless he hesitated for a moment the chief evidently quite unaccustomed to resistance to his wishes followed up his command by blows from his club and compelled obedience 
as soon as the islander returned to land curiosity brought the natives around him in crowds each wished to participate in our presence pirogues were immediately launched and many natives swam to the boats which were shortly surrounded by quite a crowd we were surprised that the violence of the surf upon the breakers did not intimidate them End quote. perhaps the french may have attempted that which the indians accomplished it seems probable that they would never have observed these people if the vessels or at least a small boat had not been wrecked in the archipelago the only remark made by them is to the effect that the natives understood and appreciated the use of iron d'entrecasteaux then proceeded to reconnoitre the northern portion of the archipelago and to trade with the natives he did not land anywhere and does not appear to have executed this part of his task with the minute care and attention which might have been expected of him the recherche and the esperance afterwards visited the hermit islands discovered in seventeen eighty one by a spanish frigate la princesa the natives like all those they had encountered showed a great desire to induce the strangers to land but did not succeed in persuading them to do so the exchequer islands discovered by bougainville several unknown low islands covered with luxuriant vegetation Shuten island and the coast of new guinea were successively sighted in the interior of the last named a large chain of mountains was distinguished the loftiest of which appeared at least three thousand five hundred feet high after coasting this large island the recherche and the esperance entered pitt strait to reach the moluccas upon the fifth of september seventeen ninety two the french joyfully anchored in the roadstead of amboyna there were many sufferers from scurvy on board and officers and crew alike needed a lengthened rest the naturalists astronomers and other scientific men immediately landed and took the necessary steps for the prosecution of their various observations the naturalists were particularly successful in acquiring new facts la billardier congratulates himself upon the multiplicity of new plants and animals that he was able to obtain once when upon the shore he says quote, i heard what appeared to be wind instruments the tones now harmonious now discordant yet never unpleasing these harmonious and distinct sounds appeared to come from a distance and i imagined the natives were making music some six or seven miles beyond the roadstead but my ear deceived me for i found that i was not a hundred yards from the instrument a bamboo cane at least sixty feet high was fixed vertically upon the shore at each notch a slit had been made about two and a half inches long and one and a quarter broad these slits made so many openings for the wind which passing through them produced varied and pleasant sounds as the notches in this cane were very numerous the slits had been made all round so that whichever way the wind blew it went through some of them i can only compare the sound of this instrument to that of an harmonium end quote during this long stay of a month in one place the vessels were well caulked the sails and rigging attended to and every precaution taken for a voyage in tropical and damp climates a few details on the roadstead of amboyna and the manners and customs of the native population will not be out of place amboyna roadstead says la billardier quote, forms a channel some thirteen or fourteen miles in length and about two and a half miles in breadth it affords good anchorage although the bottom is partly of coral the fort called victory fort is built of bricks the governor and some of the members of government reside there it was at this time falling into ruins and every discharge of cannon did evident damage the garrison consisted of about two hundred men of which the natives of the island composed a considerable part the remainder consisted of a few retired european soldiers and a small detachment of a Württemberg regiment the mortality amongst officers living in the indies makes the lives of those who have been some time in the climate precious the dutch company is therefore seldom true to its promise to allow them to return to europe at the expiration of their time of service i met with several of these unfortunate men who had been detained for more than twenty years 
when, according to agreement, they ought to have been freed long before. The language of the natives of Amboya is Malay. It is very soft and musical. The country produces spices, coffee, which is inferior to that of Reunion Island, and sago. The latter is largely cultivated in the marshy districts. The rice consumed at Amboyna is not indigenous to the soil, but still it might be successfully cultivated in the lowlands. The Dutch company, however, prohibit the growth of this article of commerce, because its sale enables them to keep back a part of the sum which they are obliged to pay for cloves furnished by the blacks. They thus prevent the increase of pay, and obtain the fruits of native labor at a moderate price. Thus the company, consulting their own interest only, discourage all industry in the population, by forcing them, as it were, to relinquish everything but the cultivation of spices. The Dutch are careful to limit the cultivation of spices within the compass of ordinary consumption. Their efforts, which are destructive of all enterprise, chime in with the nonchalant character of the natives. End quote. On the 23rd of Vendemiare of the year 1, if we conform to the new style, as Bougainville does, the two vessels left Amboyna, amply provisioned with fowls, ducks, geese, pigs, goats, potatoes, yams, bananas, and pumpkins. Meat, however, they obtained in but small quantities, the flour was of a bad quality, and the sailors could never accustom themselves to the sago which was shipped in its stead. Bamboos, cloves, and arrack may be added to the list of shipments. Quote, Young bamboo shoots, cut in slices, and preserved in vinegar, says La Biardier, made an excellent store for a long voyage. These young shoots are generally very tender. They are gathered early and sold in the market as vegetables, for which they are a good substitute. They are often a yard long and half an inch thick. These young bamboo shoots are much appreciated by the Chinese, who think them similar to asparagus in flavor. We were also provided with cloves and nutmegs preserved in sugar. The shell of the nutmeg is the only edible portion. Unfortunately, ignorant preservers have chosen full-grown nutmegs. Cloves, when once as large as ordinary olives, retain too much flavor to be a pleasant sweetmeat. One must be endowed with an Indian palate to enjoy them. I might say the same of our ginger preserves. The only spirituous liquor obtainable was arrack, several casks of which were bought. Many travelers have spoken in praise of this liquor, which is, in reality, not equal to the poorest brandy. End quote. Upon leaving Amboyna, the expedition sailed for the southwest coast of Australia. Shortly afterwards, Kisser Island, the north shore of Timor, Batten Island, and the delightful Salva Island were successively passed, and finally, upon the 16th Frimaire, the western extremity of the southwestern coast of New Holland which was discovered by Leuven in 1622, was sighted. The coast presented a succession of sandy dunes, in the midst of which arose pointed rocks, apparently utterly sterile. Navigation upon this unsheltered coast was extremely dangerous. The sea ran high, the wind was boisterous, and it was necessary to steer amongst the breakers. During a strong gale, the Esperance was nearly driven upon the coast, when one of the officers fortunately distinguished from the mainmast an anchorage, where, he declared, the ships would be in safety. Quote, the safety of the two ships, says the narrative, was due to this discovery, for the recherche, after battling as long as she could against the storm, had been forced to tack about all night amidst these perilous breakers, hoping for a change of wind which would make it possible for her to reach the open sea, and must infallibly have perished. This bay, named Le Grand, after the able seaman who first discovered it, will always recall his invaluable service to the expedition. End quote. The islets surrounding this coast were reconnoitred by the navigators. A geographical engineer, named Richet, belonging to the Recherche, landing upon the mainland to make observations, lost his way, and only reached the vessels after two days' absence, nearly dead of fatigue and hunger. 
this small archipelago concluded the discoveries of Nuitz. We were surprised, says La Billardier, quote, at the exactitude with which the latitude had been determined by this navigator, at a time when instruments were very imperfect. The same remark applies to nearly all Leuven's discoveries in this region. End quote. Upon the 15th Nivos, 31 degrees 52 minutes latitude and 129 degrees 16 minutes east longitude, Captain Juan de Kermadec informed D'Entrecasteaux that his rudder was injured, that he was obliged to limit his crew to three quarters of a bottle of water per day, that he had been forced to discontinue the distribution of antiscorbutic drinks, and that he had only thirty casks of water remaining. The recherche was hardly in better case. D'Entrecasteaux accordingly made for Cape Demon, after navigating for about six hundred and seventy miles along a barren coast, which offered no object of interest or value. Upon the third pluvios, the vessels anchored in the Bay of Rocks, in Tempest Bay, which they had visited the preceding year. This spot was very rich in points of interest. La Billardier was amazed at the varied products of this portion of Van Diemen's land, and was never tired of admiring the vast forests of gigantic trees, and the many unknown shrubs and plants, through which he had to force his way. During one of his numerous excursions he picked up some fine pieces of beautiful bronze-red hematite, and further on some earth-containing ochre, of so bright a red as to denote the presence of iron. He soon encountered some natives, and his remarks upon this race, which is now quite extinct, are interesting enough for repetition. Moreover, they complete the particulars already given by Captain Cook. He says, quote, There were about forty-two natives, seven grown men, and eight women, the others appeared to be their children. Many of them were girls already arrived at maturity, who were even more lightly clad than their mothers. They have woolly hair, and the men let their beards grow long. In the children the upper jaw projects, but in adults it is about even with the lower. No doubt these people consider it a beauty to be black, for, not being very dark to begin with, they powder the upper part of the body with coal dust. We noticed rows of spots on the skin, especially on the shoulders and breast, now in lines above three inches long, now in equidistant dots. These people do not appear to observe the custom which many travellers have thought to be universal amongst their tribes, of exacting the incisor teeth, for we saw no native with any missing from the upper jaw, and they all had very fine, strong teeth. These people swarm with vermin. We could not but admire the patience of a woman, whom we watched freeing her child of them. Nor could we avoid feeling shocked when she crushed the disgusting insects with her teeth, and then swallowed them. Monkeys have the same habit." The young children greatly admired everything shining, and they did not hesitate to take the metal buttons off our coats. I must not omit to mention a trick played upon a sailor by a young savage. The man had collected a number of shells, and left them in a bag at the foot of a rock. The native furtively removed them, and allowed the sailor to search for them vainly for some time. Then quietly replacing them, he seemed much amused at the trick he had played. End, quote. End of section 32。section 33 of celebrated travels and travellers volume 2 。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2, Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century, by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 1, Part 2, French Navigators, 2F. Early in the morning of the 26th Pluvios, the two vessels weighed anchor, entered D'Entrecasto Strait, and, on the 5th of Ventose, anchored in Adventure Bay. After a stay of five days, spent in taking observations, D'Entrecasto set sail for New Zealand, and reached its southern extremity. After an interview with the natives, too short to admit of additions being made to the many and precise observations of Captain Cook, D'Entrecasto started for the Friendly Islands, 
which la perouse had intended visiting he anchored in tonga tabu bay the vessels were at once surrounded by a crowd of pirogues and literally boarded by the natives who came to sell pigs and every variety of fruit one of the sons of pulao the king cook had known received the navigators cordially and scrupulously superintended the trade with the islanders this was no easy task for they developed surprising talents for stealing everything which came in their way la billardier describes rather a good joke of which he was the victim he was followed to the provision tent by two natives whom he took to be chiefs one of them he says quote, was very anxious to choose the best fruits for me i had placed my hat on the ground thinking it safe there but these two rogues understood their business the one behind me was clever enough to hide my hat under his clothes and was off before i perceived the theft the other speedily followed i was the more surprised at this attempt because i should have supposed they would not have had the courage to steal so large an object running the risk of being caught in the enclosure to which we had admitted them moreover a hat could not be a very useful article to these people who generally go bareheaded their dexterity in robbing me convinced me that it was by no means their first attempt End quote. The French entered into relations with a chief named Finau, probably the same who is mentioned as Finauo in Captain Cook's voyage, and who called him Tute. But he was only a secondary chief. The real king, supreme chief of Tongatabu, Vavau, and of Anamuka, was named Tubao. He visited the ships and brought back a gun which had been stolen a day or two previously from a sentinel he presented d'entrecasteaux with two pieces of stuff made from the bark of the mulberry tree so large that if opened out either would have covered the vessel in exchange for mats and pigs he received a fine hatchet and a general's red coat which he immediately put on two days later an extraordinarily stout female at least fifty years of age and to whom the natives paid great respect came on board this was queen tina she tasted everything that was offered to her, but preferred preserved bananas. The steward stood behind her chair and waited to clear away, but she saved him the trouble by appropriating the plate and napkin. King Tabao was anxious to give an entertainment to D'Entrecasteaux. The admiral was received upon landing by two chiefs, Finau and Omalai, and conducted by them to an extensive esplanade. Tubao arrived with his two daughters. They had sprinkled a quantity of coconut oil upon their heads, and each wore a necklace made of the pretty seeds of the Arbus peccatorius. The natives, says the narrative, quote, arrived from all parts in great crowds. We estimated that the number amounted to at least four thousand. The seat of honor was evidently to the left of the king, for he invited D'Entrecasteaux to take his place there the captain then offered the presents he had brought for the king which were gratefully accepted a piece of crimson damask excited the most vivid admiration from all the assembled natives eho eho they exclaimed repeatedly in accents of the greatest surprise they uttered the same admiring cry when we unfolded some pieces of coloured ribbon in which red predominated the captain then presented a couple of goats and a pair of rabbits of which the king promised to take every care. D'Entrecasteaux also bestowed various presents upon Tubao's son Omalai and several other chiefs. To our right, on the northeast, under a shady breadfruit tree laden with fruit, thirteen musicians were seated, who sang together in different parts. Four of the musicians played the accompaniment by striking bamboo canes, yard and a yard and a half long, upon the ground, the holder of the longest bamboo occasionally acting as conductor. These bamboo canes emitted a sound not unlike that of a tambourine, and they were arranged in the following order. The two medium-sized canes were in unison, the longest a tone and a half lower, and the shortest two tones and a half higher. The voice of the alto was heard far above all the others, although he was a little hoarse he accompanied himself by striking with two little sticks upon a bamboo cane some six yards long and split throughout its entire length 
three musicians stationed in front of the others appeared to explain the song by gestures which had apparently been well studied as they all acted in unison occasionally gracefully moving their arms they turned towards the king whilst sometimes they suddenly sunk their heads upon their breasts and as suddenly tossed them back after these entertainments tubau offered the captain several pieces of stuff made from the bark of the mulberry tree he had them unrolled with great ostentation that we might fully appreciate the value of his gift the minister seated upon his left ordered the preparation of kava which was soon brought in an oval-shaped wooden vase about three feet long the musicians had reserved their best pieces for this moment for at each succeeding effort we heard applauding cries of molly molly and it was evident that the music had an agreeable and inspiriting effect upon the natives the kava was then offered to the various chiefs by those who had prepared it end quote. this concert it will be seen was by no means equal to the splendid entertainment which had been given to captain cook queen tina followed it up by giving a grand ball which was preceded by a concert fully attended by the natives amongst whom we may incidentally mention were numbers of thieves who became so bold that they ended by forcibly taking possession of a cutlass as the blacksmith of the recherche pursued the thieves they turned and seeing him alone struck him on the head with a club fortunately his danger was perceived by those on board the esperance and a well-directed shot dispersed his assailants several natives were killed upon this occasion by the officers and sailors who not seeing exactly what had happened treated all the islanders they met as dangerous fortunately concord was soon restored and the relations were so friendly when the time came for the french to leave that many of the natives begged to accompany them to france Quote, the intelligent account which these islanders gave of the vessels which had anchored in this archipelago says the narrative convinced us that la perouse had not visited any of these islands they remembered perfectly every occasion upon which they had seen captain cook and they indicated the intervals between his visits by the crops of yams reckoning two in each year end quote it is true that their information as far as it related to la perouse was in direct contradiction to the facts which dumont d'urville collected thirty-six years later when tamaha was queen quote, i was anxious to know he says if any europeans had visited tonga between cook and d'entrecasteaux after a few moments reflection she explained to me very clearly that a few years before d'entrecasteaux's visit two large vessels like his in every respect carrying guns and many europeans had anchored off anamooka and remained there six days they showed a white flag quite unlike the english one the strangers had been very friendly with the natives and had had a house on the island and entered into trade she related that a native who had agreed to exchange a wooden bolster for a knife was shot by an officer because he wanted to take back his merchandise when he had been paid for it however the incident had not broken the peace because in that instance the native was in the wrong End quote. although it is impossible to suspect dumont d'urville of any attempted at imposition many portions of this circumstantial account bear the impress of truth more especially that relating to the flag as being different to that of the english must we then charge d'entrecasteaux with want of thoroughness in his work this would be a very serious charge yet two circumstances which we shall presently relate appear to point to that conclusion the natives witnessed the departure of the french with keen regret the expedition left upon the twenty first germinal and two days later the esperance signalled Aranin, the most easterly of the islands of santo espiritu discovered by quiros in sixteen sixty beyond this Anatom, tana with its volcano in constant eruption and the butembu pre islands were passed carried onwards by the currents the vessels were soon in sight of the mountains of new caledonia and anchored in balad harbour where captain cook had cast anchor in seventeen seventy four the natives were acquainted with the use of iron 
but they did not appear to value it as highly as others had done, probably because the stones they used instead were very hard and answered admirably for their purposes. Their first demand upon going on board was for something to eat, and their need was unmistakable, for they pointed to their manifestly empty stomachs. Captain Cook had already remarked that they managed their pirogues, which were far less ingeniously constructed than those of the friendly islands, unskillfully. The greater number of these natives had woolly hair, and skins almost as black as those of the inhabitants of Van Diemen's Land. Their weapons were assegais and clubs, and in addition to these they carried at the waist a little bag full of the oval stones which they throw from their slings. After a short excursion inland, during which they visited the huts of the natives, which were shaped like beehives, the officers and naturalists prepared to re-embark. Upon returning to our boat, says the narrative, quote, we found more than seven hundred natives who had assembled from all directions. They began by demanding stuffs and iron in exchange for their wares, and soon some of them proved themselves errant thieves. I will mention one of their many manoeuvres. A man offered to sell me the little bag of stones which he carried at his waist. He unfastened it, and pretended to offer it to me in one hand, whilst he held out the other for the price upon which we had agreed. But at the same moment another native, who had taken up his stand behind me, uttered a shrill scream which made me turn my head in his direction, whereupon the rogue made off with his bag, and hid himself in the crowd. We were unwilling to punish him, although most of us carried our guns. Unfortunately, our leniency might be regarded as a proof of our weakness, and so add to the native insolence, and an incident which shortly occurred indicates this was so. Some natives were bold enough to throw stones at an officer who was only about two hundred paces away from us. We were still unwilling to act harshly, as we had heard so much in their favour from Forster's narrative, and had such confidence in their good will, that still more evidence was required to convince us of their real character. One of them, who was enjoying a broiled bone, and busily devouring the meat which still clung to it, offered a share of his meal to a sailor named Piron. He, thinking it to be the bone of some animal, accepted it, but before eating it showed it to me. I at once recognized that it had belonged to the body of a child, of probably fourteen or fifteen years of age. The natives crowding round us showed us upon a living child the position of the bone, owning without hesitation that the man had been making his meal off it, and giving us to understand that it was a great delicacy. Those of our company who had remained on board could hardly credit our account of this disgusting fact. They refused to believe that a people who had been so differently described by Captain Cook and Captain Forster could be capable of so degrading a practice, but the most incredulous were soon convinced. I had retained possession of the gnawed bone, and our surgeon at once recognized it as that of a child. To make still more sure of the cannibalism of the natives, I offered it to one of them. He seized it eagerly and tore the remaining flesh from it with his teeth. After he had done with it, I passed it to another, who still found something upon it to relish. Quote. The natives who visited the vessel committed so many thefts and became so impudent that we were forced to drive them away. Upon landing next day, the French found the natives feasting. They immediately offered a share of their meal to the strangers. It proved to be human flesh recently cooked. Many of them even came close up to the French and felt the muscles of their arms and legs, uttering the word carapec with an expression of admiration and longing which was anything but reassuring. Many of the officers were assaulted and robbed with the greatest effrontery. There remained no doubt of the intentions of the natives. They even attempted to possess themselves of the hatchets the sailors had brought on shore to cut wood, and were only made to desist by being fired upon. These constantly recurring hostilities always ended in the repulse of the natives, many of whom were killed or wounded. But in spite of the repulses they met with, they let no favorable opportunity pass of recommencing their attacks. 
la billardier was witness to a fact which has since been frequently observed but was long disbelieved he saw the natives eating steatite this mineral substance serves to deaden the sense of hunger by filling the stomach and sustaining the viscera of the diaphragm and although it contains no nourishment whatever it is useful to them because they have long periods when food is scarcely procurable as they bestow very little cultivation upon their land which is naturally very sterile yet one would scarcely have expected hungry cannibals to resort to such an expedient no news of la perouse had been obtained during the stay in new caledonia but m jules garnier states that a tradition exists of the appearance of two large ships which had sent boats on shore near the northern extremity of pine island after the first alarm says m jules garnier in a communication which appeared in the bulletin de la société de géographie for november eighteen sixty nine quote, the natives approached the strangers and fraternized with them they were quite astonished at their riches and their cupidity induced them to oppose the departure of the french sailors by force but their ardour was moderated by a volley which killed a few of them little pleased with their reception the french vessels proceeded to the mainland after letting off a cannon which the natives took to be a clap of thunder it is strange that d'entrecasteaux who entered into communications with the natives of pine island should have heard nothing of these events the island is small and its population has always been scanty the natives must have kept secret the fact of their dealings with la perouse had d'entrecasteaux in his navigation among the coral reefs which protect the eastern coast of new caledonia succeeded in entering one of the many openings he met with he might have found some trace of the course taken by la perouse who was a careful navigator and anxious to emulate cook who had touched at several points of that coast a whaler whose account is quoted by rienzi declared that he had seen medals and a cross of st louis relics of the french expedition in possession of the natives of new caledonia m jules garnier during a voyage from noumea to canala in march eighteen sixty five observed in the hand of one of their native escort quote, an old rusty sword in the fashion of the last century end quote, which bore the impression of the fleur-de-lis he could obtain no account of it from its possessor except that he had had it a long time there is no evidence that any member of the expedition gave a sword still less a cross of the order of st louis to a savage no doubt an officer had fallen in some encounter and thus these articles had come into native hands this hypothesis accords with m garnier's explanation of the contradictory accounts given by cook and d'entrecasteaux of the people of Bolade. according to the former they are peaceable honest and friendly according to the latter they are robbers traitors and cannibals m jules garnier suggests that some extraordinary event must have changed the disposition of the natives between the two visits most likely an encounter had taken place the europeans may have been driven to the use of arms they may possibly have destroyed plantations and burnt huts in such a case their hostile reception of d'entrecasteaux would be explicable la billardier in his account of an excursion to the mountains forming the watershed of the northern extremity of new caledonia and from which the sea can be seen on either side says quote, we were followed by three natives who had no doubt seen us a year previously when we coasted the eastern shores of their island for before they left us they spoke of two ships which they had seen upon that coast end quote la billardier ought to have pressed the natives upon this subject were the vessels seen by them those of la perouse or of d'entrecasteaux and was it really a year previously from these details we see how much it is to be regretted that d'entrecasteaux did not pursue his investigations more zealously no doubt had he done so he would have found traces of his fellow countrymen we shall shortly see that with a little perseverance he would have found some at least if not all of them alive during the stay in this port captain juan de kermadec succumbed to a hectic fever from which he had long been suffering 
he was succeeded in the command of the Esperance by Monsieur Desmini d'Arabeau. Leaving New Caledonia upon the twenty-first Floreal, D'Entrecasteaux sighted successively Mulan and Juan Islands, and Santa Cruz de Mendana, which is separated from New Jersey by a strait, in which the French vessels were attacked by the natives. To the southeast, D'Entrecasteaux observed an island, which he named after the Recherche, and which he might have called Discovery, if he had approached it. It was Vanacoro, an islet surrounded by coral reefs, upon which La Perouse's vessels had been wrecked, and which at this time, in all probability, was inhabited by some of the unfortunate seamen. It was most unfortunate to be so near success, and yet to miss it. But the veil which hid the fate of La Perouse and his companions was not destined to be removed for a long time yet. After surveying the northern extremities of Santa Cruz, without any result so far as the object of his expedition was concerned, D'Entrecasteaux directed his course to De Surville's land of the Arsacides. He reconnoitred the northern coast, and thence reached the shores of Louisiade, which La Perouse had announced his intention of visiting when he left Salomon Island, and surveyed Cape Deliverance. Bougainville was wrong in supposing that this cape belonged to New Guinea. It is the extreme point of an island, called Rossel after one of the officers who has given an account of the expedition. After coasting along a series of low and rocky islands, which were named after the principal officers, the vessels reached Cape William, on the coast of New Guinea. They then directed their course to Dampier's Strait. After sailing along the northern coast of New Britain, several small and mountainous islands, hitherto unknown, were discovered. Upon the 17th of July, a small island in the neighborhood of the Anchorite Islands was sighted. D'Entrecasteaux had long been suffering from dysentery and scurvy, and was in extreme danger. Following the advice of his officers, he decided to take leave of the Esperance, and endeavored to reach Waihun more quickly. Upon the 20th of July, he sunk under long and protracted sufferings. After a stay at Waihoon and Burro Islands, at which latter place the President overwhelmed the French with civilities, and where Bougainville was still remembered by the natives, the expedition left, under command of Darabeau. He also unfortunately fell ill, and the command was transferred to Rossel, under whose orders the vessels passed first Boutong, and then Salier Straits, and reached Sorabaya upon the 19th of October. Sad news here awaited the members of the expedition. Louis the Sixteenth had been beheaded. France was at war with Holland and all the European powers. Although both the Recherche and the Esperance needed many repairs, and the health of the crews needed repose, Darabeau was about to start for Mauritius when he was detained by the French governor. Fearing that the news from Europe, affecting as it did the various members of the expedition so differently, might lead to disaffection in his colony, he subjected his prisoners, as he called the French, to most humiliating conditions which they could not escape. Irritation and hatred were rampant, when it occurred to Darabeau to unfurl the white flag. However, the greater part of the officers and men of science, amongst them Biardia, obstinately refused to respect the conditions imposed, and being arrested by order of the Dutch authorities, were distributed throughout the different parts of the colony. After the death of Darabeau, which occurred upon the 21st of August, 1794, Rossel became head of the expedition. He undertook to convey all documents of every kind collected during the voyage to France, but being taken prisoner by an English frigate, he was deprived of his property in defiance of justice and when France obtained the objects of natural history, of which she had been robbed, the expression is not too strong when we recall the instructions given by the French government with regard to Captain Cook's expedition, they were in so bad a condition that they had lost much of their value. Thus ended this unfortunate expedition. Although its principal object had not been attained, it had at least resulted in some geographical discoveries it had completed or rectified those made by preceding navigators, 
and to it, especially to the exertions of La Billardier, are due the acquisition of an immense number of facts in natural history. End of section 33section thirty four of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter one part three french navigators three a captain marchand's voyage the marquesas discovery of nuka Hiva, manners and customs of the inhabitants revolution islands the coast of america and chinkitane port cock strait stay at the sandwich islands macao disappointment return to france Discoveries made by Bass and Flinders upon the Australian coast. Captain Bodin's expedition, Endracht and De Witt Islands, stay at Timor, survey of Van Diemen's Land, separation between the Geographe and the Naturaliste, stay at Port Jackson, convicts, agricultural wealth of New South Wales, return of the Naturaliste to France cruise of the geographe and of the casuarina to the islands of newts edels endracht and of it second stay at timor return to france etienne marchand a captain in the french service returning to france from bengal in 1788 met with the english captain portlock in the roadstead of st helena their conversation naturally fell upon commerce and the value of various articles of trade like a sensible man marchand allowed his companion to talk and only put in a few words himself now and again and thus drew from portlock the interesting information that furs and more especially otter skins which could be obtained for a mere trifle upon the eastern coast of north america realized an enormous price in china whilst at the same time a cargo brought from the celestial empire would return a large profit in europe upon arriving in france marchand communicated what he had learned to his ship owners messieurs beau of marseilles and they at once resolved to act upon the knowledge he had obtained navigation in the pacific ocean required a ship of special strength and excellent messieurs beau ordered the construction of a vessel of three hundred tons burden plated with copper and provided with every necessary for defence in case of attack and for repairs in the event of accident and also with everything likely to promote trade and to ensure the health of the crews during a voyage of three or four years two captains messieurs mass and prosper chanal were associated with marchand in the command of the expedition and the rest of the party consisted of three lieutenants two surgeons three volunteers and a crew of thirty-nine seamen four cannon two howitzers four swivel guns with needful ammunition etc formed the equipment although the vessel was only to reach cape horn at the beginning of winter the solide left marseilles upon the fourteenth of december seventeen ninety after a short stay at praia cape verde islands marchand proceeded to staten island which he reached upon the first of april seventeen ninety one he then doubled tierra del fuego and entered the pacific his intention was to proceed immediately to the northwestern coast of america but at the beginning of may the water on board was already so tainted that he required a fresh supply under these circumstances the captain decided to reach the marquesas island of mendoza which are situated at south latitude six degrees and near a hundred and forty one degrees west of the paris meridian the situation of these islands says fleurien who published an interesting account of this voyage was the more suitable for his purpose because with a view to escaping the calms often met with in too easterly a course he had resolved to cross the line at a hundred and forty two degrees west longitude 
this group of islands had been discovered in 1595 by Mendoza and visited by Cook in 1774 Magdalena Island the most southerly of the group was reached upon the 12th of June the captain and his associate Chanal had calculated with such precision that the Solide anchored off the Mendoza Islands after a cruise of 73 days from the time of leaving Staten Island without having noticed any land whatever constant astronomical observations alone ensured the safety of the vessel in a sea where the currents were unequal and it was quite impossible to regulate the course of the ship by any ordinary calculations marchand made for san pedro which lay on the west he soon recognized dominica santa cristina and hood island the most northerly of the group and finally anchored in madre de dios bay where he was enthusiastically welcomed by the natives crying tayo tayo finding it impossible to obtain the number of pigs he required at this port the captain decided upon visiting the remaining bays of santa cristina island which he found better populated more fertile and more picturesque than that of madre de dios the stay of the english in the marquesas island had been too short to allow of accurate observations of the manners and customs of the inhabitants we will therefore make a few extracts from the description given by etienne marchand Quote, these natives are tall strong and active their complexion is clear brown but many differ little in this respect from the lower orders in europe the climate renders clothing unnecessary but they tattoo their entire bodies so regularly each arm and leg for example exactly like its fellow that the effect is by no means bad the way of arranging the hair varies and fashion is as despotic in the marquesas as in other countries some wear necklaces of red beads other a string of small pieces of light wood although both men and women have their ears pierced earrings are not usually worn but a young native girl has been seen strutting about wearing as a neck ornament the rusty iron shaving dish which she has stolen from the ship's barber whilst a man was equally proud of sporting the ramrod of captain marchand's gun which he had placed in the orifice of his ear letting part of it hang down End quote cook affirms that these islanders like the tahitans were acquainted with kaba certain it is that they called the brandy which was offered them on the solide by the name of the pepper plant it appeared that they did not indulge to excess in this liquor for none of them were ever seen in a state of drunkenness the english did not mention in their account of the natives an act of civility which captain chanal thought worthy of special record it consisted in offering to a friend a piece of food which had been already chewed that he might have no trouble but that of swallowing it we may easily imagine that the french in spite of their appreciation of the good will conveyed in this action were little likely to avail themselves of it to marchand we also owe the curious observation that their huts are raised upon flat stones and that the stilts which they use indicate that santa cristina is subject to inundations in the exhibition at the trocadero one of these stilts extremely well made and carved was exhibited and monsieur ami whose thorough knowledge of everything relating to oceana is well known has written an essay upon this singular object beyond the usual occupations of fishing the construction of their weapons pirogues and domestic implements the natives of santa cristina pass their time in singing dancing and amusing themselves the common expression of killing time seems to have been invented to mark the uselessness of the actions which make up their lives during the earlier days of the stay in madre de dios bay marchand had observed something which led him to the discovery of a group of islands hitherto unknown to the older navigators or to cook upon a clear evening at sunset he noticed a spot upon the horizon which had the appearance of a lofty peak as this appeared several nights in succession he concluded that it was land and finding it not mentioned upon any of the charts it seemed probable that it was some unknown island marchand determined to satisfy himself upon this point 
and leaving santa cristina upon the twentieth of june he had the satisfaction of discovering a group of small islands in the northwest which were situated in seven degrees of latitude he gave his own name to the most important of them the natives were evidently of the same race as that which peopled the marquesas shortly afterwards several other islands were discovered including bow island which is identical with nuka Hiva, the deux frères and mass and chanal islands this group since united by geographers to that of the marquesas received the name of revolution islands the course was then directed to the american coast it was too late in the season to attempt to reach william sound or cook's river on the sixth parallel marchand accordingly resolved upon making for engano cape and entering the norfolk bay of dixon which is identical with the guadeloupe bay of the spaniards upon the seventh of august engano cape was sighted and after five days of calm anchor was cast in guadeloupe bay there had not been a single case of scurvy on board after two hundred and forty two days navigation ten of which only were passed in port at praia and madre de dios and after transversing some five thousand eight hundred leagues of sea this was certainly a wonderful fact due to the provision of the ship owners who had spared nothing that could conduce to the health of the crews and also to the care with which the captains had observed the sanitary measures commended to them by experience during his stay in this port which the natives called chinquitane marchand bought a number of otter skins one hundred of which were of the very first quality the natives are ugly stunted but well proportioned they have round flat faces small sunken bleared eyes and prominent cheekbones which do not add to their beauty it is difficult to define the color of their skins so carefully is it disguised under a thick coating of grease and the black and red substances which they rub in their hair is coarse thick and bushy covered with ochre down and all the filth accumulated by time and neglect and adds not a little to their unprepossessing appearance the women though not so black as the men are even more ugly they are short and thick-set their feet turn inwards and their incredibly filthy habits make them repulsive the coquetry which is innate in the female mind induces them to add to their natural charms by the use of a labial ornament as ugly as it is inconvenient of which we have already spoken in our account of captain cook's stay in these waters by means of an incision just below the lower lip they make an opening parallel to that of the mouth into which they insert an iron or wooden skewer and from time to time they gradually increase the size of the instrument in accordance with advancing age finally they introduce a piece of wood made for the purpose to the size and shape of the bowl of an ordinary tablespoon this ornament weighing upon the projecting part naturally forces down the lower lip upon the chin and develops the beauty of a large gaping mouth in shape not unlike an oven revealing a row of dirty yellow teeth this bowl is removable at pleasure and when it is absent the opening of the lower lip presents the appearance of a second mouth which is a little smaller than the natural one and in some cases has been known to be three inches in length the solide left chinquitane upon the twenty first of august and steered to the southeast in the hope of coming upon queen charlotte's islands which had been discovered in seventeen eighty six by la perouse these islands extend over a distance of nearly seventy leagues upon the twenty third etienne marchand sighted manteau bay dixon's cloak bay which was carefully surveyed by captain chenal next day the vessels entered cock strait and began to trade with the indians for furs the navigators were immensely astonished at seeing two enormous paintings evidently of great age and some gigantic sculptures which although not bearing the very smallest comparison to the chef d'oeuvre of greece testified none the less to artistic tastes little to be expected from the miserable population the lands which form cock strait and bay and low and covered with furs the soil composed of the remains of plants and broken rocks 
does not appear to have much depth and the productions are similar to those of Chinkitane. the population may be estimated at 400 not unlike europeans in height and figure they are less hideous than the Chinkitanians. this stay in cloak bay was not as productive of trade in furs as marchand had expected and he therefore decided to send an expedition under captain chanal to the more southerly islands the object of the expedition was the survey of the regions which had hitherto been unvisited dixon was the only navigator who had crossed these waters and none of his crew had landed it is therefore not astonishing that many of his assertions were either rectified or denied after this more careful exploration after sighting nootka sound berkeley bay was reached but just as the solide was about to enter it a three-masted ship was seen approaching the harbour from the south which was precisely what marchand had intended doing this decided the french navigator to proceed immediately to the coast of china and dispose of his merchandise before the vessel he now saw should have time to reach it and compete with him the best route to follow was that of the sandwich islands and upon the fifth of october the heights of mauna loa and mauna coa were made out by the french they seemed quite free from snow which was contrary to the description given of them by captain king so soon as ohai island was in sight marchand wisely decided to conduct all his trade on board he obtained pigs fowls coconuts bananas and various fruits from this island and was delighted at finding amongst them pumpkins and watermelons no doubt from the seeds sown by captain cook four days were passed in trade then the route to china was resumed and in due course tinian island one of the marianas was sighted commodore anson's glowing description of this island will be recalled byron as we have already mentioned was quite astonished at the different aspect it presented to him but the fact is some fifty years earlier tinian was flourishing and counted thirty thousand inhabitants and the victoria spaniards had since introduced an epidemic which had decimated the population whilst the miserable survivors had been torn from their country and sent to guam as slaves marchand did not land at tinian which according to the accounts of every navigator who had visited it since byron had relapsed into barbarism but made for the southern extremity of formosa reaching macao upon the twenty eighth of november he heard news which disconcerted him the chinese government had just passed a law prohibiting the introduction of furs into the ports of the empire under most severe penalties was this the result of some unknown clause in a secret treaty with russia or was it due to the cupidity and avarice of a few mandarins in either case it was impossible to infringe the law marchand wrote to messieurs beaux agents in canton but the same prohibition held good in that town also and it was useless to think of reaching wampoa where he would have to pay a duty amounting to at least six thousand piastres the only course open to marchand was to go to mauritius and thence return to marseilles it is unnecessary to describe the return voyage which was accomplished without any unusual incidents what were the scientific results of this expedition nothing to speak of from a geographical point of view they may be enumerated as follows the discovery of that portion of the marquesas island which had escaped the notice of captain cook and his predecessors a more thorough examination of the country and the manners and customs of the natives of santa cristina in the same group of chinkitane and cloak bays and of queen charlotte's islands off the american coast small as these results might appear for an official expedition they were not unsatisfactory for a vessel equipped by private enterprise moreover captain marchand and his colleagues had turned new discoveries to such good account and study the narratives of earlier voyages so carefully that they carried out the plan of their expedition more precisely than many experienced navigators might have done and in their turn they rendered valuable assistance to their successors by the accuracy of their charts and drawings circumstances were to prove less favorable for the publication of an account of a scientific expedition 
undertaken some years later under the auspices of the French government, having for its object the survey of the Australian coast. Although the results of the voyage made by Nicolas Baudin were most abundant, they seem up to this date to have been little recognized, and scientific dictionaries and biographies say as little as possible of his expedition. From the time of Tasman's discovery of the western coast of New Holland, much had been done towards exploring this immense continent. Cook had carefully surveyed the eastern coast, discovering Endeavour Strait, and had urged upon his government the great advantages which would accrue from the founding of a colony in Botany Bay. In 1788, Philip, with his band of convicts, had laid the foundation of Port Jackson and of English power in its fifth continent of the world. In 1795 and 1796, Flinders, a midshipman, and Surgeon Bass, with a small vessel called the Tom Thumb, had explored twenty miles of the River George, and made a careful survey of a long stretch of coast. In 1797, Bass discovered a large harbour which he named Western Port, on account of its situation. His provisions were now exhausted, says Desborough Cooley and in spite of his earnest wish to make an accurate and minute survey of his new discoveries he was obliged to retrace his steps he was only provided with provisions for six weeks still by aid of fish and sea birds which he obtained in abundance he succeeded in extending his voyage for another five weeks although he had taken on board two convicts whom he had picked up this voyage of six hundred miles in an open boat is one of the most remarkable on record it was not undertaken from necessity but with the view of exploring unknown and dangerous shores in seventeen ninety eight bass accompanied by flinders discovered the strait which now bears his name and which divides tasmania from new holland and in a schooner of some twenty-five tons burden he made the tour of van diemen's land these brave adventurers collected facts and made observations of the rivers and ports of this country which were of great use in the future colonization of the continent bass and jackson were both enthusiastically received at port jackson upon his return to england flinders received command of the investigator with the rank of naval lieutenant this vessel was especially equipped for a voyage of discovery upon the australian coast the south and northwestern shores the Gulf of Carpentaria and Torres Straits were to be explored. End of section thirty four. Section thirty five of Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 1, Part 3. French Navigators, 3b. Public attention in France had been attracted to New Holland by the narratives published by Cook and D'Entrecasteaux this wonderful continent with its strange unknown animals and forests of gigantic eucalyptus alternating with barren plains producing nothing but prickly plants was long to present all but invincible obstacles to the explorer the french institute was the mouthpiece of popular opinion in demanding from the government the organization of an expedition to the southern continent as a result of their representations Twenty-four scientific men were selected to participate in the voyage. No previous expedition had been so fortunate in the number of scientific men attached to the staff. Astronomers, geographers, mineralogists, botanists, zoologists, draughtsmen, and gardeners all mustered four or five strong. Foremost amongst them, we may mention, Lecheneau de la Tour, François Perron, and Borg de Saint-Vincent, Officers and sailors had been carefully selected. Among the first were François André Baudin, Pereur de Melay, Hyacinthe de Bougainville, 
Charles Baudin, Emmanuel Amelon, Pierre Milius, Monga, Duval d'Ailly, Henri de Freycinet, all of whom in after life rose to be admirals or vice admirals, Le Bas Saint Croix, Pierre Guillaume Guiquel, Jacques Philippe Monguere, Jacques de Saint Cric, Louis de Freycinet, all future naval captains. The narrative says the plans for the expedition were such as to guarantee its success, and the attainment of the results so eagerly desired. All the experiences of preceding navigators in the latitudes through which we were to pass, all that theories and reasoning could suggest, had been called into requisition. Most accurate calculations of the variable winds, monsoons, and currents had been made, and the misfortunes which overtook us were in every case due to our deviation from our valuable instructions. The third vessel of lesser draught was equipped at the Mauritius. The navigators were then to proceed to Van Zeeman's land, Dontrecasso, Bass, and Bank Straits, and thence, having determined the situation of the Hunter Islands, to pass behind St. Peter and St. Francis Islands, and survey the country behind them, in the hope of finding the straits supposed to be connected with the Gulf of Carpentaria, and to divide New Holland into two parts. This survey accomplished, Louvain, Adels, and Endracht Islands were next to be visited, Swan River to be followed as far as possible, and a survey taken of Rockness Island, and the coast near it. From thence the expedition was to proceed to Shark Bay, to determine various points in De Witland, and, leaving the coast at Northwest Cape, to go to Timor, in the Moluccas, for a well-earned rest. After allowing sufficient time for the crews to recover from their fatigue, the coast of New Guinea was to be surveyed, with a view to ascertaining whether it was broken up into islands by various straits, the further portion of Gulf of Carpentaria was to be explored, various districts in Arnheim land were to be reconnoitred, and from thence the expedition was to proceed to Mauritius on its way to Europe. A more splendid programme was impossible, and it was clearly traceable to the able mind which had laid down the route taken by La Perouse and D'Entrecasteaux. If the expedition was skilfully conducted, the results could not fail to be considerable. The géographe, a corvette of thirty guns, and the naturaliste, a large transport ship, were equipped at Havre for the expedition. Nothing had been forgotten. The provisions were abundant and of good quality. Each vessel was provided with all kinds of scientific instruments by the best makers, a library of the most trustworthy authorities, passports couched in the most flattering terms and signed by every government in Europe, an unlimited credit in all the towns of Asia and Africa. In short, every possible measure was taken to ensure the success of this important expedition upon the nineteenth of october eighteen hundred the two vessels left havre amidst the acclamations of an immense multitude a short stay was made at port santa cruz in tenerife and thence they proceeded without stopping to mauritius where several officers were left who were too ill to proceed when the expedition set sail upon the twenty fifth of april eighteen o one this was not an encouraging beginning and discontent was rife when it was ascertained that the allowance of fresh bread was to be limited to half a pound weekly and that the usual ration of wine was to be replaced by three-sixths of a bottle of the inferior tafia of mauritius whilst biscuits and salt meats were to be the staple food this ill-advised economy resulted in the illnesses of the crew and the discontent of many of the scientific staff the length of the voyage from france to mauritius and the long stay in that island had consumed much valuable time and the favourable season was on the wane baudin fearing to attempt to reach van diemen's land decided to commence his exploration upon the north-west coast of new holland he forgot that he would thus maintain a southerly course so that his advance would coincide with that of the season 
the coast of new holland was discovered upon the 27th of may it was low barren and sandy geography bay naturalist cape depuche creek and piquet point were successively sighted and named in the last named spot the naturalists landed and reaped a rich harvest of plants and shells meantime however the violence of the waves carried away the two vessels and twenty-five of the crew were forced to spend several days on shore unable to obtain any but brackish water they could not succeed in killing any sort of game and their only nourishment was a species of samphire containing a quantity of carbonate of soda and acid juice a sloop which had been driven on shore by the force of the waves had to be abandoned together with guns sabres cartridges cables tackles and many other valuable articles but the worst part of this last misfortune says the narrative was the loss of vass of dieppe one of the most able of the crew of the naturalist swept away by the waves three times in his efforts to re-embark he was finally swallowed up without the possibility of assistance being rendered to him or even the fact of his death being ascertained so violent were the waves and so dark the night the foul weather continued the wind blew in hurricanes fine rain fell uninterruptedly and the naturaliste was lost to view in a thick fog which prevailed until timor was reached upon reaching rotness island which he had named as a place of rendezvous to captain hamilton in case of separation Baudin, to the surprise of every one gave orders to make for shark's bay upon the coast of endracht island the coast of this part of new holland is a succession of low and almost level sandy barren lands with gray or reddish soil intercepted here and there by slight ravines the coast is almost perpendicular and is protected by inaccessible reefs it well deserves the name of the iron coast which was bestowed upon it by the able hydrographer boulanger from dirk hartog island where endracht land commences door islands bernier islands where troops of kangaroos were met with and dampier roadstead were successively sighted as far as shark's bay which was thoroughly explored upon leaving endracht land which offers no attractions de witt land extending from the northwest cape to arnheim land over ten degrees of latitude and fifteen of longitude was thoroughly surveyed much the same incidents and dangers were met with by the explorers as they successively named hermit and forester islands the latter with volcanic soil the bass terre in geography channel lowlands which were avoided with difficulty with Bedon and lacepede islands capes border and molion champagne d'acol freycinet luca and other islands were seen and named amidst these numberless islands said the narrative there was little to please the navigators the sun shines unprotected by any clouds and except during the nocturnal storms there is no movement even of the water man appears to have fled from this ungrateful soil for no trace of his presence is to be seen it is difficult for the traveller who turns in despair from the inhospitable islands of this forsaken coast where dangers of every sort assail him and no provisions are to be had to reflect that this barren country adjoins groups of asiatic islands upon which nature has lavished her treasures and delights with a liberal hand the discovery of the bonaparte archipelago completed the survey of this miserable region it is situated between thirteen degrees fifteen minutes south latitude and a hundred and twenty three degrees thirty minutes longitude west of paris the wretched food upon which we had lived since we left mauritius had tried the strongest constitutions the ravages of scurvy had been severely felt our store of water was very low and there was no possibility of replenishing it in this miserable region the time approached for the return of the monsoon and its accompanying storms must be avoided on the coast above all we must procure a boat to enable us to rejoin the naturalist 
moved by all these considerations the captain decided to direct his course to timor island and he anchored there upon the twenty second of august in the roadstead of kupang it is unnecessary to enter into details of the reception accorded to the navigators hospitality and kindness are ever valuable to the recipients but there is a sameness in an account of them which is wearisome to the reader we need only dwell upon the sore need of rest for the suffering crew ten of those who landed were in the worst stage of scurvy and many others had the swollen and inflamed gums which precede the attack of this scourge of seamen unfortunately although the scurvy yielded to the remedies applied it was succeeded by dysentery which in a few days laid low eighteen men at length upon the twenty first of september the naturalist appeared her captain had patiently awaited the arrival of the geographe in shark's bay that being the rendezvous appointed by baudin but which he had failed to keep the officers availed themselves of this stay thoroughly to survey the shores of rottnest island and to explore the swan river and albrolhos or houtman rocks two dutch inscriptions scratched upon tin plates had been discovered by captain hamlin upon dirk hartog island one recorded the passage upon the twenty fifth of october sixteen sixteen of the ship indraught from amsterdam and the other the stay of the Gielvink in this port in 1697 under command of captain Vlaming. the result of the examinations made by the officers of the naturalist was as follows the so-called sharks bay extends from cape cuvier on the north to freycinet gulf the eastern coast is all part of the mainland and the western consists of the islet of cox bernier dour and dirk hartog islands and a small portion of the mainland the peninsula of peron occupies the centre of this extensive bay and to the east and west are the harbours of hamlin and henri freycinet unfortunately even the sickness among their unfortunate crews did but restore temporary concord between captain baudin and his staff he himself had been attacked by a fever and for a few hours it was supposed that he was dead upon his recovery eight days later however he did not hesitate to place one of his officers monsieur piquet ensign under arrest all the members of his staff disapproved of this action and offered repeatedly many flattering tokens of their esteem and regard to the disgraced officer as monsieur piquet was made lieutenant upon his return to france it would appear that he was not in fault captain baudin had deviated from the instructions given him by the institute he now proceeded to van diemen's land leaving timor upon the thirteenth of november eighteen o one the french found themselves in sight of the southern coast of this island exactly two months later the ravages of disease continued on board and the number of victims was considerable the two ships at length reached d'entrecasteau strait which had escaped the notice of tasman furneaux cook marion hunter and bly and the discovery of which was the result of a mistake which might have had dangerous consequences the vessels had anchored in this spot for the sake of obtaining water and several boats were sent in search of it at half past nine says perron we were at the mouth of swan river this spot appeared to me to exceed in beauty and picturesque effect anything that i had hitherto met with seven mountain ranges rise one above the other forming the background of the harbour whilst on the right and left lofty hills shut it in and present the appearance of a number of rounded capes and romantic creeks vegetation is most luxuriant the shores abound in hardy trees growing so densely that it is almost impossible to penetrate into the forest flocks of parakeets and cockatoos of most brilliant plumage hover above them while the blue ringed tomtits sport beneath their branches the sea was almost calm and scarcely ruffled by the passage of the innumerable black swans continuously passing to and fro 
all who went in search of a watering place were not equally pleased with their reception by the natives captain hamlin in company with messieurs leschenant and petit and several officers and sailors had encountered some natives to whom he offered various presents as they were about to re-embark the french were assailed by a shower of stones one of which wounded captain hamlin severely the natives brandished their assegais and made many threatening gestures but could not provoke the strangers to retaliate by a single shot a most rare example of moderation and humanity the geographical observations made by admiral d'entrecasteaux in van diemen's land are so wonderfully correct said the narrative that it would be scarcely possible to imagine anything more perfect of their kind their principal author m beauton beaupre has indeed fully merited the esteem of his fellow countrymen and the gratitude of all navigators in every case where investigation was possible this skilful engineer made sure of every point his survey of the strait of d'entrecasteaux and the numberless bays and channels which comprised in it was especially thorough unfortunately his explorations did not extend to that portion of van diemen's land which lies northeast of the strait and which was only superficially examined by the french boats it was to this portion of the coast that the hydrographers more particularly directed their attention in the hope that by adding the results of their observations to that of their fellow countrymen they might gain a thorough knowledge of the coast this undertaking which was to complete the results of, of d'entrecasteaux's exertions detained the navigators until the sixth of february the details and incidents of such exploration are always alike and offer little to interest the general reader for this reason we shall not dwell upon them in spite of their importance except when they contain anecdotes of interest the naturaliste and geographe next proceeded to the exploration of banks and bass's straits upon the morning of the sixth of march we coasted the islets of taiofe and shouten island at a good distance towards midday we found ourselves opposite forester's cape and our skilful geographer m boulanger embarked in the longboat commanded by m marura to survey the coast the ship was to follow a route parallel with that of the boat of which it was never to lose sight for a moment but m boulanger had scarcely been gone a quarter of an hour when captain baudin without any apparent reason tacked round and gained a more open sea the boat was lost to sight and the coast was not neared again until night was approaching a strong breeze had arisen which increasing every moment added to the uncertainty of our movements night fell and the coast upon which we had abandoned our unhappy comrades was hidden from our sight the three following days were vainly spent in the endeavour to find the missing boats this calm narration would appear to veil strong indignation against captain baudin what can have been his motive for forsaking his sailors and two of his ablest officers this is a problem which the most attentive perusal of perron's narrative fails to elucidate to enter the straits of banks and bass was to tread in the footsteps of the latter and of flinders who have made these waters the special field of their discoveries but when upon the twenty ninth of march eighteen o two the geograph commenced coasting the southwestern shore of new holland one portion of it only was known that which extends from cape lewin to st peter and st francis islands the land stretching from the eastern boundary of newtsland to port western had never yet been trodden by an european foot all the importance of this cruise is apparent when we reflect that it was undertaken to decide whether new holland consisted of one island only and whether any large rivers flowed into the sea from it la trail island mount tabor cape cape folar descartes bay boufle cape estan bay rivoli bay mongo cape were all successively sighted and named an extraordinary take of dolphins had delighted the crew when a sail was seen upon the horizon 
it was of course supposed that it was the naturalist from which the geograph had been separated by violent storms since the night of the seventh to eighth march as the vessel was making rapid way she was soon abreast the geograph she carried the english colours it was the investigator under the command of captain flinders eight months from europe sent for the completion of the survey of new holland flinders had been engaged for three months in the exploration of the coast he too had suffered from storms and tempest in bass's strait during one of the latter he had lost a boat containing eight men and his chief officer the geograph visited in succession cape crete the peninsula of florian which is about twenty miles in extent the gulf of st vincent so called by flinders kangaroo island orthorpe islands spencer gulf upon the western coast of which is port lincoln the finest and safest harbour in new holland and the islands of st francis and st peter certainly captain baudin in order to render this hydrographical survey complete should have followed out his instructions and penetrated beyond st peter and st francis islands the weather however was too unpropitious and this exploration was reserved for a future expedition scurvy meantime made fearful ravages amongst the adventurers more than half the crew were incapable of service two only of the helmsmen were in a fit condition for duty how could anything else be expected in a vessel which was not provided with either wine or brandy but was provisioned only with fetid water biscuits infested with maggots and putrid meats the mere smell of which was injurious winter too had set in in the southern hemisphere and the crews were in sore need of rest the nearest harbor was port jackson and the shortest passage thither was by bass's strait baudin who always appears to have disliked following a beaten track thought differently and gave orders for doubling the southern extremity of van diemen's land upon the twentieth of may anchor was cast in adventure bay the sick who could be moved were carried on shore where water was plentiful but the stormy waters were no longer passable a thick fog prevailed and only the sound of the waves breaking upon the shore saved the vessels from running aground the number of sick increased the ocean claimed a fresh victim each succeeding day upon the fourth of june there were only six men equal to their work and the tempest increased in fury yet the geograph escaped destruction once more end of section thirty five section thirty six of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Celebrated Travels and Travellers, Volume 2 Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne Second Part, Chapter 1, Part 3 French Navigators, 3C Upon the 17th of June, a vessel was signalled, and from her captain the navigators learned that the naturalist after waiting vainly for her consort at Port Jackson, had gone in search of her, that the abandoned boat had been rescued by an English vessel, and the crew had been received upon the naturalist. The geograph was awaited with eager impatience at Port Jackson, where help of every kind was prepared for her. The geograph was for three days within reach of Port Jackson, and yet unable to enter the harbour for want of able-bodied seamen to work her an english sloop with a pilot and the necessary men for working the vessel was however sent to the rescue the entrance to port jackson is only two miles in width but it widens until it forms a large harbour containing water enough for the largest ships and space enough to accommodate all comers in perfect safety a thousand ships of the line might easily anchor there according to commodore phillips's report towards the centre of this magnificent port and upon its southern coast the town of sydney is situated 
built upon two adjacent hills and watered by a small river which runs through it this rising town presents a pleasant and picturesque appearance the eye is at once struck by the fortifications and the hospital which is large enough to contain two or three hundred sick and was brought from england in pieces by commodore phillips immense warehouses for the reception of the cargoes of the largest vessels are built upon the shore ships of all kinds were being constructed in the yards from the wood of the country with a sentiment of respect which almost amounts to veneration the sloop in which monsieur bass made the discovery of the strait which separates tasmania from new holland is preserved snuff boxes made of the wood of her keel are valued as relics by their possessors and the governor of the fort could think of no more acceptable present for captain Baudin than a piece of the wood of this famous vessel mounted in silver upon which the chief details of the discovery of bass's straits were engraved equally worthy of admiration were the prison capable of lodging two hundred prisoners the wine and provision warehouses the exercising ground overlooked by the governor's house the barracks observatory and the english church of which the foundations were at this time but just laid the great change in the conduct and condition of the convicts was not less interesting we found new cause for surprise in the population of the colony a more worthy subject for the reflection of a philosopher or statesman never existed no brighter example of the influence of social institutions can be imagined than that afforded on the distant shores of which we were speaking here are to be found the formidable ruffians who in a civilized country were the terror of their government transported to these foreign shores ejected from european society and placed from their first arrival between the certainty of punishment on the one hand and the hope of a better fate in store for them upon the other surrounded by a surveillance as benevolent as it is active they are absolutely forced to relinquish their antisocial habits the majority after expiating their crimes by hard labor receive the rank of citizenship interested themselves in the maintenance of order and justice for the sake of the preservation of such property as they have accumulated many of them having become husbands and fathers the closest of all ties bind them to their present situation the same revolution brought about by the same means takes place in the lives of the women and wretched girls by degrees accustomed to more correct principles of conduct they in time become the mothers of hard-working and honest families the welcome accorded to the french at port jackson was in the highest degree satisfactory every possible facility for the prosecution of their researches was afforded to the naturalists while the military authorities and private inhabitants vied with each other in offering provisions and help of every kind many were the successful excursions in the neighborhood and the naturalists delighted in examining the famous vineyards of rose hill to which the finest plants from the cape the canary islands madeira xeres and bordeaux had been transported when questioned the vine dressers said the plants sprout more vigorously here than anywhere else but the first breath of wind from the northwest is enough to destroy everything buds flowers and leaves alike withering beneath its scorching heat somewhat later the culture of the vine transported to a more favorable locality increased greatly and although it has as yet not attained to any remarkable growth furnishes a wine which is pleasant to the taste and very alcoholic the blue mountains which for a long time bounded european research are thirty miles beyond sydney lieutenant dawes and captain tench patterson who explored hawkesbury river the nile of new holland hacking bass and beraille had alike failed to scale them already the thinning of the trees in the neighboring forests and the excellence of the grass had rendered new south wales an excellent pasturage cattle and sheep had been largely imported they multiplied so quickly that in state pastures alone there were no less than eighteen hundred head of cattle 
within a short time of our stay at Port Jackson. Of these, 514 were bulls, 121 oxen, and 1,165 cows. The increase and growth of these animals was so rapid that in less than 11 months the number of oxen and cows had reached from 1,856 to 2,450, which would be at the rate of increase per annum of 650 head, or one-third of the entire number. Carrying this calculation on at the same rate for a period of 30 years, or even reducing the increase by one-half, it is clear that New South Wales would be teeming throughout its length and breadth with cattle. Sheep farming has had even greater success. The increase of flocks upon these distant shores is so prolific that Captain MacArthur, one of the richest landowners of New South Wales, does not hesitate to assert in a pamphlet published for that purpose that in twenty years New Holland alone will be able to supply England with all the wool which is now imported from neighbouring countries, and the price of which amounts yearly to one million eight hundred thousand pounds sterling. We know now how very little exaggeration there was in these calculations, although at that time they appeared most wonderful. It is interesting to read of the growth of this industry, and the impression produced by it, in the earlier stages upon the French navigators. The crew had many of them recovered their health, but the number of able sailors was still so small that it was necessary to send the naturaliste back to France, after selecting the most healthy of the crew. She was replaced by a vessel of thirty tons burden, called the Casuarina, the command of which was entrusted to Louis de Freycinet. The slight build and low draught of this vessel made it valuable for coasting purposes. The naturaliste, says Perron, with the records of the expedition and the results of the observations made during the two voyages, also took away with it more than 40,000 animals of different kinds, collected from the various countries which had been visited during the two years. Thirty-two huge cases contained these collections, certainly the richest ever brought together in Europe, which when exhibited in the house occupied by myself and Monsieur Belfin, excited the admiration of all the english visitors especially of the celebrated naturalist patterson the geographique and the quasuarina left port jackson upon the eighteenth of november eighteen o two on this new trip the explorers surveyed king island hunter island and the northwestern portion of van diemen's land thus completing the geography of the coast of this huge island from the 27th of December, 1802, till the 15th of February, 1803, Captain Bodin was engaged in reconnoitring the Kangaroo Islands upon the southwestern coast of Australia, with the two gulfs opposite to them. It was indeed strange, says Perron, to observe the monotonous and sterile character of the different portions of New Holland, the greater on account of its contrast to that of the neighbouring countries. On the northwest, we had been charmed by the fertile islands of the Timor archipelago, with their lofty mountains, rivers, streams, and forests. Yet scarcely forty-eight hours had passed since we left the desert shores of De Witt land. Again, on the south, the wonderful vegetation and smiling slopes of Van Diemen's land had excited our admiration, and yet more recently we had been delighted with the verdure and fertility of King Island. The scene changes, we reach the shore of New Holland, and are once more face to face with the desolation, the description of which must already have wearied the reader as much as it surprised the philosopher and oppressed the explorer. The engineers who accompanied the Casuarina for the survey of Spencer Gulf, and the peninsula which divides it from the Gulf of St. Vincent, were obliged to abridge the prosecution of their discoveries in Lincoln Port, and content themselves with the thorough survey which enabled them to decide positively that no great river discharges itself into the ocean in this region the time for their return to kangaroo island had arrived but in spite of their conviction that if they delayed they would be left behind they did not hasten their movement sufficiently and upon reaching the rendezvous found that the captain of the geographe had already started 
without concerning himself in the least about the casuarina, although her stock of provisions was very inadequate. Baudin decided to continue the exploration of the coast and the survey of St. Francis Archipelago alone, a most important undertaking, as no navigator had examined its island separately since its first discovery by Peter Knights in 1627. Flinders had really just made this exploration, but Baudin was not aware of this, and fancied himself the first European who had entered these waters since their discovery. When the geograph reached King George's Harbour upon the 6th of February, the Casuarina had already arrived there, but in such a damaged condition that her captain had been obliged to run her aground. King George's Sound, discovered in 1791 by Vancouver, is of great importance, as being the only point throughout an extent of coast equal to the distance between Paris and St. Petersburg, where it is possible to rely upon obtaining sweet water at all seasons of the year. In spite of its advantages in this respect, the surrounding country is very barren. Monsieur Boulanger, in his journal, says, The aspect of the country inland at this point is perfectly horrible. Even birds are scarce. It is a silent desert. In one of the recesses of this bay, known as Oyster Harbour, a naturalist named Monsieur Faure discovered a large river named after the French, the mouth of which was as wide as the Seine at Paris. He undertook to ascend it, and thus penetrated as far as possible into the interior of the country. About two leagues from the entrance of the river, his further progress was arrested by two embankments, solidly constructed of stones, connected with a small island, and forming an impassable obstacle. This barrier was pierced by several openings, most of them above the low tide level, and much wider upon the side facing the sea than upon the other. By these openings the fish which entered the river at high tide could easily pass through, but could not return, and were consequently imprisoned in a sort of reservoir, where the natives could catch them at their leisure. Monsieur Faure found no less than five of these erections in the space of less than a third of a mile, a most singular proof of the ingenuity of the barbarous natives of the country, who, in other respects, appear upon the level of brutes. In King George's Harbour, one of the officers attached to the géographe, named Monsieur Ransonnet, more fortunate than Vancouver and D'Entrecasteaux, had an interview with the natives, this was the first time a European had been able to approach them. Monsieur Razonnet says, We had scarcely appeared when eight natives, who, upon our first appearance on the coast, had vainly called to us by cries and gestures, appeared suddenly together. After a while, three of them, who were no doubt women, went away again. The remaining five, first throwing their assegais to a distance to convince us, probably, of their pacific intentions, assisted us in landing at my suggestion the sailors offered them various presents which they received with an air of satisfaction but without enthusiasm whether from apathy or as a mark of confidence they returned the presents to us with a pleased expression and upon our once more presenting them with the same things they left them upon the ground or surrounding rocks they were accompanied by many large and handsome dogs I did all I could to induce them to part with one. I offered them all I had, but their refusal was persistent. They probably employed them in hunting the kangaroo, which, with the fish that I had seen them pierce with their assegais, formed their staple food. They drank some coffee, and ate some salt beef and biscuits, but refused the bacon we offered, and left it behind them upon the stones without touching it. These natives are tall, thin, and very active. They have long hair, black eyebrows, short, flat noses, sunken eyes, large mouths with projecting lips, and fine and very white teeth. The inside of their mouths seemed as black as the outside of their bodies. The three who appeared the oldest among them, and who might have been from forty to fifty years of age, had large black beards. Their teeth appeared to have been filed, 
and the cartilage of the nose pierced their hair was trimmed and curled naturally the other two whose ages we took to be from sixteen to eighteen were not tattooed at all their long hair was gathered into a chignon powdered with red dust similar to that which the elder ones had rubbed over their bodies they were all naked and wore no ornament excepting a large waistband composed of a number of small fringed strips of kangaroo skin they talked volubly and sang in snatches but always in the same key and accompanied their song with the same gestures in spite of the friendly feeling which continued to exist between us they never allowed us to approach the spot where the other natives probably their wives were hidden after a stay of twelve days in king george's harbour the explorers again put to sea they rectified and completed the maps drawn by d'entrecasteaux and vancouver of lesson edal and endrant islands which were in turn visited and surveyed between the seventh and the twenty sixth of march thence bodan proceeded to dewitt land which was almost unknown when he visited it the first time he hoped to succeed better than dewitt viannan dampier and st alouan who had all been unsuccessful in their efforts to explore it but the breakers reefs and sandbanks rendered navigation extremely perilous a new source of danger shortly afterwards arose in the singular illusion of the mirage the effect says the narrative was to make the geographe appear to be surrounded by reefs although at the time she was a full league away from them and every one on board the casuarina imagined her to be in the most imminent danger only when it became too exaggerated to be real was the magic of the illusion dispelled upon the third of may the two vessels once more cast anchor in coupang port timor island one month later after revictualling captain bodan set sail for dewitt land where he now hoped to find the winds favorable for an advance to the east from thence he proceeded to mauritius where he died upon the sixteenth of september eighteen o three it appears probable that the precarious state of his health had some influence upon his conduct of this expedition and possibly his staff would have had less reason to complain of him if he had been in full possession of all his faculties this however is a question for psychologists to decide the geographe entered lorient roadstead upon the twenty third of march and three days later the vast collection of natural curiosities was landed the narrative says besides an immense number of cases containing minerals dried plants fish reptiles and zoophytes preserved in brandy stuffed or dissected quadrupeds and birds we had seventy large cases filled with vegetables in their natural state comprising nearly two hundred species of useful plants and about six hundred varieties of seed in addition to all this at least a hundred living animals we cannot better complete our account of the results of this expedition than by giving an extract from the report laid before the government by the institute relating more particularly to the zoological collection made by Messrs. Perron and Lusseur. Quote, it comprises more than a hundred thousand specimens of large and small animals. Many important new species are already recognized, and there still remain, according to the statement made by the professor at the museum, upwards of two thousand five hundred to be classified. Unquote. When we reflect that Cook's second voyage, the most successful undertaken up to this period, had produced only 250 specimens, that the united voyages of Carteret, Wallace, Furneaux, Mears, and even Vancouver had not accumulated so many, and when we admit that the same statement applies to all succeeding French expeditions, it is evident that Messrs. Perron and Lusseur introduced more new animals to europe than any other modern travelers put together moreover the geographical and hydrographical results were considerable the english government has always refused to acknowledge them and desborough cooley in his history of voyages subordinates bodin's discoveries to those of flinders 
it was even suggested that flinders was detained prisoner at mauritius for six years and a half in order to allow french authors time to consult his maps and arrange the details of their voyages accordingly this accusation is too absurd to need refutation the two navigators french and english have each fairly earned a place in the history of the discovery of the australian coasts and it is unnecessary to praise one at the expense of the other in the preface to the second edition of his voyage de la corvette australis which was revised and corrected by louis de freycinet peron has given each his due meed of praise and to his able work we refer all readers who are interested in the question End of section 36section 37 of celebrated travels and travelers volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by piotr natter celebrated travels and travelers volume 2 great navigators of the 18th century by jules verne second part chapter 2 african explorers a Shaw in Algeria and Tunis, Horneman in Fezzan, Adamson at Senegal, Houghton in Senegambia, Mungo Park and his two voyages to the Joliba or Niger, Sego, Timbuktu, Sparman and Lavaillon at the Cape, at Natal and in the interior, La Cerda in Mozambique and at Cazembe, Bruce in Abyssinia, Sources of the Blue Nile, Tsana Lake, Brown's Journey in Darfur, an Englishman named Thomas Shaw, a chaplain in Algeria, had profited by his twelve years' stay in Barbary to gather together a rich collection of natural curiosities, medals, inscriptions, and various objects of interest. Although he himself never visited the southern portions of Algeria, he availed himself of the facts he was able to obtain from well-informed travellers, who imparted to him a mass of information concerning the little-known and scarcely visited country. He published a book in two large quattro volumes, which embraced the whole of ancient Numidia. It was rather the work of a learned man than an account of a traveller, and it must be admitted that the learning is occasionally ill-directed. But in spite of its shortcomings as a geographical history, it had a large value at the time of its publication, and no one could have been better situated than Shaw for collecting such an enormous mass of material. The following extract may give an idea of the style of the work. The chief manufacture of the Kabyles and Arabs is the making of hikes, as they call their blankets. The women alone are employed in this work. Like Andromache and Penelope of old, they do not use the shuttle, but weave every thread of the woof with the fingers. The usual size of a hike is six yard long and five or six feet broad, serving the Kabyle and Arab as a complete dress during the day and as a covering for the bed at night. It is a loose but troublesome garment, as it is often disarranged and slips down, so that the person who wears it is every moment obliged to tuck it up and rearrange it this shows the great use there is of a girdle whenever men are in active employment and explains the force of the scripture injunction of having our loins girdled the method of wearing this garment with the use it is at times put to as bed covering makes it probable that it is similar to if not identical with the peplus of the ancients it is likewise probable that the loose garment flung over the shoulder the toga of the romance was of this kind as the drapery of statues is arranged very much in the same manner as the arab hike it is unnecessary to linger over this work which has little interest for us we shall do better to turn our attention to the journey of frederick conrad horneman to fezzan this young german offered his services to the african society of london and having satisfied the authorities of his knowledge of medicine and acquaintance with the arabic language he was engaged and furnished with letters of introduction safe conducts and unlimited credit leaving london in july seventeen ninety seven he went first to paris lalande introduced him to the institute and presented him with his memoirs sur l'afrique and broussonnet gave him an introduction to a turk from whom he obtained letters of recommendation to certain cairo merchants who carried on business in the interior of africa 
During his stay at Cairo, Horneman devoted himself to perfecting his knowledge of Arabic and studying the manners and customs of the natives. We must not omit to mention that the traveller had been presented by Monge and Bertolette to Napoleon Bonaparte, who was then in command of the French forces in Egypt. From him he received a cordial welcome, and Bonaparte placed all the resources of the country at his service. As the safer method of travelling, Horneman resolved to disguise himself as a Mahomedan merchant. He quickly learned a few prayers, and adopted a style of dress likely to impose upon unsuspecting people. He then started, accompanied by a fellow countryman named Josef Frendenburg, who had been a Mussulman for more than twelve years, had already made three pilgrimages to Mecca, and was perfectly familiar with the various Turkish and Arabic dialects. He was to act as Horneman's interpreter. On the 5th of September, 1798, the traveller left Cairo with a caravan, and visited the famous oasis of Jupiter Ammon, or Siwa, situated in the desert on the east of Egypt. It is a small independent state, which acknowledges the sultan, but is exempt from paying tribute. The town of Siwa is surrounded by several villages, at a distance of a mile or two. It is built upon a rock, in which the inhabitants have hollowed recesses for their dwellings. The streets are so narrow and intricate that a stranger cannot possibly find his way among them. The oasis is of considerable extent. The most fertile portion comprises a well-watered valley, about fifty miles in circumference, which is productive of corn and edible vegetables. Dates of an excellent flavour are its most valuable export. Horneman was anxious to explore some ruins which he had noticed, for he could obtain little information from the natives. But every time he penetrated to any distance in the ruins, he was followed by a number of the inhabitants who prevented him from examining anything in detail. One of the Arabs said to him, You must still be a Christian at heart, or you would not so often visit the works of the infidels. This remark put a speedy end to Horneman's further explorations. As far as his superficial examination enabled him to judge, it was really the oasis of Ammon, and the ruins appeared to him to be of Egyptian origin. The immense number of catacombs in the neighbourhood of the town, especially on the hill overlooking it, indicate a dense population in ancient times. The traveller endeavoured vainly to obtain a perfect head from one of these burial places. Amongst the skulls he procured, he found no certain proof that they had been filled with resin. He met with many fragments of clothing, but they were all in such a state of decay that it was impossible to decide upon their origin or use. After a stay of eight days in this place, Horneman crossed the mountains which surrounded the oasis of Siwa and directed his steps towards Shiata. So far no misfortune had interrupted his progress, but at Shiata he was denounced as a Christian and a spy. Horneman cleverly saved his life by boldly reading out a passage in the Koran which he had in his possession. Unfortunately, his interpreter, expecting that his baggage would be searched, had burned the collection of fragments of mummies, the botanical specimens, the journal containing the account of the journey, and all the books. This loss was quite irreparable. A little further on, the caravan reached Augila a town mentioned by Herodotus, who places it some ten days' journey from the oasis of Ammon. This accords with the testimony given by Horneman, who reached it in nine days' forced march. At Augila a number of merchants from Benghazi, Merote, and Mokamba had joined the caravan, amounting altogether to no less than a hundred and twenty persons. After a long journey over a sandy desert, the caravan entered a country interspersed with hills and ravines, where they found trees and grass at intervals. This was the desert of Haruch. It was necessary to cross it in order to reach Temisa, a town of little note built on a hill and surrounded by a wall. At Zuila the Fezan country was entered. The usual ceremonies, with interminable compliments and congratulations, were repeated at the entrance to every town. The Arabs appear to lay great stress upon these salutations, little trustworthy as they are, and travellers constantly express surprise at their frequent recurrence. Upon the 17th of November, the caravan halted at Murzuk, the capital of Fezzan. It was the end of the journey. Horneman says that the greatest length of the cultivated portion of Fezzan is about 300 miles from north to south, 
but to this must be added the mountainous region of haruch on the east and the various deserts north and west the climate is never pleasant in summer the heat is terrible and when the wind blows from the south it is all but insupportable even to the natives and in winter the north wind is so cold that they are obliged to have recourse to fires the produce of the country consists principally of dates and vegetables murzuk is the chief market there are collected the products of cairo bengazi tripoli gadames gat and the sudan among the articles of commerce are male and female slaves ostrich feathers skins of wild beasts and gold dust or nuggets bornu produces copper cairo silks calicoes woolen garments imitation coral bracelets and indian manufactures firearms sabres and knives are imported by the merchants of tripoli and gadames the fezzan country is ruled by a sultan descended from the sheriffs whose power is limitless but who nevertheless pays a tribute of four thousand dollars to the bay of tripoli Horneman, without giving the grounds of his calculation, informs us that the population amounts to 75,000 inhabitants, all of whom profess Mahomedanism. Horneman's narrative gives a few more details of the manners and customs of the people. He ends his report to the African society by saying that he proposes visiting Fezan again in the hope of obtaining new facts. We learn, further, that Frendenburg, Horneman's faithful associate, died at Murzuk attacked by a violent fever horneman was forced to remain much longer than he desired in that town while still only partially recovered he went to tripoli for change and rest hoping there to meet with europeans upon the first of december seventeen ninety nine he returned to murzuk and left it finally with a caravan upon the seventh of april eighteen hundred he was irresistibly attracted towards bornu and perished in that country which was to claim so many victims during the eighteenth century africa was literally besieged by travellers explorers endeavoured to penetrate into it from every side more than one succeeded in reaching the interior only to meet with repulse or death the discovery of the secrets of this mysterious continent was reserved for our own age when the unexpected fertility of its resources has astonished the civilized world the facts relating to the coast of senegal needed confirmation but the french superiority was no longer undisputed the english with their earnest and enterprising character were convinced of its importance in the development of their commerce and determined upon its exploration but before proceeding to the narrative of the adventures of major houghton and mango park we will devote a small space to the record of the work done by the french naturalist michel adanson devoted from early youth to the study of natural history adanson wished to become famous by the discovery of new species it was hopeless to dream of obtaining them in europe and in spite of oppression adanson selected senegal as the field of his labours he says in a manuscript letter that he chose it because it was the most difficult to explore of all european settlements and being the hottest most unhealthy and most dangerous was the least known by naturalists certainly a choice founded upon such reasoning gave proof of rare courage and ambition it is true that adanson was by no means the first naturalist to encounter similar dangers but he was the first to undertake them with so much enthusiasm at his own cost and without hope of reward upon his return he had not sufficient money to pay for the publication of his account of the discoveries he had made embarking upon the third of march seventeen forty nine on board the chevalier marine commanded by dapre de manevillette he touched at santa cruz tenerife and disembarked at the mouth of the senegal which he took to be the niger of ancient geographers during nearly five years he was engaged in exploring the colony in every direction visiting in turn podor portudal albreda and the mouth of the gambia with unceasing perseverance he collected a rich harvest of facts in the animal vegetable and mineral kingdoms to him is due the first exact account of a gigantic tree called the baobab which is often called adansonia after him of the habits of the grasshoppers which form the chief food of certain wild tribes of the white ants and the dwellings they construct and of certain kinds of oyster which attach themselves to trees at the mouth of the gambia he says the natives have not the difficulty one might anticipate in catching them they simply cut off the bough to which they cling 
they often cluster to the number of over two hundred on one branch and if there are several branches they form a bunch of oysters such as a man could scarcely carry in spite of the interest of these and similar discoveries there are few new facts for the geographer to glean a few words about the yolofs and mandingos comprise all there is to learn if we followed adanson throughout his explorations we should gain little fresh information the same cannot be said of the expedition of which we are about to give some account major houghton captain in the sixty ninth regiment and english governor of the fort of gori had been familiar from his youth part of which was passed with the english embassy in morocco with the manners and customs of the moors and the negroes of senegambia in seventeen ninety he proposed to the african society to explore the course of the niger penetrate as far as timbuktu and hussa and return by way of the sahara the carrying out of this bold plan met with but one obstacle but that was almost sufficient to upset it houghton left england upon the sixteenth of october seventeen ninety and anchored in Gillifree harbour at the mouth of the gambia upon the tenth of november well received by the king of barra he followed the course of the gambia to a distance of three hundred leagues traversed the remainder of senegambia and reached gonda conda in yanvi Wachnir, in his history of voyages says he purchased a negro a horse and five asses and prepared to proceed with the merchandise which was to pay his expenses to mendana the capital of the little kingdom of wuli fortunately his slight knowledge of the mandingo language enabled him to understand a negress who was speaking of a plot against him the merchants trading on the river imagining commerce to be his sole objective and fearing that he might compete with them had determined upon his death in order to avoid the threatened danger he thought it wise to deviate from the usual route and accordingly crossed the river with his asses and reached the northern shore in the kingdom of cantor houghton then crossed the river a second time and entered the kingdom of wuli he at once sent a messenger to the king bearing presents and asking for protection he was cordially received and the traveller was welcomed to mendana the capital which he describes as an important town situated in the midst of a fertile country in which many herds of cattle graze houghton was justified in anticipating a successful issue to his voyage everything appeared to presage it when an event occurred which was the first blow to his hopes a hut next to that in which he slept took fire and the whole town was soon in flames his interpreter who had made several attempts to rob him seized this opportunity and fled with a horse and three asses still the king of wuli continued his protection of the traveller and loaded him with presents precious not on account of their value but as signs of the good will which they demonstrated this friend of europeans was named jata humane intelligent and good-hearted he wished the english to establish a factory in his kingdom houghton in a letter to his wife says captain littleton during a stay of four years here has amassed a considerable fortune he possesses several ships which trade up and down the river at any time one can obtain for the merest trifle gold ivory wax and slaves poultry sheep eggs butter milk honey and fish are extremely abundant and for ten pounds sterling a large family might be maintained in luxury the soil is dry the air very healthy and the king of wuli told me that no white man had ever died at fataconda houghton then followed the faleme river as far as kakuyo which in downville's map is called kakulon and whilst in bambuk gleaned a few facts about the joliba river which runs through the interior of the sudan the direction of this river he ascertained to be southward as far as jenne then west by east to timbuktu facts which were later confirmed by mungo park the traveller was cordially received by the king of bambuk who provided him with a guide to timbuktu and with cowries to pay his expenses during the journey it was hoped that houghton would reach the niger without accident when a note written in pencil and healthy faced reached dr laidley it was dated from simbik and stated that the traveller had been robbed of his baggage but that he was prosecuting his journey to timbuktu this was followed by accounts from various sources which gave rise to a suspicion that houghton had been assassinated in bambara his fate was uncertain until it was discovered by mungo park wachnir says 
Simbing, where Houghton wrote the last words ever received from him, is a little walled town on the frontier of the kingdom of Ludamar. Here he was abandoned by his negro servants, who were unwilling to accompany him to the country of the Moors. Still he continued his route, and after surmounting many obstacles, he advanced to the north, and endeavoured to cross the kingdom of Ludamar. Finally he reached Yauri, and made the acquaintance of several merchants, on their way to sell salt at Tishet, a town situated near the marshes of the great desert, and six days' journey north of Yauri. Then, by bribing the merchants with a gun and a little tobacco, he persuaded them to conduct him to Tishet. All this would lead us to suppose that the Moors deceived him, either as to the route he should have followed, or as to the state of the country between Yauri and Timbuktu. After today's march, Houghton, finding himself deceived, wished to return to Yauri. The Moors robbed him of all he possessed and fled. He was forced to reach Yauri on foot. Did he die of hunger, or was he assassinated by the Moors? This has never been rightly determined, but the spot where he perished was pointed out to Mungo Park. End of section 37《Section 38 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 2. African Explorers. B the loss of houghton's journals containing the observations made during his journey deprived science of the result of all his fatigue and devotion to ascertain what he accomplished one must have recourse to the proceedings of the african society at this time mungo park a young scottish surgeon who had just returned from a voyage to the east indies on board of the worcester learned that the african society were anxious to find an explorer willing to penetrate to the interior of the country watered by the gambia mungo park who had long wished to acquaint himself with the productions of the country and the manners and customs of the inhabitants offered his services he was not deterred by the apprehensions that his predecessor houghton had probably perished at once accepted by the society mungo park hastened his preparations and left portsmouth upon the twenty second of may seventeen ninety five he was furnished with introductions to Dr. Laidley and a credit of two hundred pounds sterling. Landing at Gillifrey, at the mouth of the Gambia, in the kingdom of Barra, and following the river, he reached Pisania, an English factory belonging to Dr. Laidley. He directed his attention first to acquiring a knowledge of the Mandingo language, which was most generally used, and in collecting the facts most likely to be useful in the execution of his plans. His stay here enabled him to obtain more accurate information than his predecessors with regard to the Felups, the Yolofs, the Fulachs, and the Mandingos. The Felups are morose, quarrelsome, and vindictive, but faithful and courageous. The Yolofs are a powerful and warlike nation, with very black skins. Except in color and speech, they resemble the Mandingos, who are gentle and sociable tall and well-made their women are comparatively speaking pretty lastly the fulas who are the lightest in color seem much attached to a pastoral and agricultural life the greater part of these populations are mahomedans and practice polygamy upon the second of december mungo park accompanied by two negro interpreters and with a small quantity of baggage started for the interior he first reached the small kingdom of Wuli the capital of which medina comprises a thousand houses he then proceeded to color a considerable town and after two days march across the desert entered the kingdom of bondu the natives are fulas professing the mahomedan religion they carry on a brisk trade in ivory when they are not engaged in agriculture the traveller soon reached the faleme river the bed of which near its source in the mountain of dalaba is very auriferous he was received by the king at fataconda the capital of bondu and had great difficulty in convincing him that he travelled from curiosity his interview with the wives of the monarch is thus described mango park says 
i had scarcely entered the court when i was surrounded by the entire seraglio some begged me for physique some for amber and all were most desirous of trying the great african specific of bloodletting they are ten or twelve in number most of them young and handsome wearing on their heads ornaments of gold or pieces of amber they rallied me a good deal upon different subjects particularly upon the whiteness of my skin and the length of my nose they insisted that both were artificial the first they said was produced when i was an infant by dipping me in milk and they insisted that my nose has been pinched every day till it had acquired its present unsightly and unnatural conformation leaving bondu by the north mungo park entered kajaga called by the french galam the climate of this picturesque country watered by the senegal is far healthier than that of districts nearer the coast the natives call themselves seraoulis and are called seracolettes by the french the colour of their skin is jet black and in this respect they are scarcely distinguishable from the yolofs mungo park says the serawulis are habitually a trading people they formerly carried on a great commerce with the french in gold dust and slaves and still often supply the british factories on the gambia with slaves they are famous for the skill and honesty with which they do business at joak mungo park was relieved of half his property by the envoys of the king under pretence of making him pay for the right to pass through his kingdom fortunately for him the nephew of demba jagojalla king of kasson who was about to return to his country took him under his protection they reached gongadi where there are extensive date plantations together and thence proceeded to samia on the shores of the senegal on the frontiers of kasson the first town met with in this kingdom was that of tc which was reached by mungo park on the thirty first of december well received by the natives who sold him the provisions he needed at a reasonable price the traveller was subjected by the brother and nephew of the king to endless indignities leaving this town upon the tenth of january seventeen ninety six mungo park reached kunyakari the capital of kasson a fertile rich and well-populated country which can place forty thousand men under arms the king full of kindly feeling for the traveller wished him to remain in his kingdom as long as the wars between kasson and kajaga lasted it was more than probable that the countries of karta and bambara which mango park wished to visit would be drawn into it the advice of the king to remain was prudent and park had soon reason enough to regret not having followed it but impatient to reach the interior the traveller would not listen and entered the level and sandy plains of karta he met crowds of natives on the journey who were flying to kasson to escape the horrors of war but even this did not deter him he continued his journey until he reached the capital of karta which is situated in a fertile and open plain he was kindly received by the king daisy kurabari who endeavoured to dissuade him from entering Gubambara, and finding all his arguments useless advised him to avoid passing through the midst of the fray by entering the kingdom of ludamar inhabited by moors from thence he could proceed to bambara during his journey mungo park noticed negroes who fed principally upon a sort of bread made from the berries of the lotus which tasted not unlike gingerbread this plant the ramnus lotus is indigenous in senegambia nigritia and tunis so says mungo park there can be little doubt of this fruit being the lotus mentioned by pliny as the food of the libyan lotophagi i have tasted lotus bread and think that an army may very easily have been fed with it as is said by pliny to have been done in libya the taste of the bread is so sweet and agreeable that the soldiers would not be likely to complain of it on the twenty second of february mungo park reached jara a considerable town with houses built of stone inhabited by negroes from the south who had placed themselves under the protection of the moors to whom they paid considerable tribute from ali king of ludamar the traveller obtained permission to travel in safety through his dominions but in spite of this safe conduct park was almost entirely despoiled by the fanatical moors of jenne at sampaka and dalli large towns and at samea a small village pleasantly situated he was so cordially welcomed that he already saw himself in fancy arrived in the interior of africa when a troop of soldiers appeared who led him to benown the camp of king ali 
ali says mungo park was sitting upon a black morocco cushion clipping a few hairs on his upper lip a female attendant holding a looking-glass before him he was an old man of arab race with a long white beard and he looked sullen and angry he surveyed me with attention and inquired of the moors if i could speak arabic being answered in the negative he appeared surprised and continued silent the surrounding attendants and especially ladies were much more inquisitive they asked a thousand questions inspected every part of my apparel searched my pockets and obliged me to unbutton my waistcoat to display the whiteness of my skin they even counted my toes and fingers as if they doubted whether i was in truth a human being as unprotected stranger a christian and accounted a spy mungo park was a victim to the insolence ferocity and fanaticism of the moors he was spared neither insults outrages nor blows they attempted to make a barber of him but his awkwardness in cutting the hairy face of the king's son exempted him from this degrading occupation during his captivity he collected many particulars regarding timbuktu which is so difficult of access to europeans and was the bourne of all early african explorers hausa the sheriff told him is the largest town i have ever seen wallet is larger than timbuktu but as it is farther from the niger and its principal trade is in salt few strangers are met there from benown to wallet is a distance of six days journey no important town is passed between the two and the traveller depends for sustenance upon the milk procurable from arabs whose flocks and herds graze about the wells and springs the road leads for two days through a sandy desert where not a drop of water is to be had it takes eleven days to go from wallet to timbuktu but water is not so scarce on this journey which is generally made upon oxen at timbuktu there are a number of jews who speak arabic and use the same forms of prayer as the moors the events of the war decided ali to proceed to jara mungo park who had succeeded in making friends with the sultan's favorite fatima obtained permission to accompany the king the traveller hoped by nearing the scene of action to manage to escape as it happened the king of karta daisy kurabari soon after marched against the town of jara the larger number of inhabitants fled and mungo park did the same he soon found means to get away but his interpreter refused to accompany him he was forced to start for bambara alone and destitute of resources the first town he came to was waura which properly belongs to karta but was then paying tribute to mansong king of bambara mungo park says upon the morning of the seventh of july as i was about to depart my landlord with a great deal of diffidence begged me to give him a lock of my hair he had been told he said that white man's hair made a sapphic talisman that would give the possessor all the knowledge of the white man i had never before heard of so simple a mode of education but i at once complied with the request and my landlord's thirst for learning was so great that he cut and pulled at my hair till he had cropped one side of my head pretty closely and would have done the same with the other had i not signified my disapprobation assuring him that i wished to reserve some of this precious material for a future occasion first galon and then murja a large town famous for its trade in salt were passed after fatigues and incredible privations upon nearing sego mungo park at last perceived the joliba looking forward he says i saw with infinite pleasure the great object of my mission the long sought for majestic niger glittering in the morning sun as broad as the thames at westminster and flowing slowly to the eastward i hastened to the brink and having drunk of the water lifted up my fervent thanks in prayer to the great ruler of all things for having thus far crowned my endeavours with success the fact of the niger flowing towards the east did not however excite my surprise for although i had left europe in great hesitation on this subject and rather believed it ran in the contrary direction i had made frequent inquiries during my progress and had received from negroes of different nations such clear and decisive assurances that its course was towards the rising sun as scarce left any doubt in my mind more especially as i knew that major houghton had collected similar information in a similar manner sego the capital of bambara at which i had now arrived consists properly speaking of four distinct towns two on the northern bank of the river 
called sego corro and sego bu and two on the southern bank called sego so corro and sego si corro they are all surrounded with high mud walls the houses are built of clay of a square form with flat roofs some of them have two stories and many of them are whitewashed besides these buildings moorish mosques are seen in every quarter and the streets though narrow are broad enough for every practical purpose in a country where wheel carriages are unknown from the best information i could obtain i have reasons to believe that sego contains altogether about thirty thousand inhabitants the king of bambara resides permanently at sego se corro he employs a great many slaves in conveying people over the river and the money they take though the fare is only ten cowries for each person furnishes a considerable revenue to the king in the course of a year by advice of the moors the king refused to receive the traveller and forbade him to remain in his capital where he could not have protected him from ill-treatment however to divest his refusal of all appearance of ill-will he sent him a bag containing five thousand cowries of the value of about a pound sterling to buy provisions the messenger sent by the king was to serve as guide as far as sasanding protest and anger were alike impossible mango park could do nothing but follow the orders sent before reaching sansanding he was present at the harvest of vegetable butter which is the produce of a tree called shia these trees says the narrative grow in great abundance all over this part of bambara they are not planted by the natives but are found growing naturally in the woods and in clearing land for cultivation every tree is cut down but the shia the tree itself very much resembles the american oak the fruit from the kernel of which after it has been dried in the sun the butter is prepared by boiling in water has somewhat the appearance of a spanish olive the kernel is embedded in a sweet pulp under a thin green rind and the butter produced from it besides the advantages of keeping a whole year without salt is whiter firmer and to my palate of a richer flavour than the best butter i ever tasted from cow's milk it is a chief article of the inland commerce of these districts Sansanding, a town containing from eight to ten thousand inhabitants is a market-place much frequented by the moors who bring glassware from the mediterranean forts which they exchange for gold dust and cotton mango park was not able to remain at this place for the importunities of the natives and the perfidious insinuations of the moors warned him to continue his journey his horse was so worn out by the fatigue and privation that he felt obliged to embark on the river joliba or niger at murzan a fishing village upon the northern bank of the river everything combined to induce park to relinquish his enterprise the further he advanced to the eastward down the river the more he placed himself in the power of the moors the rainy season had commenced and it would soon be impossible to travel otherwise than by boat mango park was now so poor that he could not even hire a boat he was forced to rely upon public charity to advance further under these circumstances was not only to risk his life but to place the results of all his fatigues and efforts in jeopardy to return to gambia was scarcely less perilous to do so he must traverse hundreds of miles on foot through hostile countries still the hope of returning home might sustain his courage before leaving silla says the traveller i thought it incumbent on me to collect from the moorish and the negro traders all the information i could concerning the further course of the niger eastwards and the situation and extent of the kingdoms in its neighbourhood two days journey eastward of sila is the town of jeneh which is situated on a small island in the river and is said to contain as many inhabitants as sego itself or any other town in bambara at a distance of two days more the river widens and forms a considerable lake called dibi or the dark lake concerning the extent of which all i could learn was that in crossing it from east to west the canoes lose sight of land for one whole day from this lake the water issues in many different streams which finally become two branches one flowing to the northeast the other to the east but these branches join at cabra which is one day's journey to the south of timbuktu and is the port or shipping place of that city the tract of land between the two streams is called timballa and is inhabited by negroes the whole distance by land from jeneh to timbuktu is twelve days journey 
northeast of masena is the kingdom of timbuktu the great object of european research the capital of the kingdom being one of the principal marts for the extensive commerce which the moors carry on with the negroes the hope of acquiring wealth in this pursuit and zeal for propagating their religion have filled this extensive city with moors the king himself and all the chief officers of this country are moors and are said to be more intolerant and severe in their principles than any other of the moorish tribes in this part of africa mungo park was then forced to retrace his steps and that through a country devastated by inundation and heavy rains he passed through murzan kea and mobidon where he regained his horse niara sasanding sanea and sai which is surrounded by a deep moat and protected by high walls with square towers jabea a large town from which he perceived high mountain ranges and taffara where he was received with little hospitality at the village of soha park begged a handful of grain of a duty who answered that he had nothing to give away whilst i was examining the face of this inhospitable old man and endeavouring to find out the cause of this sullen discontent which was visible in his eye he called to a slave who was working in the cornfield at a little distance and ordered him to bring his spade with him the duty then told him to dig a hole in the ground pointing to a spot at no great distance the slave with his spade began to dig in the earth and the duty who appeared to be a man of very fretful disposition kept muttering to himself until the pit was almost finished when he repeatedly pronounced the word ankatod good for nothing jankra lemon a regular plague which expressions i thought applied to myself as the pit had very much the appearance of a grave i thought it prudent to mount my horse and was about to decamp when the slave who had gone before to the village returned with the corpse of a boy about nine or ten years of age quite naked the negro carried the body by an arm and leg and threw it into the pit with a savage indifference which i had never seen as he covered the body with earth the duty kept repeating napula at temata money lost whence i concluded the boy had been his slave End of section thirty eight section thirty nine of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by piotr nater celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter two african explorers c mungo park left calicurro where he had obtained food by writing safis or talismans for the natives upon the twenty second of august and reached bamakoa where a large salt market is held from an eminence near the town he perceived a high mountain range in the kingdom of kong whose ruler had a more numerous army than the king of bambara once more robbed by brigands of all he possessed the unfortunate traveller found himself in the rainy season alone in a vast desert five leagues from the nearest european settlement and for the moment gave way to despair but his courage soon revived and reaching the town of sibidulu his horse and clothes which had been stolen from him by fula robbers were restored to him by the mansa or chief kamalia or karfa taura advised him to await the cessation of the rainy season and then to proceed to gambia with a caravan of slaves worn out destitute attacked by fever which for five months kept him prostrate mungo park had no choice but to remain in his place upon the nineteenth of april the caravan set out we can readily imagine the joy experienced by mungo park when all was ready crossing the desert of jalonka and passing first the principal branch of the senegal river and then the faleme the caravan finally reached the shores of the gambia and on the twelfth of june seventeen ninety seven mungo park once more arrived at pisania where he was warmly welcomed by professor laidley who had despaired of ever seeing him again the traveller returned to england upon the twenty second of september so great was the impatience with which an account of his discoveries certainly the most important in this part of africa was awaited that the african society allowed him to publish for his own profit an abridged account of his adventures 
he had collected more facts as to geography manners and customs of the country than all preceding travellers he had determined the position of the sources of the senegal and gambia and surveyed the course of the niger or joliba which he proved to run eastwards whilst the gambia flowed to the west thus a point which up to this time had been disputed by geographers was finally settled it was no longer possible to confound the three rivers as the french geographer de lisle had done in seventeen o seven when he represented the niger as running eastwards from bornu and flowing into the river senegal on the west he himself however had admitted and corrected this error in the later maps of seventeen twenty two and seventeen twenty seven no doubt on account of the facts ascertained by andre brou governor of senegal houghton indeed had learned much from the natives of the course of the niger through the mandingo country and of the relative position of the sego jenne and timbuktu but it was reserved for mango park to fix positively from personal knowledge the position of the two first-named towns and to furnish circumstantial details of the country and the tribes who inhabit it public opinion was unanimous as to the importance of the great traveller's exploration and keenly appreciative of the courage skill and honesty exhibited by him a short time later the english government offered mango park the conduct of an expedition to the interior of australia but he refused it in eighteen o four however the african society determined to complete the survey of the niger and proposed to mango park the command of a new expedition for its exploration this time the great traveller did not refuse and upon the thirtieth of january eighteen o five he left england two months later he landed at goree he was accompanied by his brother-in-law anderson a surgeon by george scott a draughtsman and by thirty-five artillerymen he was authorized to enroll as many soldiers as he liked in his service and was provided with a credit of five hundred pounds these resources says Wachnier, so vast in comparison with those furnished by the african society were to our thinking partly the cause of his loss the rapacious demands of the african kings grew in proportion to the riches they supposed our traveller to possess and the effort to meet the enormous drain made upon him was in great part the cause of the catastrophe which brought the expedition to an end four carpenters one officer and thirty-five artillerymen and a mandingo merchant named isaac who was to act as guide with the leaders of the expedition already mentioned composed an imposing caravan mango park left cai upon the twenty seventh of april eighteen o five and reached pisania the next day from this place ten years earlier he had started upon his first exploration taking an easterly direction he followed his former route as far as bambaku upon the shores of the niger when he arrived at this place the number of europeans was already reduced to six soldiers and a carpenter the remainder had succumbed to fatigue or the fevers incidental to the inundations the exactions of the various petty chiefs through whose domain the expedition passed had considerably diminished the stock of merchandise mango park was now guilty of an act of grave imprudence remarking that trade was very active at san sanding a town containing eleven thousand inhabitants and that beads indigo antimony rings bracelets and other articles not likely to be spoiled in the transit to england were freely exhibited for sale he opened says Wachnier, a large shop which he stocked with european merchandise for sale wholesale or retail and probably the large profits he made excited the envy of the merchants the natives of jenne the moors and the merchants of san sanding joined with those of sego in offering in the presence of modibinne to give the king of mansong a larger and more valuable quantity of merchandise than he had received from the english traveller if he would seize his baggage and then kill him or send him out of bambara but in spite of his knowledge of this fact mango park still kept his shop open and he received as the proceeds of one single day's business twenty five thousand seven hundred and fifty six pieces of money or cowries upon the twenty eighth of october anderson expired after four months illness and mango park found himself once more alone in the heart of africa 
the king of mansong had accorded him permission to build a boat which would enable him to explore the niger naming his craft the joliba he fixed upon the sixteenth of november for his departure here his journal ends with details on the riverside populations and on the geography of the countries he was the first to discover this journal when it reached europe was published imperfect as it was as soon as the sad fact was realized that the writer had perished in the waters of the joliba it contained in reality no new discovery but it was recognized as useful to geographical science mango park had determined the astronomical position of the more important towns and thereby furnished material for a map of senegambia the perfecting of this map was entrusted to arrowsmith who stated in an advertisement that finding wide differences between the positions of the towns as shown in the journal by each day's travel and that furnished by the astronomical observations it was impossible to reconcile them but that in accordance with the latter he had been obliged to place the route followed by mango park in his first voyage further north it was reserved for the frenchman wachnir to discover a curious discrepancy in mango park's journal this was a singular error upon the part of the traveller which neither the english editor nor the french translator whose work was badly performed had discovered mango park in his diary records events as happening upon the thirty-first of april as every one knows that that month has only thirty days it followed that during the course of his journey the traveller had made a mistake of a whole day reckoning in his calculations from the evening instead of the morning hence important rectifications were necessary in arrowsmith's map but none the less when once mango park's error is recognized it is evident that to him we owe the first faithful map of senegambia although the facts that reached the english government allowed no room for doubt as to the fate of the traveller a rumour that white men had been seen in the interior of africa induced the governor of senegal to fit out an expedition the command was entrusted to the negro merchant isaac mango park's guide who had faithfully delivered the traveller's journal to the english authorities we need not linger over the account of this expedition but merely relate that which relates the last days of mango park at san sanding isaac encountered amadi fatuma the native who was with park on the joliba when he perished and from him he obtained the following recital we embarked at san sanding and in two days reached silla the spot where mango park completed his first journey after two days navigation we reached jenne in passing dibi three boats filled with negroes armed with lances and arrows but without firearms approached us we had passed successively ragbara and timbuktu when we were pursued by these boats which we repulsed with difficulty and only after killing several natives at guruma we were attacked by seven boats but succeeded in repulsing them constant skirmishes ensued with heavy loss to the blacks until we reached kaffo where we remained for a day we then proceeded down the river as far as karmus and anchored off gurnu next day we perceived a moorish detachment who allowed us to pass we then entered the country of hausa next day we reached yauri and sent amadi fatuma into the town with presents for the chief and to purchase food the negro before accepting the presents inquired if the white traveller intended to revisit his country mango park to whom the question was reported replied that he should never return it is supposed that these words brought about his death the negro chief once convinced that he should not see mango park again determined to keep the presents intended for his king meantime amadi fatuma reached the king's residence at some distance from the river the prince warned by the presence of the white men sent an army next day to the small village of bussa on the river side when the joliba appeared it was assailed by a shower of stones and arrows park threw his baggage into the river and jumped in with his companions all perished thus miserably died the first englishman who had navigated the joliba and visited timbuktu many efforts were made in the same direction but almost all were destined to fail at the end of the eighteenth century two of linnaeus's best pupils explored the south of africa in the interest of natural history sparman undertook the search for animals and thunberg for plants 
the account of sparman's expedition which as we have said was interrupted by his voyage in oceania after cook's expedition was the first to appear it was translated into french by la tournere in the preface which is still allowed to stand la tournere deplored the loss of the learned explorer who he said had died during a voyage to the gold coast just as the work was published sparman reappeared to the great astonishment of la tournere sparman had reached africa upon the thirtieth of april seventeen seventy two and landed at the cape of good hope at this time the town was only two miles across each way including the gardens and plantations adjoining it on one side the streets were wide planted with oaks and the houses were white or to sparman's surprise painted green his object in visiting the cape was to act as tutor to the children of m kerste but upon his arrival in cape town he found that his employer was absent at his winter residence in false bay when the spring came round sparman accompanied kerste to alpen a property which he possessed near constance the naturalist availed himself of the opportunity to make many excursions in the neighbourhood and attempt the somewhat dangerous ascent of the table mountain by these means he became acquainted with the manners and customs of the boors and their treatment of their slaves the violence of the latter was so great that the inhabitants of the town were obliged to sleep with locked doors and provided with firearms close at hand nearly all over the colony a rough hospitality ensured a certain welcome for the traveller sparman relates several curious experiences of his own i arrived one evening he says at the dwelling of a farmer named van der Spuy, a widower born in africa and father of the proprietor of the red constance or the old constance making believe not to see me approach he remained stationary in the entry of his house as i approached him he offered his hand still without attempting to come forward and said good day you're welcome how are you who are you a glass of wine perhaps or a pipe will you partake of something i answered his questions laconically and accepted his offers in the same style as they were offered his daughter a well-made girl of some fourteen or fifteen years of age brought in dinner which consisted of a fine breast of lamb stewed with carrots the meal over she offered me tea so pleasantly that i was quite puzzled whether to admire the dinner or my charming hostess the most both father and daughter showed the greatest kindness and good will i spoke to my host several times in hope of breaking his silence but his replies were brief and i observed that he only once commenced a conversation himself when he pressed me to remain overnight in his house i bid him farewell deeply impressed with his hospitality sparman undertook several similar expeditions among others one to hood bay and parle in which he had frequent occasion to notice the exaggerations to be met with in the narrative of kolbe his predecessor he intended to continue his explorations during the winter and projected a journey into the interior when the fine season should return when the frigates commanded by captain cook the resolution and adventure arrived at the cape forster invited the young swedish naturalist to accompany him and sparman was thus enabled to visit new zealand van diemen's land new holland otaheite tierra del fuego the antarctic regions and new georgia before his return to the cape where he landed on the twenty second of march seventeen seventy five his first care upon his return was to organize his expedition to the interior and in order to add to his available resources he practised medicine and surgery during the winter a cargo of corn medicine knives tinder boxes and spirits for the preservation of specimens was collected and packed in an immense wagon drawn by five yoke of oxen sparman says the conductor of this cart needs dexterity not only in his management of the animals but in the use of the whip of african drivers these instruments are about fifteen feet long with a thong of the same or greater length and a tongue of white leather almost three feet long the driver holds this formidable instrument in both hands and from his seat in front of the wagon can reach the foremost oxen with it he distributes his cuts unceasingly well understanding how and where to distribute them in such a manner that the hide of the animals feels the whip sparman was to accompany the wagon on horseback and was accompanied by a young colonist 
named Immelman, who wished to penetrate into the interior for recreation. They started upon the 25th of July, 1775. After passing Rent River, scaling the Hottentot Holland Kloof, and crossing the Palmite, they entered a desert country, interspersed with plains, mountains, and valleys, without water, but frequented by antelopes of various kinds, with zebras and ostriches. Sparman soon reached the warm mineral baths at the foot of the Zwartberg, which at that time were much frequented, the company having built a house near the mountains. At this point the explorer was joined by young Immelman, and together they started for Zfellendam, which they reached upon the 2nd of September. We will give a few of the facts they collected about the inhabitants. The Hottentots are as tall as Europeans, their hands and feet are small, and their color a brownish yellow. They have not the thick lips of the Kafirs and natives of Mozambique. Their hair is black and woolly, curly but not thick. They rub the entire body with fat and soot. A Hottentot who paints himself looks less naked and more complete, so to say, than one who only wraps himself with grease. Hence the saying, a Hottentot without paint is like a shoe without blacking. These natives usually wear a cloak called karos, made of sheep's skin, with the wool turned inwards. The women arrange it with a long point, which forms a sort of hood, in which they place their children. Both men and women wear leather rings upon their arms and legs, a custom which gave rise to the fable that this race rolled puddings round their limbs to feed on from time to time. They also wear copper and iron rings, but these ornaments are less common. The Kral, or Hottentot village, is a collection of huts in a circle, all very similar and of the shape of beehives. The doors, which are in the centre, are so low that they can only be entered on the knees. The hearth is in the middle of the hut, and the roof has no hole for the escape of the smoke. The Hottentots must not be confounded with the Bushmen. The latter live only for hunting and robbery. Their skill in throwing poisoned arrows, their courage, and the wildness of their lives render them invincible. At Zwellendam, Sparman saw the quagga, a species of horse like a zebra in shape, but with shorter ears. End of section 39「Section 40 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the 18th Century. By Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 2. African Explorers. D. The explorer next visited Mossel Bay, a harbour little used as it is too much exposed to the west winds, and thence he proceeded to the country of the Hutnikas, or, as Burchell's map calls them, the Antinikas. This woody country appeared fertile, and the colonists established there are prosperous. Sparman met with most of the quadrupeds of Africa in this district, such as elephants, leopards, lions, tiger cats, hyenas, monkeys, hares, antelopes, and gazelles. We will not attempt to follow Sparman to all the small settlements he visited. An enumeration of the streams, kraals, or villages he passed would convey no information to the reader. Rather, let us gather from his narratives a few curious and novel details concerning two creatures which he describes, the sheep of the Cape and the honey guide. When a sheep is to be killed, he says, the very leanest of the flock is selected. It would be impossible to use the others for food. Their tails are of a triangular shape, and are often a foot and a half long, and occasionally six inches thick in the upper part. One of these tails will weigh eight or twelve pounds, and they consist principally of delicate fat, which some persons eat with bread instead of butter. It is used in the preparation of food, and sometimes to make candles. After describing the two horned rhinoceros, hitherto unknown, the gnu, an animal in form something between the horse and the ox, the gazelle, the baboon, and the hippopotamus, the habits of which were previously imperfectly known, Sparman describes a curious bird of great service to the natives, which he calls the honey guide. 
this bird he says is remarkable neither in size nor color at first sight it would be taken for a common sparrow but it is a little larger than that bird of a somewhat lighter color with a small yellow spot on its shoulder and dashes of white in the wings and tail in its own interests this bird leads the natives to the bees nests for it is very fond of honey and it knows that whenever a nest is destroyed a little honey will be spilt or left behind as a recompense for its services it seems to grow hungry in the morning and evening in any case it is then that it leaves its nest and by its piercing cries attracts the attention of the hottentots or the colonists the cries are almost always answered by the appearance of natives or settlers when the bird repeating its call unceasingly slowly flies from place to place towards the spot where the bees have made their home arrived at the nest whether it be in the cleft of a rock in a hollow tree or in some underground cavity the guide hovers about it for a few seconds and then perches hard by and remains a silent and hidden spectator of the pillage in which he hopes subsequently to have its share of this phenomenon i have myself twice been a witness on the twelfth of april seventeen seventy six on his way back to the cape sparman heard that a large lake the only one in this colony had been discovered to the north of the schneuwberg district a little later the traveller got back to the cape and embarked for europe with the numerous natural history collections he had made about the same time between seventeen seventy two seventeen seventy five thunberg the swede whom sparman had met at the cape made three successive journeys in the interior of africa they were not any more than sparman's actual journeys of discovery and we owe the acquisition of no new geographical fact to thunberg he did but make a vast number of interesting observations on the birds of the cape and he also ascertained a few interesting details respecting the various races of the interior which turned out to be far more fertile than was at first supposed thunberg was followed in the same latitudes by an english officer lieutenant william patterson whose chief aim was to collect plants and other objects of natural history he penetrated a little further north than the orange river and into kafraria a good deal farther east than fish river to him we owe the first notice of the giraffe and his narrative is rich in important observations on the natural history structure and inhabitants of the country it is a curious fact that the europeans attracted to south africa by zeal for geographical discovery were far less numerous than those whose motive was love of natural history we have already mentioned sparman thunberg and patterson to this list we must now add the name of the ornithologist le vaillon born at paramaibo in dutch guiana of french parents who traded in birds le vaillon visited europe with them as a mere child and traversed holland germany lorraine and the vosges on his way to paris it will readily be understood that this wandering life awoke in him a taste for travelling and his passion for birds early excited by the examination of private and public collections made him eager to enrich science by descriptions and drawings of unknown species now what country would afford the richest ornithological harvest the districts near the cape had been explored by botanists and by a scientific man who had made quadrupeds his chief study but no one had as yet traversed them to collect birds Le Vaillant arrived at the cape on the twenty ninth of march seventeen eighty one after the loss of his vessel in an explosion with nothing but the clothes he wore ten ducats and his gun others would have been disheartened but le vaillant did not despair of extricating himself from his painful position confident in his skill with the gun and the bow in his strength and agility as well as in his skill in preparing the skins of animals and in stuffing birds so that their plumage should retain all their natural gloss the naturalist had soon opened relations with the wealthiest collectors of the cape one of these an official named burs provided le vaillant with every requisite for a successful journey including carts oxen provisions objects for barter and horses even servants and guides were appointed free of cost to the explorer the kind of researches to which le vaillant intended to devote himself influenced his mode of travelling instead of seeking frequented and beaten tracks he tried to avoid them 
and to penetrate into districts neglected by europeans hoping in them to meet with birds unknown to science as a result he may be said always to have taken nature by surprise coming in contact with natives whose manners had not yet been modified by intercourse with whites so that the information he gives us brings savage life as it really is more vividly before us than anything told us by his predecessors or successors the only mistake made by le vaillant was the entrusting of the translation of his notes to a young man who modified them to suit his own notions far from taking the scrupulous care to be exact which distinguishes modern editors he exaggerated facts and dwelling too much on the personal qualities of the traveller he gave to the narrative of the journey a boastful tone very prejudicial to it after three months stay at the cape and in its neighbourhood le vaillant started on the eighteenth of december seventeen eighty one for the first journey eastwards and in kafraria his equipment this time consisted of thirty oxen ten for each of his two wagons and ten as reserve three horses nine dogs and five hottentots le vaillant first crossed the dutch districts already explored by sparman where he met with vast herds of zebras antelopes and ostriches arriving in due course at zwellendam where he bought some oxen a cart and a cock the last serving as an alarm clock throughout the journey another animal was also of great use to him this was a monkey he had tamed and promoted to the post alike useful and honourable of taster no one being allowed to touch any fruit or root unknown to the hottentots until master rees had given his verdict upon it rees was also employed as a sentinel and his senses sharpened by use and the struggle for life exceeded in delicacy those of the most subtle redskin he it was who warned the dogs of the approach of danger if a snake approached or a troop of monkeys were disporting themselves in the neighbouring thicket rees's terror and his shrieks quickly revealed the presence of a disturbing element from zwellendam which he left on the twelfth of january seventeen eighty two le vaillant made his way eastwards at some little distance from the sea he pitched his camp on the banks of the columbia Duywenhock river and made many very successful hunting excursions in a district rich in game finally reaching mossel bay where the howls of innumerable hyenas frightened the oxen a little farther on he entered the country of the hutnikas a hottentot name signifying men filled with honey here not a step could be taken without coming upon swarms of bees flowers sprang up beneath the feet of the travellers the air was heavy with their perfume their varied colours lent such enchantment to the scene that some of the servants would have liked to halt le vaillant however hastened to press on the whole of this district down to the sea is occupied by colonists who breed cattle make butter cultivate timber and collect honey sending their merchandise to the cape for sale a little beyond the last post of the company le vaillant having entered a district peopled by thousands of turacos and other rare birds pitched his hunting camp but his plans were terribly upset by the continuous fall of heavy rains the result of which was to reduce the travellers to great straits for want of food after many a sudden change of fortune and many hunting adventures an account of which would be very amusing though beyond the scope of our narrative le vaillant reached mossel bay here with what delight we can easily imagine he found letters from france awaiting him one excursion after another was now made in various directions until kafraria was entered it was difficult to open relations with its people who sedulously avoided the whites having suffered the loss of many men and much cattle at their hands moreover the tambukis had taken advantage of their critical position to invade kafraria and commit numerous depredations whilst the bosjemont hunted them down unmercifully without firearms and attacked on so many sites at once the kaffirs were driven to hiding themselves and were retiring northwards as matters stood it was useless to attempt to penetrate into the mountainous districts of kafraria and le vaillant retracted his steps he then visited the schneuwberg mountains the karoo desert and the shores of the buffalo river returning to the cape on the second of april seventeen eighty three the results of this long campaign were important 
Le Vaillant obtained some decided information about the Gonacas, a numerous race which must not be confounded with the Hottentots properly so called, but are probably the offspring of their intermarriage with the Kaffirs. With regard to the Hottentots themselves, the information collected by Le Vaillant agrees on almost every point with that obtained by Sparman. The Kaffirs seen by Le Vaillant, said Wachnir, were most of them taller than either the Hottentots or the Gonacas. They have neither the retiring jaws nor prominent cheekbones which are so repulsive in the Hottentots, but are less noticeable in the Gonacas. Neither have they the broad flat faces or thick lips of their neighbors, the Negroes of Mozambique. Their faces, on the contrary, are round, their noses fairly prominent, and their teeth the whitest and most regular of any people in the world. Their complexion is of a clear dark brown, and, but for this one characteristic, says Le Vaillant, any Kaffir woman would be considered very pretty, even beside a European. During Le Vaillant's sixteen months of absence, the aspect of the Cape had completely changed. When the traveller left, he admired the modest bearing of the Dutch women. On his return, he found them thinking only of amusement and dress. Ostrich feathers were so much in vogue that they had to be imported from Europe and Asia. All those brought by our traveller were quickly bought up. The birds which he had sent to the colony on every possible opportunity now amounted to one thousand and twenty-four specimens, and Mr. Burr's house, where they were kept, were converted into a regular natural history museum. Le Vaillant's journey had been so successful that he could not but wish to begin another. Although his friend Burr's had returned to Europe, he was able, with the aid of the many other friends he had made, to collect the materials for a fresh trip. On the 15th of June, 1783, he started at the head of a caravan numbering 19 persons. He also took 13 dogs, one he and two she goats, three cows, 36 draught, and 14 reserve oxen, with two for carrying the baggage of the Hottentot servants. We shall not, of course, follow the traveller in his hunting excursions, all we need to know is that he succeeded in making a collection of marvellous birds, that he introduced the first giraffe to Europe, and that he traversed the whole of the vast space between the Tropic of Capricorn, on the west, and the 14th meridian on the east. He returned to the Cape in 1784, he embarked for Europe, and arrived at Paris early in January 1785. The first native people met with, by Le Vaillant, in his second voyage, were the little Namakas, a race but very little known, and who soon died out, the more readily that they occupied a barren country, subject to constant attacks from the Bosgemont. Although of fair height, they are inferior in appearance to the Kafirs and Namakwas, to whose customs theirs bear a great resemblance. The Kaminokwas, or Komeinakwas, of whom Le Vaillant gives many particulars, exceed them in height. He says, They appear taller even than the Gonakwas, although possibly they are not so in reality, but the illusion is sustained by their small bones, delicate and emaciated appearance, and slender limbs. The long mantle of light material which hangs from the shoulder to the ground adds to their height. They look like drawn-out men. Lighter in color than the Cape natives, they have better features than the other Hottentot tribes, owing to the fact that their noses are less flat and their cheekbones less prominent. Of all the races visited by Le Vaillant, the most peculiar and most ancient was that of the Husonanas, a tribe which had not been met with by any other northern traveller, but they appear identical with the Bechuanas, although the part of the country assigned to them does not coincide with that which they are known to have occupied for many years. The Husonanas, says the narrative, are small in stature, the tallest being scarcely five feet four in height. These small beings are perfectly proportioned, and are surprisingly strong and active. They have an imposing air of boldness. Le Vaillant considers them the best endowed mentally, and the strongest physically, of all the savage races he had met with. In face they resemble the Hottentots, but they have rounded chins, and they are far less black. They have curly hair, so short that Le Vaillant at first imagined it to be shaven. One striking peculiarity of the Husonanas is a large mass of flesh upon the back of the women, which forms a natural saddle, 
and oscillates strangely with every movement of the body le vaillant describes a woman whom he saw with her child about three years old who was perched upon his feet behind her like a footman behind a cabriolet we will pass over the traveller's description of the appearance and customs of these various races many of which are now extinct or incorporated in some more powerful tribe although by no means the least curious portion of his narrative the details are so exaggerated that we prefer to omit them upon the eastern coast of africa a portuguese traveller named francisco jose de la cerda y almeida left mozambique in seventeen ninety seven to explore the interior the account of this expedition to a place which has only lately been revisited would be of great interest but unfortunately so far as we know his journal has not been published his name is often quoted by geographers and they appear to know what countries he visited but in france at least no lengthened notice of this geographer exists which would furnish the details of his exploration a very few words will convey all that we have been able to collect of the history of a man who has made most important discoveries and whose name has most unfairly been forgotten la cerda the date and place of whose birth are unknown was an engineer and he was professionally engaged in settling the boundary of the frontier between the spanish and portuguese possessions in south america whilst thus employed he collected a mass of interesting particulars of the province of mato grosso which are given in the rivesta trimensal do brazil we cannot tell what circumstances led him after this successful expedition to the portuguese possessions in africa nor is it easy to imagine his motives for crossing south africa from the eastern shore to the kingdom of loanda it is however certain that he left the well-known town of tete in seventeen ninety seven in command of an important caravan bound for the state of kazembe this country was governed by a king as renowned for his benevolence and humanity as for his bravery he inhabited a town called lunda which was two miles in extent and situated upon the eastern shore of the lake called mofo it would have been interesting to compare these localities with those that we know of in the same parallels to-day but the lack of details obliges us to desist merely observing that the word lunda was well known to portuguese travellers as regards kazembe there is no longer any question as to its position well received by the king la cerda remained some twenty days with him and then proceeded upon his journey unfortunately when a day or two's march from lunda he succumbed to fatigue and the unhealthiness of the climate the native king collected the traveller's notes and journals and ordered them to be sent with his remains to mozambique but unfortunately the caravan entrusted with these precious memorials was attacked and the remains of the unfortunate la cerda were left in the heart of africa his notes were brought to europe by a nephew who had accompanied the expedition End of section forty. Section forty one of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume two. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by jules verne second part chapter two african explorers e we now come to the account of the expeditions undertaken in the east of africa foremost of which is that of the well-known traveller bruce a scotchman by birth like so many other african explorers james bruce was brought up for the bar but the sedentary nature of his occupation had little charm for him and he embraced an opportunity of entering commercial life his wife died a few years after their marriage and bruce started for spain where he employed his leisure in studying arabic monuments he wished to publish a detailed account of those in the escorial but the spanish government refused him the necessary permission returning to england bruce began to study eastern languages and more especially the ethiopian which at that time was known only through the imperfect works of ludolf one day lord halifax half jestingly proposed to him an exploration of the sources of the nile bruce entered enthusiastically into the subject and set to work to realize it he overcame every objection 
conquered every difficulty and in june 1768 left england for the shores of the mediterranean bruce hurriedly visits some of the islands of the archipelago syria and egypt leaving jeddah he proceeded to mecca lobeya and arrived at massoa upon the nineteenth of september seventeen sixty nine he had taken care to obtain a firman from the sultan and also letters from the bay of cairo and the sheriff of mecca this was fortunate for the nawab or governor did all in his power to prevent his entering abyssinia and endeavoured to make him pay heavily with presents abyssinia had been explored by portuguese missionaries thanks to whose zeal some information about the country had been obtained although far less accurate in detail than that which we owe to bruce although his veracity has often been questioned succeeding travels have confirmed his assertions from massoa to adowa the road rises gradually and passes over the mountains which separate tigre from the shores of the red sea adowa was not originally the capital of tigre a manufacture of a coarse cotton cloth which circulates as current money in abyssinia was established there the soil in the neighbourhood is deep enough for the cultivation of corn in these districts says bruce there are three harvests a year the first seeds are sown in july and august when the rain flows abundantly in the same season they sow tokusso teff and barley about the twentieth of november they reap the first barley then the wheat and last of all the teff in some of these they sow immediately upon the same ground without any manure barley which they reap in february and then often sow teff but more frequently a kind of vetch or pea called shimbra these are cut down before the first rains which are in april yet with all the advantages of a triple harvest which requires neither manure nor any expensive processes the farmer in abyssinia is always very poor at fremona not far from adowa are the ruins of a jesuit convent resembling rather a fort than the abode of men of peace two days journey further on one comes to the ruins of axum the ancient capital of abyssinia in one square says bruce which i apprehend to have been the centre of the town there are forty obelisks none of which have any hieroglyphs on them the two first have fallen down but a third a little smaller than them is still standing they are all hewn from one block of granite and on the top of that which is standing there is a patera exceedingly well engraved in the greek style after passing the convent of abba pantaleon called in abyssinia mantillas and the small obelisk on a rock above we follow a path cut in a mountain of very red marble having on the left a marble wall forming a parapet about five feet high at intervals solid pedestals rise from this wall bearing every token of having served to support colossal statues of sirius the barking anubis or the dog star one hundred and thirty-three of these pedestals with the marks just mentioned are still in their places but only two figures of the dog were recognizable when i was there these however though much mutilated were evidently egyptian there are also pedestals supporting the figures of the sphinx two magnificent flights of steps several hundred feet long all of granite exceedingly well finished and still in their places are the only remains of a magnificent temple in an angle of this platform where the temple stood is the present small church of axum this church is a mean small building very ill-kept and full of pigeon's dung it was near axum that bruce saw three soldiers cut from a living cow a steak for their midday meal in his account of their method of cutting the steak bruce says the skin which had covered the flesh that was cut away was left intact and was fastened to the corresponding part by little wooden skewers serving as pins whether they put anything between the skin and the wounded flesh i do not know but they soon covered the wound with mud they then forced the animal to rise and drove it on before them to furnish them no doubt with another meal when they should join their companions in the evening from tigre bruce passed into the province of sire which derives its name from its capital a town considerably larger than axum but constantly a prey to putrid fevers near it flows the takazze the ancient Ceres, with its poisonous waters bordered by majestic trees in the province of samen situated amongst the unhealthy and broiling waldubba mountains and where many monks had retired to pray and do penance 
bruce stayed only long enough to rest his beasts of burden for the country was not only haunted by lions and hyenas and infested by large black ants which destroyed parts of his baggage but also torn with civil war so that foreigners were anything but safe this made him more anxious to reach gondar but when he arrived typhoid fever was raging fiercely his knowledge of medicine was very useful to him and procured him a situation under the governor which was most advantageous to him as it rendered him free to scour the country in all directions at the head of a body of soldiers by these means he acquired a mass of valuable information upon the government manners and customs of the country and the chief events of its history which combined to make his work the most important hitherto published about abyssinia it was in the course of one of these excursions that bruce discovered the sources of the blue nile which he took to be the true nile arrived at the church of st michael at guiche where the river is only four paces wide and some four inches deep bruce became convinced that its sources must be in the neighborhood although his guide assured him that he must cross a mountain before he found them the traveller was not to be deceived come come said bruce no more words it is already late lead me to the guiche and the sources of the nile and show me the mountain that separates us from it he then made me go round to the south of the church and coming out of the grove of cedars surrounding it this is the mountain he said looking maliciously up into my face that when you were on the other side of it was between you and the fountains of the nile there is no other look at that green hillock in the centre of that marsh it is there that the two fountains of the nile are to be found guiche is at the top of the rock where you see those very green trees if you go to the fountains pull off your shoes as you did the other day for these people are all pagans and they believe in nothing that you believe but only in the nile to which they pray every day as if it were god as you perhaps invoke it yourself i took off my shoes and rushed down the hill towards the little green island which was about two hundred yards distant the whole of the side of the hill was carpeted with flowers the large roots of which protruded above the surface of the ground and as i was looking down and noticing that the skin was peeling off the bulbs i had two very severe falls before i reached the edge of the marsh but at last i approached the island with its green sod it was in the form of an altar and apparently of artificial construction i was in rapture as i gazed upon the principal fountain which rises in the middle of it it is easier to imagine than to describe what i felt at that moment standing opposite the sources which had baffled the genius and courage of the most celebrated men for three thousand years bruce's narrative contains many other curious observations but we must now pass on to his account of lake tsana lake tsana according to his narrative is by far the largest sheet of water known in these regions its extent however has been greatly exaggerated its greatest breadth from digleber to lemgue that is from east to west is thirty-five miles but it decreases greatly at each end and in some parts is not above ten miles broad its greatest length is forty-nine miles from north to south measured from Barbaja to a point a trifle to the south west quarter west of the spot where the nile after flowing through the lake with an ever perceptible current bends towards dara in the alata territory in the dry season from october to march the lake decreases greatly but when the rains have swollen the rivers which unite at this place like the spokes of a wheel at the nave the lake rises and overflows a portion of the plain if the abyssinians great liars at all times are to be believed there are forty-five islands in lake tsana but this number may be safely reduced to eleven the largest is named dek daka or daga the next in size are halimun on the gondar side of the lake briguida on the gorgora side and galila beyond briguida all these islands were formerly used as prisons for abyssinian chieftains or as retreats by such as were dissatisfied at court or wished to secure their valuables in troubled times and now having visited abyssinia with bruce let us return to the north some light was now being thrown upon the ancient civilization of egypt the archaeological expedition of pocock norden nibur volni and savary had been published in succession and the egyptian society was at work upon the publication of its large and magnificent work the number of travellers increased daily and amongst others 
w g brown determined to visit the land of the pharaohs from his work we learn much alike of the monuments and ruins which make the country so interesting and of the customs of its inhabitants the portion of the work relating to darfur is entirely new no europeans having previously explored it brown attained a high place among travellers by his discovery that the bar el abiat is the true nile and because he endeavoured not indeed to discover its source that he could scarcely hope to do but to ascertain its latitude and course arriving in egypt upon the tenth of january seventeen ninety two brown set out upon his first expedition to siwa and discovered as horneman did later the oasis of jupiter ammon he had little more opportunity than his successor for exploring the catacombs and ruins where he saw many skulls and human remains the ruins of siwa he says resembled too much those of upper egypt to left any doubt that the buildings to which they belonged were built by the same race of men the figures of isis and anubis were easily recognizable on them and the proportions of their architectural works though smaller are the same as those of the egyptian temples the rocks i noticed in the neighbourhood of siwa were of the sandstone formation bearing no relation whatever to the stones of these ruins so that i should think that the materials for these buildings cannot have been obtained on the spot the people of siwa have preserved no credible traditions respecting these objects they merely imagined them to contain treasures and to be frequented by demons after leaving siwa brown made various excursions in egypt and then settled in cairo where he studied arabic he left this town upon the tenth of september seventeen ninety two and visited in succession kau akmin gerge dendera khazr thebes asuan koseir memphis suez and mount sinai then wishing to enter abyssinia but convinced that he could not do so by way of massowa with a sudan caravan in may seventeen ninety three the caravan halted upon its way to darfur at the different towns of aine dize harie bulak sheb selince legea and bar el malha being taken ill at sueni brown was detained there and only reached el fasher after a long delay here his annoyances and the exactions levied recommenced and he could not succeed in obtaining an interview with the sultan he was forced to spend the winter at kobe awaiting his restoration to health which only took place in the summer of seventeen ninety four this time of forced inaction was not however wasted by the traveller he acquainted himself with the manners and dialects of darfur upon the return of summer brown repaired to el fasher and recommenced his applications for admittance to the sultan they were attended with the same unsuccessful results until a crowning act of injustice at length procured for him the interview he had so long solicited in vain i found he says the monarch abd el rashman seated on his throne under a lofty wooden canopy of syrian and indian stuffs indiscriminately mixed the floor in front of the throne was spread with small turkey carpets the meleks officers of the court were seated at some little distance off on the right and left and behind them stood a line of guards wearing caps ornamented in front with a small copper plate and a black ostrich feather each bore a spear in his right hand and shield of hippopotamus hide on the left arm their only clothing was a cotton shirt of the manufacture of the country behind the throne were fourteen or fifteen eunuchs clothed in rich stuffs of various kinds and all manner of colours the space in front was filled with petitioners and spectators to the number of more than fifteen hundred a kind of hired eulogist stood on the monarch's left hand crying out at the top of his voice during the whole ceremony see the buffalo the son of a buffalo the powerful sultan ibn el rashman el rashid may god protect thy life o master may god assist thee and render thee victorious the sultan promised justice to brown and put the matter into the hands of the meleks but he only obtained restitution of a sixth of that of which he had been robbed the traveller had merely entered darfur to cross it he found it would be no easy task to leave it and that in any case he must give up the idea of prosecuting his exploration he says on the eleventh of december seventeen ninety five after a delay of three months i accompanied the hatib one of the principal officers of the country to the monarch's presence i shortly stated what i required and the hatib seconded me 
though not with the zeal that i might have wished to my demand for permission to travel no answer was returned and the iniquitous despot who had received from me no less than the value of about seven hundred and fifty piastres in gold condescended to give me twenty meagre oxen worth about one hundred and twenty piastres the state of my purse would not permit me to refuse even this mean return and i bade adieu to el fasher as i hoped for ever brown was not able to leave darfur until the spring of seventeen ninety six when he joined the caravan which was about to return to egypt the town of kobe although not the resort of the merchants must be considered the capital of darfur it is more than two miles in length but is extremely narrow each house stands in a field surrounded by a palisade and between each there is a plot of fallow land the plain in which the town is situated runs west southwest to a distance of some twenty miles almost all the inhabitants are merchants who trade with egypt their number may be estimated at six thousand the larger proportion being slaves the entire population of darfur cannot exceed two hundred thousand but brown only arrived at this calculation by estimating the number of recruits raised for the war with cordofan the inhabitants of darfur says the narrative are of various races some chiefly fakirs or priests and traders come from the west and there are a good many arabs none of whom are permanent residents they are of various tribes the greater number lead a wandering life on the frontiers where they pasture their camels oxen and horses they are not in such complete dependence on the sultan as always to contribute to his forces in war or to pay him tribute in time of peace after the arabs come the people of zegawa which once formed a distinct kingdom whose chief could put a thousand horsemen in the field the zegawas speak a different dialect from the people of fur we must also include the people of bego or dego who are now subject to darfur but are the issue of a tribe which formerly ruled the country the natives of darfur are inured to hunger and thirst but they indulge freely in an intoxicating liquor called bussa or merisse thieving lying and dishonesty with their accompanying vices prevail largely among them in buying and selling the parent glories in deceiving the son and the son the parent and atrocious frauds are committed in the name of god and of the prophet polygamy which it is well known is tolerated by their religion is indulged in to excess by the people of darfur when sultan teraub went to war with cordofan he took in his retinue five hundred women leaving as many in his palace this may at first sight seem ridiculous but it must be remembered that these women had to grind corn draw water dress food and perform all the domestic work for a large number of people so that there was plenty for them to do brown's narrative contains many medical observations of interest and gives valuable advice as to the mode of travelling in africa with particulars of the animals fish metals and plants of darfur we do not give them here because they do not contain anything of special interest for us End of section 41section forty two of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by abai in april two thousand fourteen celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by Jules Verne. Second part, chapter three, Asia and its inhabitants. A. Witzen's account of Tartary, China as described by the Jesuits and Father Duhald, McCartney in China, stay at Chusang, arrival at Nanking, negotiations, reception of the embassy by the emperor, fetes and ceremonies at Zehol return to pekin and europe volney choiseul gouffier le chevalier in troas olivier in persia a semi-asiatic country palaces account of russia 
at the end of the seventeenth century a traveller named nicolas witzen had explored eastern and northern tartary and in sixteen ninety two published a curious narrative of his journey this work which was in dutch and was not translated into any other european language did not win for its author the recognition he deserved a second edition illustrated with engravings which were meritorious rather from their fidelity to nature than their artistic merit was issued in seventeen o five and in seventeen eighty five the remaining copies of this issue were collected and appeared under a new title but it attracted little notice as by this time further and more curious particulars had been obtained from the day that the jesuits first entered the celestial empire they had collected every possible fact with regard to the customs of this immense country which previous to their stay there had been known only through the extravagant tales of marco polo although china is the country of stagnation and customs and fashion always remain much the same in it the many events which had taken place made it desirable to obtain more exact particulars of a nation with whom europeans might possibly enter into advantageous friendly relations the jesuits published the results of these investigations in the rare work entitled lettres edifiantes which was revised and supplemented by a zealous member of their order father du halde it would be useless to attempt any reproduction of this immense work for which a volume would be required and it is the less necessary as at this day we have fuller and more complete details of the country than are to be found even in the learned father's book to the jesuits also belong the merit of many important astronomical observations facts concerning natural history and the compilation of maps which were till quite lately authorities on remote districts of the country consulted with advantages towards the end of the eighteenth century abbe grossier of the order of saint louis du louvre published in an abridged form a new description of china and tartary he made use of the work of his predecessor du halde and at the same time rectified and added to it after an account of the fifteen provinces of china and tartary with the tributary states such as korea tonking cochin china and tibet the author devotes several chapters to the population and natural history of china whilst he reviews the government religion manners literature science and art of the chinese towards the end of the eighteenth century the english government being desirous of entering into commercial relations with china sent an envoy extraordinary to that country named george mccartney this diplomatist had already visited the courts of europe and russia had been governor of the english antilles and madras and governor-general of china he had acquired in the course of his travels in such varied climates and amid such diverse peoples a profound knowledge of human nature his narrative of his voyages is rich in facts and observations calculated to give europeans a true idea of the chinese character personal accounts of travel are always more interesting than anonymous ones although the great i is generally hateful it is not so in travels where the assertion i have been there i have done such or such a thing carries weight and gives interest to the narrative mccartney and his suit sailed in a squadron consisting of three vessels the lion the hindustan and the jackal which left portsmouth on the twenty sixth of september seventeen ninety two after a few necessary delays at the rio de janeiro st paul and amsterdam islands where some seal hunters were seen at batavia and bantam in java and at pulo condere the vessels cast anchor off turon hansan in cochin china a vast harbour of which only a very bad chart was then in existence the arrival of the english was at first a cause of uneasiness to the natives of cochin china but when they were once informed of the motives which had brought the english to their country they sent an ambassador of high rank on board with presents for mccartney who was shortly afterwards invited to a banquet at the governor's followed by a dramatic entertainment during the short stay many notes were taken of the manners and customs of the people 
unfortunately too hurriedly to admit of accuracy as soon as the sick had recovered and fresh provisions had been obtained the vessels set sail a short stay was made at the ladrone islands and the squadron then entered the strait of formosa where it encountered stormy weather and took refuge in chusan harbour during this stay the map of this archipelago was rectified and an opportunity was taken to visit ting hai where the english excited as much curiosity as they felt themselves at the sight of the many things which were new to them many of the facts which surprised them are familiar to us the appearance of the houses the markets and dress of the chinese the small feet of the women and many other particulars to which we need not refer we will only allude to the account of the method employed by them in cultivating dwarf trees this stunted vegetation says mccartney seems to be highly appreciated in china for specimens of it are found in all the larger houses it is an art peculiar to the chinese and the gardener's skill consists in knowing how to produce it independently of the satisfaction of triumphing over a difficulty he has the advantage of introducing into rooms plants whose natural size would have precluded such a possibility the following is the method employed in china for the production of dwarfed trees the trunk of the tree of which it is desired to obtain a dwarfed specimen is covered as nearly as possible where it separates into branches with clay or mould over which is placed a linen or cotton covering constantly kept damp this mould is sometimes left on for a whole year and throughout that time the wood it covers throws out tender root-like fibres then the portions of the trunk from which issue these fibres with the branch immediately above them are carefully separated from the tree and placed in fresh mould where the shoots soon develop into real roots whilst the branch forms the stem of a plant which is in a manner metamorphosed this operation neither destroys nor alters the productive faculties of the branch which is separated from the parent tree when it bears fruit or flowers it does so as plentifully as when it was upon the original stem the extremities of the branches intended to be dwarfed are always pulled off which precludes the possibility of their growing tall and forces them to throw out shoots and lateral branches these shoots are tied with wire and assume the form the gardener chooses when it is desired to give an aged appearance to the tree it is constantly moistened with theriaca or treacle which attracts to it multitudes of ants who not content with devouring the sweet meat attack the bark of the tree and eat it away in such a manner as to produce the desired effect upon leaving chusan the squadron entered the yellow sea never before navigated by an european vessel the river huang ho flows into it and it is from the immense quantity of yellow mud brought down by it in its long and tortuous course that the sea derives its name the english vessels cast anchor in ten chu fu bay and thence entered the gulf of pekin and halted outside the bar of pei ho there being only three or four feet of water on this bar at low tide the vessels could not cross it the mandarins appointed by the government to receive the english ambassador received shortly after bringing numerous presents whilst the gifts intended for the emperor were placed in junks and mccartney went on board a yacht which has been prepared for him the first town reached was tako where mccartney received a visit from the viceroy of the province and the principal mandarin both were men of venerable and dignified aspect polite and attentive and entirely free from obsequiousness it has been rightly said remarks mccartney that the people are as they are made and the english had continual proof of this truth in the effect produced upon the chinese character by the fear of the iron power that ruled them apart from this fear they were cheerful and confiding but in the presence of their rulers they appeared most timid and embarrassed in ascending the pei ho towards pekin the course was retarded by the many windings of the river the country through which they passed was highly cultivated with houses and villages at intervals upon the banks of the river or inland 
alternating with cemeteries and pyramids of bags of salt producing a charming and ever-varying landscape when night approached lanterns of every hue fastened to the masts and rigging of the yards produced the fantastic effect of many-coloured lights Tieng Ching signifies heavenly spot, and the town owes this name to its agreeable climate and clear blue sky, and the fertility of its neighborhood. In this place the ambassador was received by the viceroy and a legate sent by the emperor. From them McCartney learned that the emperor was at his summer palace in Tartary, and that the anniversary of his birthday was to be celebrated there upon the 13th of September. The ambassador and his suite were therefore to go up by water as far as Tong Shu, about a dozen miles from Pekin, and thence proceed by land to Tse Hol, where the emperor awaited them. The presents might be sent on afterwards. Although the first intimation was pleasant, the latter was singularly disagreeable to McCartney, for the presents consisted for the most part of delicate instruments which had been taken to pieces for safety and packed separately the legate would not consent to their being left where they would be free from danger of being disturbed mccartney was obliged to obtain the intervention of the viceroy for the protection of these proofs of the genius and knowledge of europe the cortege reached Tientsing, a town which appeared as long as london and contained not less than seven hundred thousand inhabitants a vast crowd assembled on the banks of the river to see the english pass and the river swarmed with junks teeming with natives the houses in the city are built of blue with few red bricks some are two stories high but that is unusual here the english saw the employment of those carriages with sails which had long been considered fabulous they consist of two barrows made of bamboo, with one large wheel between them. When there is not sufficient wind to propel the carriage, says the narrative, it is drawn by one man, while another pushes behind and keeps it steady. When the wind is favourable, the sail, which is a mat attached to two sticks placed upon either side of the carriage, renders the help of the men in front unnecessary. The banks of the Pei Ho are in many parts protected by breastworks of granite to arrest inundation, and here and there dikes, also of granite, provided with a slouse, by means of which water is conveyed to the fields below. The country, although well cultivated, was often devastated by famines following upon inundations or resulting from the ravages of locusts thus far the cortege had been sailing through the immense alluvial plain of peche li not until the fourth day after leaving tien ching was the blue outline of the mountains perceived on the horizon pekin was now in sight and on the sixth of august seventeen ninety three the yachts anchored within two miles of the capital and half a mile from tong chou fo in order to leave the presents which could not be taken to tse hol at the palace called the garden of eternal spring it was necessary to land the inhabitants of tong chou fo who were already greatly excited by the appearance of the english were still more amazed at the first sight of a negro servant his skin his jet black colour his woolly hair and all the distinguishing marks of his race were absolutely novel in this part of china the people could not remember seeing anything at all like him before some of them even doubted if he could be a human being at all and the children cried out in fear that it was a black devil but his good humour soon reconciled them to his appearance and they became accustomed to look upon him without fear or displeasure the english were especially surprised at seeing upon a wall the sketch of a lunar eclipse which was to take place in a few days they ascertained among other facts that silver is an article of commerce with the chinese for they have no coined money but use ingots bearing only a sign indicative of their weight the english were struck with the extraordinary resemblance between the religious ceremonies of fo and those of the christians mccartney states that certain authors maintain that the apostle thomas visited china 
while the missionary tremor contends that this is merely a fiction palmed upon the jesuits by the devil himself ninety small carriages forty-four wheelbarrows more than two hundred horses and over three thousand men were employed in the transport of the presence of the british government to the emperor mccartney and three of his suit accompanied the convoy in palanquins an enormous crowd followed them the english ambassador was greeted at the gates of pekin by volleys of artillery once beyond the fortifications he found himself in a wide unpaved street with houses on either side one or two stories high across the street extended a wooden triumphal arch in three partitions each with a lofty and highly decorated roof the embassy afforded ample material for the tales which at this time filled the imagination of the people it was declared that the presents brought for the emperor consisted of everything that was rare in other countries and unknown in china it was gravely asserted that among the animals there was an elephant not larger than a monkey but as fierce as a lion and a cock which was fed upon coal everything which came from england was supposed to differ from anything hitherto seen in pekin and to possess the very opposite qualities to those usual to it the wall of the imperial palace was at once recognized by its yellow color through the gate were seen artificial hills lakes and rivers with small islets and fantastic buildings amidst the trees at the end of a street terminating at the northern wall of the city was a vast edifice of considerable height which contained an enormous bell the english explored the town in various directions and on the whole were not favourably impressed they concluded that a chinaman visiting london with its bridges and innumerable ships its squares and monuments would carry away a better idea of the importance of the capital of great britain than they could do of pekin upon their arrival at the palace where the presents for the emperor were to be displayed the governor discussed with mccartney the best way to arrange and display them they were finally placed in a large and well decorated hall which at the time contained nothing but a throne and a few vases of old china it is unnecessary to enter upon the interminable negotiations which arose out of the resolve of the chinese that mccartney should prostrate himself before the emperor which humiliating proposition they had prepared for by the inscription placed upon the yards and carriages of the embassy ambassador bringing tribute from england it is in pekin that the field is situated which the emperor in accordance with ancient customs sows every spring here too is to be found the temple of the earth to which the sovereign resorts at the summer solstice to acknowledge the astral power which lightens the world and to give thanks for its beneficent influence pekin is merely the seat of the imperial government in china and has neither shipping manufactures nor trade mccartney computes the number of inhabitants at three million the one-storied houses in the town appear insufficient for so large a population but a single house accommodates three generations this density of the population is the result of the early ages at which marriages are contracted these hasty unions are often brought about from prudential motives by the chinese the children and especially the sons being responsible for the care of their parents the embassy left pekin on the second of september seventeen ninety three mccartney travelling in a post-chaise probably the first carriage of the kind which ever entered tartary as the distance from pekin increased the road ascended and the soil became more sandy and contained less and less clay and black earth shortly afterwards vast plains planted with tobacco were crossed mccartney imagines tobacco to be indigenous and not imported from america and thinks that the habit of smoking was spontaneous in asia the english soon noticed that as the soil became more and more barren the population decreased 
at the same time the tartar element became larger and larger and the difference between the manners of the chinese and their conquerors was less marked upon the fifth day of the journey the far-famed great wall was seen the first glance at this fortified wall says mccartney is enough to give an impression of an enterprise of surprising grandeur it ascends the highest mountains to their very loftiest peaks it goes down into the deepest valleys crossing rivers on sustaining arches and with its breadth open doubled and trebled to increase its strength whilst at intervals of about a hundred paces rise towered or strong bastions it is difficult to understand how the materials for this wall were brought to and used in places apparently inaccessible and it is impossible sufficiently to admire the skill brought to bear upon the task one of the loftiest mountains over which the wall passes has been ascertained to be no less than five thousand two hundred twenty five feet high this fortification for the simple word wall gives no just idea of the wonderful structure is said to be one thousand five hundred miles long but it is not quite finished the fifteen hundred miles was the extent of the frontier which separates colonized china from the various tartar tribes such barriers as these would not suffice in modern times for nations at war many of the lesser works in the interior of this grand rampart have yielded to the effect of time and fallen into ruins others have been repaired but the principal wall appears throughout to have been built with such care and skill as never to have needed repairs it has now been preserved more than two thousand years and appears as little susceptible of injury as the rocks which nature herself has planted between china and tartary beyond the wall nature seems to proclaim the entrance into a new country the temperature is colder the roads are more rugged and the mountains are less wooded the number of sufferers from goiter in the tartar valleys is very considerable and according to the estimate given by dr gillen physician to the embassy comprises a sixth of the population the portion of tartary in which this malady rages is not unlike many of the cantons of switzerland and savoy the valley of se hol where the emperor possesses a summer palace and garden was at length reached this residence is called the abode of pleasant freshness and the park surrounding it is named the garden of innumerable trees the embassy was received with military honors amid an immense crowd of people many of whom were dressed in yellow these were inferior lamas or monks of the order of fo to which the emperor also belonged the disputes as to prostration before the emperor began in pekin were continued here at last chien lung consented to content himself with the respectful salutation with which english nobles are accustomed to greet their own sovereign the reception accordingly took place with every imaginable pomp and ceremony the narrative says shortly after daybreak the sound of many instruments and the confused voices of distant crowds announced the approach of the emperor he soon appeared issuing from behind a high mountain bordered with trees as if from a sacred grove and preceded by a number of men who proclaimed his virtues and power in loud voices he was seated in a chair carried by sixteen men his guards the officers of his household standard and umbrella bearers and musicians accompanied him he was clothed in a robe of sombre coloured silk and wore a velvet cap very similar in shape to that of scotch mountaineers a large pearl was conspicuous on his forehead and was the only jewel or ornament he wore upon entering the tent the emperor mounted the steps of the throne which he alone is allowed to ascend the first minister ho chu tang and two of the chief officers of his household remained near and never addressed him but in a kneeling position when the princes of royal blood the tributary princes and state officers were in their places the president of the customs conducted mccartney within a foot of the left-hand side of the throne which in the chinese court is considered the place of honor 
the ambassador was accompanied by the minister plenipotentiary and followed by his page and interpreter mccartney in accordance with the instructions given him by the president raised above his head the magnificent square golden box studded with diamonds which contained the king of england's letter to the emperor then mounting the few steps leading to the throne he bowed the knee and with a short prefatory compliment presented the box to his imperial majesty the chinese monarch received it graciously and said as he placed it on one side that he experienced much satisfaction at the token of esteem and friendship offered by his britannic majesty in sending to him an embassy with a letter and rich gifts that for his part he had the like friendly feelings towards the king of great britain and he hoped the same harmony would always continue between their respective subjects End of section forty two section forty three of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2014. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2 Great Navigators of the 18th Century by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 3 Asia and its Inhabitants. B after a few moments of private conversation with the ambassador the emperor presented gifts to him and to the minister plenipotentiary they were then conducted to cushions in front of which were tables covered with a number of vessels containing meat and fruits the emperor also partook of these and continued to overwhelm the ambassadors with expressions of regard and esteem which had a great effect in raising the english in the estimation of the chinese public mccartney and his suit were later invited to visit the gardens of ze hol during their walk in the grounds the english met the emperor who stopped to receive their respectful salutations and order his first minister who was looked upon as little less than a vice-emperor and several other grandees to accompany them the Chinese conducted the English over a portion of the grounds laid out as pleasure gardens, which formed only a small portion of the vast enclosure. The rest is sacred to the use of the women of the imperial family, and was as rigorously closed to the Chinese ministers as to the English embassy. McCartney was then led through a fertile valley in which there were many trees, chiefly willows of enormous size grass grows abundantly between the trees and its luxuriance is not diminished by cattle or interfered with by mowing arriving upon the shores of an irregular lake of vast extent the whole party embarked in yachts and proceeded to a bridge which is thrown across the narrowest part of the lake and beyond which it appeared to stretch away indefinitely upon the seventeenth of september mccartney and his suit were presented at a ceremony which took place upon the anniversary of the emperor's birthday upon the morrow and following days splendid fetes succeeded each other chien lung participating in them with great zest dancers on the tightrope tumblers conjurers of unrivalled skill and wrestlers performed in succession the natives of various portions of the empire appeared in their distinctive costumes and exhibited the different productions of their provinces music and dancing were succeeded by fireworks which were very effective although they were let off in daylight the narrative says quote, several of the designs were novel to the english one of them i will describe a large box was raised to a great height and the bottom being removed as if by accident an immense number of paper lamps fell from it when they left the box they were all neatly folded but in falling they opened by degrees and sprung one out of the other each then assumed a regular form and suddenly a beautifully colored light appeared the chinese seemed to understand the art of shaping the fireworks at their fancy 
on either side of the large boxes were smaller ones which opened in a similar manner letting fall burning torches of different shapes as brilliant as burnished copper and flashing like lightning at each movement of the wind the display ended with the eruption of an artificial volcano End quote. It is the usual custom for the Emperor of China to conclude his birthday festivities by hunting in the forests of Tartary, but in the present case advancing age rendered that diversion unwise, and His Majesty decided to return to Pekin, the English embassy being invited to precede him thither. McCartney, however, felt that it was time to terminate his mission. In the first place it was not customary for ambassadors to reside long at the Chinese court, and in the second the fact that the Chinese emperor defrayed the expenses of the embassy naturally induced him to curtail his stay. In a short time he received from Qian Lung the reply to the letter of the King of England, and the presents intended for the English monarch, as well as a number for the members of his suit. This McCartney rightly interpreted as his congé. The English went back to Tong Chou Fu by way of the Imperial Canal. Upon this trip they saw the famous bird Le Tse fishing for his master. It is a species of cormorant and is so well trained that it is unnecessary to place either a cord or ring around its neck to prevent it from swallowing any of its prey. Upon every boat or raft there are ten or twelve of these birds, ready to plunge the instant they receive a sign from their masters. It is curious to see them catch enormous fish and carry them in their beaks. McCartney mentions a singular manner of catching wild ducks and other water birds. Empty jars and calabashes are allowed to float upon the water for several days, until the birds are accustomed to the sight of them. A man then enters the water, places one of the jars upon his head, and, advancing gently, seizes the feet of any bird which allows him to come near enough. He rapidly immerses it in the water to choke it, and then noiselessly continues his search until his bag is full. The embassy visited Canton and Macau, and thence returned to England. We need not dwell upon the return voyage. We must now consider that portion of Asia which may be called the interior. The first traveller to be noticed is Volney. Everyone knows, by repute at least, his book on ruins, but his account of his adventures in Egypt and Syria far surpasses it. There is nothing exaggerated in the letter. It is written in a quiet, precise manner, and is one of the most instructive of books. The members of the Egyptian expedition refer to it as containing exact statements as to climate, the productions of the soil, and the manners of the inhabitants. Volney prepared himself most carefully for the journey, which was a great undertaking for him. He determined to leave nothing to chance, and upon reaching Syria he realized that he could not possibly acquire the knowledge of the country he desired unless he first made himself acquainted with the language of the people. He therefore retired to the monastery of Mar Hunt in Libya and devoted himself to the study of Arabic. Later on, in order to learn something of the life led by the wandering tribes of the Arabian desert, he joined company with a sheikh and accustomed himself to the use of a lance and to live on horseback, thus qualifying himself to accompany the tribes in their excursions. Under their protection he visited the ruins of Palmyra and Baalbek, cities of the dead known to us only by name. His style of writing, says La Beuve, is free from exaggeration and marked by singular exactness and propriety. When, for example, he wishes to illustrate the quality of the Egyptian soil, and in what respect it differs from that of Africa, he speaks of this black, light, greasy earth, which is brought up and deposited by the Nile. When he wishes to describe the warm winds of the desert with their dry heat, he compares them to the impression which one receives upon opening a fierce oven to take out the bread. According to his description, speaking of the fitful winds, he says they are not merely laden with fog, but gritty and powdery, and in reality full of fine dust which penetrates everything, and of the sun, he says, it presents to view but an obscured disk. 
if such an expression may be used in speaking of a rigid statement of facts volney attained to true beauty of expression to an actual physical beauty so to speak recalling the touch of hippocrates in his de ere aquis et locis although no geographical discoveries can be imputed to him we must none the less recognize in him one of the first travellers who had a true conception of the importance of their task his aim was always to give a true impression of the places he visited and this in itself was no small merit at a time when other explorers did not hesitate to enliven their narratives with imaginary details with no recognition whatever of their true responsibility the abbe barthelemy who in seventeen eighty eight was to publish his voyage du jeune anacharsis was already exercising a good deal of influence on public taste by his popularity in society and position as a man of science and drawing special attention to greece and the neighboring countries it was evidently whilst attending his lessons that de choiseul imbibed his love for history and archaeology nominated ambassador at constantinople de choiseul determined to profit by the leisure he enjoyed in travelling as an artist and archaeologist through the greece of homer and herodotus such a journey was the very thing to complete the education of the young ambassador who was only twenty-four years of age and if he knew himself could not be said to have any acquaintance with the way of the world sensible of his shortcomings he surrounded himself with learned and scientific men amongst them the abbe barthelemy the greek scholar Anse de villoison the poet de lille the sculptor fauvel and the painter cassas in fact in his picturesque history of greece he himself merely plays the role of mecenas m de choiseul gouffier engaged as private secretary a professor the abbe jean baptiste le chevalier who spoke greek fluently the latter after a journey to london where m de choiseul's business detained him long enough for him to learn english went to italy and was detained at venice by severe illness for seven months after this he joined m de choiseul gouffier at constantinople the chevalier occupied himself principally with the site of troy well versed in the iliad he sought for and believed he identified the various localities mentioned in the homeric poem his able geographical and historical book at once provoked plentiful criticism upon the one side learned men such as bryant declared the discoveries made by choiseul to be illusory for the reason that troy and as a matter of course the ten years siege existed only in the imagination of the greek poet whilst others and principally the english portion of his critics adopted his conclusions the whole question was almost forgotten when the discoveries made quite recently by schliemann reopened the discussion guillaume antoine olivier who traversed the greater portion of the western hemisphere at the end of the last century had a strange career employed by berthier de sauvigny to translate a statistical paper on paris he lost his patron and the payment for his labors in the first outburst of the revolution wishing to employ his talent for natural history away from paris he was nominated by the minister roland to a mission to the distant and little-known portions of the ottoman empire a naturalist named bruguer was associated with him the two friends left paris at the end of seventeen ninety two and were delayed for four months at versailles until a suitable ship was found for them they only reached constantinople at the end of the following may carrying letters relating to their mission to m de simonville but this ambassador had been recalled and his successor m de sainte croix had heard nothing of their undertaking what was the best thing to do whilst awaiting the reply to the inquiries sent to paris by m de sainte croix the two friends could not remain inactive they therefore decided to visit the shores of asia minor and some islands in the egyptian archipelago the french minister had excellent reasons for not supplying them with much money and their own resources being limited they were unable to do more than make a flying visit to these interesting countries 
upon their return to constantinople they found a new ambassador named verniac who had received instructions to send them to persia where they were to endeavour to awaken the sympathy of the government for france and to induce it to declare war against russia at this time the most deplorable anarchy reigned in persia usurpers succeeded each other upon the throne to the great detriment of the welfare of the inhabitants war was going on in Khorasan at the time that olivier and bruguere arrived an opportunity occurred for them to join the shah in a country as yet unvisited by any european but unfortunately bruguere was in such bad health that they were not only forced to lose the chance but were detained for four months in an obscure village buried amongst the mountains in september seventeen ninety six mehemet returned to teheran his first act was to order a hundred russian sailors whom he had taken prisoners on the caspian sea to be put to death and their limbs to be nailed outside his palace walls a disgusting trophy worthy of the butcher tyrant the following year mehemet ali was assassinated and his nephew feta ali shah succeeded him after a short struggle it was difficult for olivier to discharge his mission with this constant change of reigning sovereigns he was forced to renew his negotiations with each succeeding prince finally the travellers realizing the impossibility of obtaining anything definite under such circumstances returned to europe and left the question of alliance between france and persia to a more favourable season they stopped upon their homeward journey at baghdad ispahan aleppo cyprus and constantinople although this journey had been fruitless as regarded diplomacy and had contributed no new discovery on geography cuvier in his eulogy of olivier assures us that so far as natural history was concerned much had been achieved this may be the better credited as olivier was elected to the institute as the successor to daubenton cuvier in academic style says that the narrative of the voyage published in three quarto volumes was warmly received by the public it has been said he continues that it might have been of greater interest if the censor had not eliminated certain portions but allusions were found throughout the whole volume which were inadmissible as it does not do to say all we know especially of tamas kuli khan m olivier had no greater regard for this assertion than for his fortune he quietly omitted all that he was told to leave out and restricted himself to a quiet and simple account of what he had seen a journey from persia to russia is not difficult and was less so in the eighteenth century than to-day as a matter of fact russia only became a european power in the days of peter the great until the reign of that monarch she had been in every particular manners customs and inhabitants asiatic with peter the great and catherine the second however commerce revived high roads were made the navy was created and the various tribes became united into one nation the empire was vast from the first and conquest has added to its extent peter the great ordered the compilation of charts sent expeditions round the coast to collect particulars as to the climate productions and races of the different provinces of his empire and at length he sent bering upon the voyage which resulted in the discovery of the straits bearing his name the example of the great emperor was followed by his successor catherine the second she attracted learned men to her court and corresponded with the savants of the whole world she succeeded in impressing the nations with a favourable idea of her subjects interest and curiosity were awakened and the eyes of western europe were fixed upon russia it became recognized that a great nation was arising and many doubts were entertained as to the result upon european interests prussia had already changed the balance of power in europe by her victories under frederick the second russia possessed resources of her own not only in men but in silver and riches of every kind still unknown or untested 
thus it came to pass that publications concerning that country possessed an attraction for politicians and those interested in the welfare of their country as well as for the scientific men to whom descriptions of manners and customs foreign to their experience were always welcome no work had hitherto excelled that of the naturalist pallas which was translated into french between seventeen eighty eight and seventeen ninety three it was a narrative of a journey across several provinces of the russian empire the success of this publication was well deserved peter simon pallas was a german naturalist who had been summoned to st petersburg by catherine the second in sixteen sixty eight and elected by her a member of the academy of sciences she understood the art of enlisting him in her service by her favours Pallas, in acknowledgment of them, published his account of fossil remains in Siberia. England and France had just sent expeditions to observe the transit of Venus. Russia, not to be behindhand, dispatched a party of learned men, of whom Pallas was one, to Siberia. Seven astronomers and geometers, five naturalists, and a large number of pupils made up the party, which was thoroughly to explore the whole of the vast territory. For six whole years Pallas devoted himself to the successive explorations of Orenburg upon the Yaik, the rendezvous of the nomad tribes who wander upon the shores of the Caspian Sea, Guriel, which is situated upon the borders of the Great Lake, which is now drying up, the Ural Mountains with their numberless iron mines, Tobolsk, the capital of Siberia, the province of Kolyvan upon the northern slopes of the Atlas, Krasnoyarsk upon the Yenisei, and the immense lake of Bakali and Daudia on the frontiers of China. He also visited Astrakhan, the Caucasus, with its varied and interesting inhabitants, and finally he explored the Don, returning to St. Petersburg on the 30th of July, 1774. It may well be believed that Pallas was no ordinary traveller. He was not merely a naturalist, he was interested in everything that affects humanity. Geography, history, politics, commerce, religion, science, art, all occupied his attention, and it is impossible to read his narrative without admiring his enlightened patriotism, or without recognizing the penetration of the sovereign who understood the art of securing his services. When his narrative was once arranged, written, and published, Pallas had no idea of contenting himself with the laurels he had gained. Work was his recreation, and he found occupation in assisting in the compilation of a map of Russia. His natural inclinations led him to the study of botany, and by his works upon that subject he obtained a distinctive place among Russian naturalists. One of his later undertakings was a description of southern Russia, a physical and topographical account of the province of Taurus, a work which, originally published in French, was afterwards translated into English and German. Delighted with this country, which he had visited in 1793 and 1794, he desired to settle there. The empress bestowed some of the crown lands upon him, and he transported his family to Simferopol. Pallas profited by the opportunity to undertake a new journey in the northern provinces of the empire, the steppes of the Volga, and the countries which border the Caspian Sea as far as the Caucasus. He then explored the Crimea. He had seen parts of the country twenty years before, and now he found great changes. Although he complains of the devastation of the forests, he commends the increase of agricultural districts and the centres of industries which had been created. The Crimea is known to be considerably improved since that time. It is impossible to foresee what it may yet become. Enthusiastic though he was at first in his admiration of this province, Pallas was exposed to every kind of treachery on the part of the Tartars. His wife died in the Crimea, and finally disgusted with the country and its inhabitants, he returned to Breton to end his days. He died there on the 8th of September, 1811. 
he left two important works from which naturalists geographers statesmen and merchants were able to gather much trustworthy information upon countries then but little known and the commodities and resources of which were destined to have a large influence over european markets End of section 43section forty four of celebrated travels and travellers volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kyle strand celebrated travels and travellers volume two great navigators of the eighteenth century by jules verne second part chapter four the two americas a we have more than once had occasion to speak of expeditions for the survey of the coasts of america we have told of the attempts of fernando cortes and the voyages and explorations of drake cook la perouse and marchand it will be well known to go back for a time and with florieu sum up the series of voyages along the western coast of america to the close of the eighteenth century in fifteen thirty seven cortes with francisco de ulloa discovered the huge peninsula of california and sailed over the greater part of the long and narrow strait now known as the vermilion sea he was succeeded by vasquez coronado and francisco alarcon who the former by sea and the latter by land devoted themselves to seeking the channel which was erroneously supposed to connect the atlantic and pacific they did not however penetrate beyond thirty six degrees north latitude two years later in fifteen forty two the portuguese rodrigo de cabrillo reached forty four degrees north latitude where the intense cold sickness want of provisions and the bad state of his vessel compelled him to turn back he made no actual discovery but he ascertained that from port natividad to the furthest point reached by him the coastline was unbroken the channel of communication seemed to recede before all explorers. The little success met with appears to have discouraged the Spaniards, for at this time they retired from the ranks of the explorers. It was an Englishman, Drake, who, after having sailed along the western coast as far as the Straits of Magellan and devastated the Spanish possessions, reached the 48th degree, explored the whole coast, and, returning the same way, gave to the vast districts included within ten degrees the name of new albion next came in fifteen ninety two the great fabulous voyage of juan de fuca who claimed to have found the long-sought strait of anian when he had but found the channel dividing vancouver's island from the mainland in sixteen o two viscaino laid the foundations of port monterey in california and forty years later took place that much contested voyage of admiral de fuente or gifonche according as one reckons him a spaniard or a portuguese which had been the text of so many learned discussions and ingenious suppositions to him we owe the discovery of the archipelago of st lazarus above vancouver's island but all that he says about the lakes and large towns he claims to have visited must be relegated to the realms of romance as well as his assertion that he discovered a communication between the two oceans in the eighteenth century the assertions of travellers were no longer blindly accepted they were examined and sifted those parts only being believed which accorded with the well-authenticated accounts of others boache delise and above all florieu inaugurated the prolific literature of historical criticism and we have every reason to be grateful to them the russians as we know had greatly extended the field of their knowledge and there was every reason to suppose that their hunters and cossacks would soon reach america if as was then believed the two continents were connected in the north but from such unprofessional travellers no trustworthy scientific details could be expected a few years before his death the emperor peter i drew up with his own hands a plan of an expedition with instructions to its members which he had long had in view for ascertaining whether asia and america are united or separated by a strait 
The arsenal and forts of Kamchatka, being unable to supply the necessary men, stores, etc., captains, sailors, equipment, and provisions, had to be imported from Europe. Vitus Bering, a Dane, and Alex Shiriko, a Russian, who had both given many a proof of skill and knowledge, were appointed to the command of the expedition, which consisted of two vessels built at Kamchatka. They were not ready to put to sea until July 20th, 1720. Steering northeast along the coast of Asia, of which he never for a moment lost sight, Bering discovered, on the 15th August and 67th degree, 18 minute north latitude, a cape beyond which the coast stretched away westward. In this first voyage, Bering did not apparently see the coast of America, though he probably passed through the strait to which posterity has given his name. The fabulous Strait of Anian gave place to Bering Straits. A second voyage made by the same explorers the following year was without results. Not until June 4, 1741, were Bering and Chiricau in a position to start again. This time they meant to bear to the east after reaching 50 degrees north latitude, till they should come to the coast of America. But the two vessels were separated in a gale of wind on the 28th August, and were unable to find each other again throughout the trip. On the 18th July, Bering discerned the American continent in 58 degrees 28 minutes north latitude, and the succeeding days were devoted to the survey of the vast bay between Cape St. Elias and St. Hermogenes. Bering spent the whole of August in sailing about the islands known as the Shumagin Archipelago off the peninsula of Alaska, and after a struggle lasting until the 24th September with contrary winds, he sighted the most southerly cape of the peninsula and discovered part of the Aleutian group. Exhausted by long illness, however, the explorer was now no longer able to direct the course of his vessel, and could not prevent her from running aground on the little island bearing his name. There, on the 8th of December, 1741, this brave man and skillful explorer perished miserably. The remnant of his crew, who survived the fatigues and privations of winter in this desolate spot, succeeded in making a large sloop of the remains of the vessel, in which they returned to Kamchatka. Meanwhile, Shiriko, after waiting for his superior officer until the 25th June, made land between 55 degrees 56 minutes north latitude, where he lost two boats with their crews, without being able to find out what had become of them. Unable after this catastrophe to open communication with the natives, he went back to Kamchatka. The way was now open, and adventurers, merchants, and naval officers eagerly rushed in, directing their efforts carefully to the Aleutian Islands and the peninsula of Alaska. The expeditions sent out by the English, and the progress made by the Russians had, however, aroused the jealousy and anxiety of the Spanish, who feared lest the rivals should establish themselves in a country nominally belonging to Spain, though she owned not a single colony in it. The Viceroy of Mexico now remembered the discovery of an excellent port by Vizcaino, and resolved to found a presidio there. Two expeditions started simultaneously, the one by land under Don Gaspar de Partola, the other by sea, consisting of two packets, the San Carlos and San Antonio, and after a year's search found again the harbor of Monterrey, alluded to by Vizcaino. After this expedition, the Spanish continued the exploration of the Californian coast. The most celebrated voyages were those of Don Juan de Ayala and of La Bodega, which took place in 1775 and resulted in the discovery of Cape Engano and Guadalupe Bay. Next to these ranked the expeditions of Arteaga and Maurel. We have already related what was done by Cook, La Perouse, and Marchand, so we can pass on to say a few words of the expeditions of Vancouver. This officer, who had accompanied Cook on his second and third voyage, was naturally appointed to the command of the expedition sent out by the English government with a view to settling the disputes with the Spanish government as to Nootka Sound. George Vancouver was commissioned to obtain from the Spanish authorities the formal cession of this great harbor, of such vast importance to the fur trade. He was then to survey the whole of the northwest coast from 30 degrees north latitude to Cook's River in 61 degrees north latitude. 
Lastly, he was to give special attention to the Straits of De Fuca and the bay explored in 1749 by the Washington. The two vessels, the Discovery of 340 tons and the Chatham of 135, the latter under the command of Captain Broughton, left Falmouth on the 1st of April, 1791. After touching at Tenerife, Simon Bay, and the Cape of Good Hope, Vancouver steered southwards, sighted St. Paul's Island, and sailed towards New Holland, between the routes taken by Dampier and Marion, and through latitudes which had not yet been traversed. On the 27th September was sighted part of the coast of New Holland, ending in abrupt and precipitous cliffs, to which the name of Cape Chatham was given. As many of his crew were down with dysentery, Vancouver decided to anchor in the first harbor he came to, to get water, wood, and above all provisions, of which he stood sorely in need. Port George the Third was the first reached, where ducks, curlews, swans, fish, and oysters abounded, but no communication could be opened with the natives, although a recently abandoned village of some twenty huts was seen. We need not follow Vancouver in his cruise along the southwest coast of Holland, as we shall learn nothing new from it. On the 28th November, Van Diemen's Land was doubled, and on the 2nd December, the coast of New Zealand was reached and anchor cast by the two vessels in Dusky Bay. Here, Vancouver completed the survey left unfinished by Cook. A gale soon separated the discovery from the Chatham, which was found again in Matavai Bay, Tahiti. During the voyage there from Dusky Bay, Vancouver discovered some rocky islands, which he called the Snares, and a large island named Opara, whilst Capstan Broughton had discovered Chatham Island on the east of New Zealand. The incidents of the stay at Tahiti resembled those of Cook's story too closely for repetition. On the 24th January, the two vessels started for the Sandwich Islands, and stopped for a short time off Awihi, Wauhu, and Ottawa. Since the murder of Cook, many changes had taken place in this archipelago. English and American vessels now sometimes visited it to take whales, or trade in furs, and their captains had given the natives a taste for brandy and firearms. Quarrels between the petty chiefs had become more frequent, the most complete anarchy prevailed everywhere, and the number of inhabitants was already greatly diminished. On the 17th March, 1792, Vancouver left the Sandwich Islands and steered for America, of which he soon sighted the part called by Drake New Albion. Here he almost immediately met Captain Gray, who was supposed to have penetrated in the Washington into De Fuca Strait and discovered a vast sea. Gray at once disavowed the discoveries with which he was so generously credited, explaining that he had only sailed fifty miles up the strait, which runs from east to west till it reaches a spot where, according to some natives, it veers to the north and disappears. Vancouver, in his turn, entered De Fuca Strait and recognized Discovery Port, Admiralty Entry, Birch Bay, Desolation Sound, Johnson Strait, and Broughton Archipelago. Before reaching the northern extremity of this long arm of the sea, he met two small Spanish vessels under the command of Quadra. The two captains compared notes and gave their names to the chief island of the large group known collectively as New Georgia. Vancouver visited Nootka Sound and the Columbia River, whence he sailed to San Francisco, off which he anchored. It will be understood that it is impossible to follow the details of the minute survey of the vast stretch of coast between Cape Mendocino and Port Conclusion, in the northern latitude 56 degrees 37 minutes, which required no less than three successive trips. Now, says the great navigator, that we have achieved the chief aim of the king in ordering this voyage, I flatter myself that our very detailed survey of the northwest coast of America will dispel all doubts and do away with all erroneous opinions as to a northwest passage. Surely no one will now believe in there being a communication between the North Pacific and the interior of the American continent in the part traversed by us. Leaving Nootka to survey the coast of South America before returning to Europe, Vancouver touched at the small Coconut Island, which, as we have already observed, little deserves its name, cast anchor off Valparaiso, doubled Cape Horn, took in water at St. Helena, and re-entered the Thames on the 12th September, 1795. The fatigue incidental to this long expedition had so undermined the health of the explorer that he died in May 1798, 
leaving the account of his voyage to be finished by his brother. Throughout the arduous survey, occupying four years of 900 miles of coast, the Discovery and Chatham lost but two men. It will be seen from this how apt a pupil of Cook the great navigator was, and we do not know whether most to admire in Vancouver his care for his sailors and humanity to the natives, or the wonderful nautical skill he displayed in this dangerous cruise. While explorers thus succeeded each other on the western coast of America, colonists were not idle inland. Already established on the borders of the Atlantic, where a series of states had been founded from Florida to Canada, the white men were now rapidly forcing their way westwards. Trappers and coureurs de bois, as the French hunters were called, had discovered vast tracts of land suitable for cultivation, and many English squatters had already taken root, not, however, without numerous conflicts with the original owners of the soil, whom they daily tried to drive into the interior. Emigrants were soon attracted in large numbers by the fertility of a virgin soil and the more liberal constitution of the various states. Their number increased to such an extent that at the end of the 17th century the heirs of Lord Baltimore established the produce of the sale of their lands at 3,000 pounds, and in the middle of the following century, 1750, the successors of William Penn also made a profit ten times as great as the original price of their property. Yet emigration was even then not sufficiently rapid, and convicts were introduced. Maryland numbered 1981 and 1750. Many scandalous abuses also resulted from the compulsory signing by newcomers of agreements they did not understand. Although the lands bought of the Indians were far from being all occupied, the English colonists continued to push their way inland at the risk of encounters with the legitimate owners of the soil. In the north, the Hudson's Bay Company, holding a monopoly of the fur trade, were always on the lookout for new hunting grounds, for those originally explored were soon exhausted. Their trappers made their way into western wilds and gained valuable information from the Indians whom they pressed into their service and taught to get drunk. By this means, the existence of a river flowing northwards passed some copper mines, from which some natives brought fine specimens to Fort Prince of Wales, was ascertained. The company at once, i.e. in 1769, decided to send out an expedition, to the command of which they appointed Samuel Hearn. For a journey to the Arctic regions, where provisions are difficult to obtain and the cold is intense, a few well-seasoned men are required, who can endure the fatigue of an arduous march over snow and bear up against hunger. Hearn took with him only two whites and a few Indians on whom he could depend. In spite of the great skill of the guides who knew the country and were familiar with the habits of the game it contained, provisions soon failed. Two hundred miles from Fort Prince of Wales, the Indians abandoned Hearn and his two companions, who were obliged to retrace their steps. The chief of the expedition, however, was a rough sailor, accustomed to privations, so he was not discouraged. If he had failed the first time, there was no reason why a second attempt should not succeed. In March 1770, Hearn started again to try and cross the unknown districts. This time he was alone with five Indians, for he had noticed the inability of the whites to endure fatigue excited the contempt of the natives. He had penetrated 500 miles when the severity of the weather compelled him to wait for a less severe temperature. He had had a terrible experience. At one time to have, indeed, more game than can be eaten, but more often to have no food whatever, and be compelled for a week at a time to gnaw old leather, pick bones which have been thrown aside, or to seek often in vain for a few berries on the trees, and lastly to endure fearful cold. Such is the life of an explorer in these arctic regions. Hearn started once more in April, wandered about the woods until August, and had arranged to spend the winter with an Indian tribe which had received him well, when an accident which deprived him of his quadrant compelled him to continue his journey. Privations, miseries, and disappointments had not quenched the ardor of Hearn's indomitable spirit. He started again on the 7th December, and penetrating westwards below the 60th parallel north latitude, he came to a river. Here he built a canoe, and went in it down the stream, which flowed into an innumerable series of large and small lakes. Finally, on the 13th July, 1771, he reached the Coppermine River. 
the indians with him now declared that they had been for some weeks in the country of the esquimaux and that they meant to massacre all they should meet of that hated race an encounter very soon took place coming says hearn upon a party of esquimaux asleep in their tents the indians fell upon them suddenly and i was compelled to witness the massacre of the poor creatures of twenty individuals not one escaped the sanguinary rage of the indians and they put to death with indescribable tortures an old woman who had in the first instance eluded them after this horrible carnage says hearn we sat down on the grass and made a good dinner off fresh salmon here the river widened considerably had hearn arrived at its mouth the water was still quite sweet there were however signs of a tide on the shores and a number of seals were disporting themselves in the water a quantity of whale blubber was found in the tents of the esquimaux everything in fact combined to prove that the sea was near hearn seized his telescope and saw stretching before him a huge sheet of water dotted with islands there was no longer any doubt it was the sea on the thirtieth june hearn got back to english posts after an absence of no less than a year and five months end of section forty four Recording by Kyle Strand, Washington. Section 45 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 4. The Two Americas, B. The company recognized the immense service just rendered by Hearn by appointing him governor of Fort Prince of Wales. During his expedition to Hudson's Bay, La Perouse visited this post, and there found the journal of Samuel Hearn's expedition. The French navigator returned it, on condition that he would publish it. We do not know why its appearance in accordance with the promise given by the English traveller to the French sailor was delayed until 1795. Not until the close of the 18th century did the immense chain of lakes, rivers, and portages become known, which, emanating from Lake Superior, receive all the waters flowing from the Rocky Mountains and divert them to the Arctic Ocean. It was to the brothers Frobisher, fur traders, and to a Mr. Pond, who reached Athabasca, that their discovery is partially due. Thanks to their efforts, traveling in these parts became less difficult. One explorer succeeded another, posts were established, and the country was opened to all comers. Soon after, a rumor was spread of the discovery of a large river flowing in a northwesterly direction. It was Alexander Mackenzie who gave his name to it. Starting on the 3rd June, 1789, from Fort Chippewyan, on the southern shores of the Lake of the Hills, accompanied by a few Canadians and several Indians who had been with Samuel Hearn, he reached 67 degrees, 45 minutes, north latitude, where he heard that the sea was not far off on the east, but that he was even nearer to it on the west. It was evident that he was quite close to the northwestern extremity of America. On the 12th of July, Mackenzie reached a large sheet of shallow water covered with ice, which he could not believe to be the sea, though no land could be seen on the horizon. It was, however, the northern ocean, as he became assured when he saw the water rising, although the wind was not violent. The tide was coming in. The traveller then gained an island at a little distance from the shore, from which he saw several whales gambling in the water. He therefore named the island, which is situated in north latitude 69 degrees 11 minutes, Whale Island. On the 12th September, the expedition safely returned to Fort Chippewyan. Three years later, Mackenzie, whose thirst for discovery was unslaked, ascended Peace River, which rises in the Rocky Mountains. In 1793, after forcing his way across this rugged chain, he made out on the other side the Tacuchi Tessie River, which flows in a southwesterly direction. In the midst of dangers and privations more easily imagined than described, 
Mackenzie descended this river to its mouth below Prince of Wales Islands. There he wrote with a mixture of grease and vermilion the following laconic but eloquent inscription on a wall of rock. Alexander Mackenzie came from Canada over land July 22, 1793. On the 24th August he re-entered Fort Chippewyan. In South America, no scientific expedition took place during the first half of the 18th century. We have now only to speak of Condamine. We have already told of his discoveries in America, explaining how, when the work was done, he had allowed Bougnet to return to Europe, and left Jesu to continue the collection of unknown plants and animals which was to enrich science, whilst he himself went down the Amazon to its mouth. Condamine, says Maury in his Histoire de l'Académie des Sciences, quote, may be called the Humboldt of the eighteenth century. An intellectual and scientific man, he gave proof in this memorable expedition of an heroic devotion to the progress of knowledge. The funds granted to him by the king for his expedition were not sufficient. He added one hundred thousand livres from his private purse, and the fatigue and suffering he underwent led to the loss of his ears and legs. The victim of his enthusiasm for science, on his return home he met with nothing but ridicule and sarcasm from a public who could not understand a martyr who aimed at winning anything but heaven. In him was recognized not the indefatigable explorer who had braved so many dangers, but the infirm and deaf Monsieur de Condamine, who always held his ear-trumpet in his hand. Content, however, with the recognition of his fellow savants, to which Buffon gave such eloquent expression in his reply to the address at his reception at the French Academy, Condamine consoled himself by composing songs, and maintained until his death, which was hastened by all he had undergone, the zeal for information on all subjects, even torture, which led him to question the executioner on the scaffold of Damiens. End quote. Few travellers before Condamine had had an opportunity of penetrating into Brazil. The learned explorer hoped, therefore, to render his journey useful by making a map of the course of the river, and putting down all his observations on the singular costumes worn by the natives of that little frequented country. After Oriana, whose adventurous trip we have related, Pedro de Ursua was sent in 1559 by the Viceroy of Peru to seek for Lake Parima and the El Dorado. He was murdered by a rebel soldier, who committed all manner of outrages on his way down the river, and finished his course by being abandoned on Trinity Island. Efforts of this kind did not throw much light on the course of the river. The Portuguese were more fortunate. In 1636 and 1637, Pedro Tejera, with forty-seven canoes and a large number of Spaniards and Indians, followed the Amazon as far as the junction of its tributary the Napo, and then ascended, first it, and afterwards the Coca, to within thirty miles of Quito, which he reached with a few men. The map drawn up by Sanson after this trip, and as a matter of course copied by all geographers, was extremely defective and until 1717 there was no other. At that time the copy of a map drawn up by Father Fritz, a German missionary, came out in volume 12 of the Lettres Edifiantes, a valuable publication containing a multitude of interesting historical and geographical facts. In this map it was shown that the Napo is not the true source of the Amazon, and that the latter, under the name of the Marañón, issues from Lake Guanuco, thirty leagues east of Lima. The lower portion of the course of the river was badly drawn, as Father Fritz was too ill when he went down it to observe closely. Leaving Tarqui, five leagues from Cuenca, on the 11th May, 1743, Condamine passed Zaruma, a town once famous for its gold mines, and having crossed several rivers on the hanging bridges, which look like huge hammocks slung from one side to the other, reached Loxa, four degrees from the line, and four hundred fathoms lower than Quito. Here he noticed a remarkable difference of temperature, and found the mountains to be mere hills compared with those of Quito. 
between Loxa and Jaén de Bracamoros, the last buttresses of the Andes were crossed. In this district, rain falls every day throughout the year, so that a long stay cannot be made there. The whole country has declined greatly from its former prosperity. Loyola, Valladolid, Jaén, and the greater number of the Peruvian towns at a distance from the sea, and the main road between Cartagena and Lima, were in Condamine's time little more than hamlets. Yet forests of coconut trees grow all around Jaén, the natives thinking no more of them than they do of the gold dust brought down by their rivers. Condamine embarked on the Chincipe, wider here than the Sun at Paris, and went down it as far as its junction with the Marañón, beyond which the latter river becomes navigable, although its course is broken by a number of falls and rapids, and in many places narrows till it is but twenty fathoms wide. The most celebrated of these narrows is the Pongo, or Gate, of Manseriche, in the heart of the Cordillera, where the Amazon has hewn for itself a bed only fifty-five fathoms wide, with all but perpendicular sides. Condamine, attended only by a single negro, met with an almost unparalleled adventure on a raft in this pongo. The stream, he says, quote, the height of which had diminished twenty-five feet in thirty-six hours, continued to decrease in volume. In the middle of the night, part of a large branch of a tree caught between the woodwork of my boat, penetrating further and further as the latter sunk with the water, so that if I had not been awake and on guard at the time, I should have found myself hanging from a tree on my raft. The least of the evils threatening me would have been the loss of my journals and notebooks, the fruit of eight years of work. Fortunately, I eventually found means to free my raft and float it again. End quote. In the midst of the woods near the ruined town of Santiago, where Condamine arrived on the 10th July, lived the Hibaro Indians, who had been for a century in revolt against the Spaniards, who tried to force them to labor in the gold mines. Beyond the Pongo of Manseriche, a new world was entered, a perfect ocean of fresh water, a labyrinth of lakes, rivers, and channels, set in an impenetrable forest. Although he had lived in the open air for more than seven years, Condamine was struck dumb by this novel spectacle of water and trees only, with nothing else besides leaving Borja on the 14th July, the traveller soon passed the mouth of the Morona, which comes down from the volcano of Sangue, the ashes from which are sometimes flung beyond Guayaquil. He next passed the three mouths of the Pastaca, a river at this time so much swollen that the width of no one of its mouths could be estimated. On the 19th of the same month, Condamine reached Laguna, where Pedro Maldonado, governor of the province of Esmeraldas, who had come down the Pastaca, had been waiting for him for six weeks. At this time Laguna was a large community, of some thousand Indians capable of bearing arms, who recognized the authority of the missionaries of the different tribes. In making a map of the course of the Amazon, says Condamine, quote, I provided myself with a resource against the ennui of a quiet village with nothing to break the monotony of the scenery, although that scenery was new to me. My attention was continually on the strain, as, compass and watch in hand, I noted the deflections in the course of the river, the time occupied in passing from one bend to another, the variations in the breadth of its bed and in that of the mouths of its tributaries, the angle formed by the latter at the confluence, the position and size of the islands, and above all the rate of the current and that of the canoe. Now on land and now in the canoe, employing various modes of measurement, which it would be superfluous to explain here, every instant was occupied. I often sounded and measured geometrically the breadth of the river and that of its tributaries. I took the height of the sun at the meridian every day, and I noted its amplitude at its rising and setting wherever I went. End quote. On the twenty fifth July, after having passed the Tigre River, Condamine came to a new mission station, that of a tribe called Yameos, recently rescued from the woods by the fathers. Their language is difficult to learn, and their mode of pronouncing it extraordinary. 
some of their words are nine or ten syllables long and yet they can only count up to three they use a kind of pea shooter with great skill firing from it small arrows tipped with a poison which causes instantaneous death the following day the explorer passed the mouth of the ucayale one of the most important of the tributaries of the marañon and which might even be its source beyond it the main stream widened sensibly condamine reached on the twenty seventh the mission station of the omaguas formerly a powerful nation whose dwelling extended along the banks of the amazon for a distance of two hundred leagues below the napo originally strangers in the land they are supposed to have come down some river rising in granada and to have fled from the spanish yoke the word omagua means flathead in peruvian and these people have the singular custom of squeezing the foreheads of newborn babies between two flat pieces of wood to make them as they say resemble the full moon they also use two curious plants the floripondio and the curupa which makes them drunk for twenty-four hours and causes very wonderful dreams so that opium and hashish have their counterparts in peru cinchona ipacacuana simaruba sarsparilla guayacum cocoa and vanilla grow on the banks of the marañon as does also a kind of india rubber of which the natives make bottles boots and syringes which according to condamine require no piston they are of the shape of hollow pears and are pierced at the end with a little hole into which a pipe is fitted this contrivance is much used by the omaguas and when a fete is given the host as a matter of politeness always presents one to each of his guests who use them before any ceremonial banquet changing boats at san joaquin condamine arrived at the mouth of napo in time to witness during the night of the thirty first july or the first august the immersion of the first satellite of jupiter so that he was able to determine exactly the latitude and longitude of the spot a valuable observation from which all other positions on the journey could be calculated pevas which was reached the next day is the last of the spanish missions on the marañon the indians collected there were neither all of the same race nor all converts to christianity they still wore bone ornaments in the nostrils and lips and had their cheeks riddled with holes in which were fixed the feathers of birds of every color st paul is the first portuguese mission there the river is no less than nine hundred fathoms wide and often rises in violent storms the traveller was agreeably surprised to find the indian women possessed of pet birds locks iron keys needles looking-glasses and other european utensils procured at pata in exchange for cocoa the native canoes were much more convenient than those used by the indians of the spanish possessions they are in fact regular little brigantines sixty feet long by seven wide manned by forty oarsmen between st paul and quarry several large and beautiful rivers flow into the amazon on the south the ute yuruca tefe and quarry on the north the putumayo and yupura on the shores of the last named river lives a cannibal race here tejera set up a barrier on the twenty sixth june sixteen thirty nine which was to mark the frontier between the district in which the brazilian and peruvian languages respectively were to be used in dealing with the indians purus river and the rio negro connecting the orinoco with the amazon the banks dotted with portuguese missions under the direction of the monks of mount carmel were successively surveyed the first reliable information on the important geographical fact of the communication between the two great rivers is to be found in the works of condamine and his sagacious comments on the journeys of the missionaries who preceded him it was in these latitudes that the golden lake of parame and the fabulous town of manoa del dorado are said to have been situated here too lived the manaos indians who so long resisted the portuguese now were passed successively the mouth of the madeira river so called on account of the quantity of timber which drifts down from it the port of pauxis beyond which the marañon takes the name of the amazon 
and where the tide begins to be felt, although the sea is more than two hundred miles distant, and the fortress of Tapayos, at the mouth of a river coming down from the mines of Brazil, on the borders of which live the Tupinambas. Not until September did the mountains come in sight on the north, quite a novel spectacle, since for two months Condamine had not seen a single hill. They were the first buttresses of the Guiana chain. On the 6th September, opposite Fort Paru, Condamine left the Amazon and passed by a natural canal to the Hingu River, called by Father Dacuna the Paramaribo. The port of Curupa was then reached, and lastly Para, a large town with regular streets and houses of rough or hewn stone. To complete his map, the explorer was obliged to visit the mouth of the Amazon, where he embarked for Cayenne, arriving there on the 20th February, 1774. This long voyage had the most important results. For the first time, the course of the Amazon had been laid down in a thoroughly scientific manner, and the connection between it and the Orinoco ascertained. Moreover, Condamine had collected a vast number of interesting observations on natural history, physical geography, astronomy, and the new science of anthropology, then in its earliest infancy. End of section 45 Recording by Tricia G. Section 46 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2, Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century, by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 4, The Two Americas, C. We have now to relate the travels of a man who recognized, better than any one else had done, the connection between geography and the other physical sciences. We allude to Alexander von Humboldt. To him is due the credit of having opened to travelers this fertile source of knowledge. Born at Berlin in 1759, Humboldt's earliest studies were carried on under Campy, the well-known editor of many volumes of travels. Endowed with a great taste for botany, Humboldt made friends at the University of Göttingen with Forster the Younger, who had just made the tour of the world with Captain Cook. This friendship, and the enthusiastic accounts given of his adventures by Forster, probably did much to rouse in Humboldt a longing to travel. He took the lead in the study of geology, botany, chemistry, and animal magnetism and to perfect himself in the various sciences, he visited England, Holland, Italy, and Switzerland. In 1797, after the death of his mother, who objected to his leaving Europe, he went to Paris, where he became acquainted with Aimé Bonpland, a young botanist, with whom he at once agreed to go on several exploring expeditions. It had been arranged that Humboldt should accompany Captain Bowden, but the delay in the starting of his expedition exhausted the young enthusiast's patience, and he went to Marseilles with the intention of joining the French army in Egypt. For two whole months he waited for the sailing of the frigate which was to take him, and, weary of inaction, he went to Spain with his friend Bonplan in the hope of obtaining permission to visit the Spanish possessions in America. This was no easy matter, but Humboldt was a man of rare perseverance. He was thoroughly well informed, he had first-rate introductions, and he was, moreover, already becoming known. In spite, therefore, of the extreme reluctance of the government, he was at last authorized to explore the Spanish colonies, and take any astronomical or geodesic observations he chose. The two friends left Coruna on the 5th June, 1799, and reached the Canaries thirteen days later. Of course, as naturalists, they were in duty bound not to land at Tenerife without ascending the peak. Scarcely any naturalist, says Humboldt in a letter to La Maturie, quote, who, like myself, has passed through to the Indies, 
has had time to do more than go to the foot of this colossal volcano and admire the delightful gardens of orotava fortunately for me our frigate the pizarro stopped for six days i examined in detail the layers of which the peak of Teide is composed we slept in the moonlight at a height of twelve hundred fathoms at two o'clock in the morning we started for the summit where we arrived at eight o'clock in spite of the violent wind the great heat of the ground which burnt our boots and the intense cold of the atmosphere i will tell you nothing about the magnificent view which included the volcanic islands of lancerote canaria and gomera at our feet the desert twenty leagues square strewn with pumice stone and lava and without insects or birds separating us from thickets of laurel trees and heaths or of the vineyards studded with palms banana and dragon trees the roots of which are washed by the waves we went into the very crater itself it is not more than forty or sixty feet deep the summit is one thousand nine hundred four fathoms above the sea level as estimated by borda in a very careful geometric measurement the crater of the peak that is to say of the summit has been inactive for several centuries lava flowing from the sides only the crater however provides an enormous quantity of sulphur and sulphate of iron end quote. in july humboldt and bonpland arrived at cumana in that part of america known as terra firma here they spent some weeks in examining the traces left by the great earthquake of seventeen ninety seven they then determined the position of cumana which was placed a degree and a half too far north on all the maps an error due to the fact of the current bearing to the north near la trinidad having deceived all travellers in december seventeen ninety nine humboldt wrote from caracas to the astronomer lalande quote, i have just completed an intensely interesting journey in the interior of paria in the cordillera of coclar to mary and guiri i had two or three mules loaded with instruments dried plants etc we penetrated to the capuchin mission which had never been visited by any naturalist we discovered a great number of new plants chiefly varieties of palms and we are about to start for the orinoco and propose pushing on from it perhaps to san carlos in the rio negro beyond the equator we have dried more than sixteen hundred plants and described more than five hundred birds picked up numberless shells and insects and i have made fifty drawings i think that is pretty well in four months considering the broiling heat of this zone End quote. during this first trip humboldt visited the chima and guaruno missions he also climbed to the summit of the tumirikiri and went down into the guacharo cavern the entrance to which framed as it is with the most luxuriant vegetation is truly magnificent from it issues a considerable river and its dim recesses echo to the gloomy notes of birds it is the acheron of the chima indians for according to their mythology and that of the natives of orinoco the souls of the dead go to this cavern to go down into the guacharo signifies in their language to die the indians go into the guachado cavern once a year in the middle of summer and destroy the greater number of the nests in it with long poles at this time many thousands of birds die a violent death and the old inhabitants of the cave hover above the heads of the indians with piercing cries as if they could defend their broods the young birds which fall to the ground are opened on the spot their peritoneum is covered with a thick layer of fat extending from the abdomen to the anus and forming a kind of cushion between the legs at the time called at caripe the oil harvest the indians build themselves huts of palm trees outside the cavern and then light fires of brushwood over which they hang clay pots filled with the fat of the young birds recently killed this fat known under the name of the guachado oil or butter is half liquid transparent without smell and so pure that it can be kept a year without going rancid humboldt continues quote, 
we passed fifteen days in the caripe valley situated at a height of nine hundred fifty two castilian varas above the sea level and inhabited by naked indians we saw some black monkeys with red beards we had the satisfaction of being treated with the greatest kindness by the capuchin monks and the missionaries living amongst these semi-barbarous people end quote. from the caripe valley the two travellers went back to cumana by way of the santa maria mountains and the catuaro missions and on the twenty first november they arrived having come by sea at caracas a town situated in the midst of a valley rich in cocoa cotton and coffee yet with a european climate humboldt turned his stay at caracas to account by studying the light of the stars of the southern hemisphere for he noticed that several notably the altar the feet of the centaur and others seemed to have changed since the time of la calle at the same time he put his collections in order dispatching part of them to europe and most thoroughly examined some rocks with a view to ascertaining of what materials the earth's crust was here composed after having explored the neighbourhood of caracas and ascended the silla which although close to the town had never been scaled by any native humboldt and bonpland went to valencia along the shores of a lake called tacarigua by the indians and exceeding in size that of neuchatel in switzerland nothing could give any idea of the richness and variety of the vegetation but the interest of the lake consists not only in its picturesque and romantic beauty the gradual decrease in the volume of its waters attracted the attention of humboldt who attributed it to the reckless cutting down of the forests in its neighbourhood resulting in the exhaustion of its sources near this lake humboldt received proof of the truth of the accounts he had heard of an extraordinary tree the palo de la vaca or cow tree which yields a balsamic and very nutritive milk drawn off from incisions made in the bark the most arduous part of the trip began at porto caballo at the entrance to the llanos or perfectly flat plains stretching between the hills of the coast and the orinoco valley i am not sure says humboldt quote, that the first sight of the llanos is not as surprising as that of the andes end quote. nothing in fact could be more striking than this sea of grass from which whirls of dust rise up continually although not a breath of wind is felt at calaboso in the centre of this vast plain humboldt first tested the power of the gymnotus or electric eel large numbers of which are met with in all the tributaries of the Orinoco. The Indians, who were afraid of exposing themselves to the electric discharge of these singular creatures, proposed sending some horses into the marsh containing them. The extraordinary noise made by the shoes of the horses, says Humboldt, quote, made the eels come out of the ooze and prepare for battle. The yellowish livid gymnoti, resembling serpents, swam on the top of the water and squeezed themselves under the bodies of the quadrupeds which had disturbed them the struggle which ensued between animals so differently constituted presented a very striking spectacle the indians armed with harpoons and long canes surrounded the pond on every side and even climbed into the trees the branches of which stretched horizontally over the water their wild cries as they brandished their long sticks prevented the horses from running away and getting back to the shores of the pond, whilst the eels, driven mad by the noise, defended themselves by repeated discharges from their electric batteries. For a long time they appeared victorious, and some horses succumbed to the violence of the repeated shocks which they received upon their vital organs from every side. They were stunned and sank beneath the water." others panting for breath with manes erect and wild eyes full of the keenest suffering tried to fly from the scene but the merciless indians drove them back into the water a very few who succeeded in eluding the vigilance of the guards regained the bank stumbling at every step and lay down upon the sand exhausted with fatigue every limb paralyzed from the electric shocks received from the eels 
I never remember receiving a more terrible shock from a Leyden jar than I did from a gymnotus on which I accidentally trod just after it had come out of the water. End quote. The astronomic position of Calabozo having been determined, Humboldt and Bonpland resumed their journey to the Orinoco. The Uritiku, with its numerous and ferocious crocodiles, and the Apure, one of the tributaries of the Orinoco, the banks of which are covered with a luxuriant vegetation such as is only met with in the tropics, were successively crossed or descended. The latter stream is flanked on either side by thick hedges, with openings here and there through which boars, tigers, and other wild animals make their way to quench their thirst. When the shades of night shut in the forest, so silent by day, it resounds with the cries of birds and the howling or roaring of beasts of prey vying with each other as to which shall make the most noise while the uritico is inhabited by fierce crocodiles the apure is the home of a small fish called the carabito which attacks bathers with great fury often biting out large pieces of flesh it is only four or five inches long but more formidable than the largest crocodile and the waters it frequents are carefully avoided by the indians in spite of their fondness for bathing and the relief it affords them persecuted as they are by ants and mosquitoes our travellers went down the orinoco as far as the temi which is connected by a short portage with the cano pimicino a tributary of the rio negro the banks of the temi and the adjacent forests are often inundated and then the Indians make waterways two or three feet wide between the trees. Nothing could be more quaint or imposing than floating amongst the gigantic growths beneath their green foliage. Sometimes, three or four hundred leagues inland, the traveller comes upon a troop of fresh-water dolphins, spouting up water and compressed air in the manner which has gained for them the name of blowers. It took four days to transport the canoes from the Tenir to the Cano Pimicino, as a path had to be cleared with axes. The Pimicino flows into the Rio Negro, which is in its turn a tributary of the Amazon. Humboldt and Bonpland went down the Rio Negro as far as San Carlos, and then up the Casiquiaro, an important branch of the Orinoco which connects it with the Rio Negro. The shores of the Casiquiaro are inhabited by the Idapaminores, who live entirely on smoked ants. Lastly, the travellers went up the Orinoco nearly to its source, at the foot of the Duida volcano, where their further progress was stopped by the hostility of the Guajaribos and the Guayca Indians, who were skilful marksmen with the bow and arrow. Here was discovered the famous El Dorado Lake with its floating islets of talc. Thus was finally solved the problem of the junction of the Orinoco and the Marañón, which takes place on the borders of the Spanish and Portuguese territories, two degrees above the equator. The two travellers then floated with the current down the Orinoco, traversing by this means five hundred leagues in twenty-five days, after which they halted for three weeks at Angostura, to tide over the time of the great heat, when fever is prevalent, regaining Cumana in October 1800. My health, says Humboldt, quote, was proof against the fatigue of a journey of more than 1300 leagues, but my poor comrade Bonpland was, immediately on his return, seized with fever and sickness, which nearly proved fatal. A constitution of exceptional vigor is necessary to enable a traveller to bear the fatigue, privations, and interruptions of every kind with which he has to contend in these unhealthy districts with impunity. We were constantly surrounded by voracious tigers and crocodiles, stung by venomous mosquitoes and ants, with no food for three months but water, bananas, fish, and tapioca, now crossing the territory of the earth-eating Otomaques, now wandering through the desolate regions below the equator, where not a human creature is seen for 130 leagues. Few indeed are those who survive such perils and such exertions, fewer still are those who, having surmounted them, 
have sufficient courage and strength to encounter them a second time. End, quote. End of section 46. Section 47 of Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Travels and Travelers, Volume 2, Great Navigators of the Eighteenth Century, by Jules Verne. Second Part, Chapter 4, The Two Americas, D. We have seen what an important geographical discovery rewarded the perseverance of the explorers who had completed the examination of the whole of the district north of the Amazon, between Papayan and the mountains of French Guiana. The results obtained in other branches of science were no less novel and important. Humboldt had discovered that there exists amongst the Indians of the Upper Orinoco and the Rio Negro a race with extremely fair complexions, differing entirely from the natives of the coast. He also noticed the curious tribe of the Otomaques. These people, he says, quote, who disfigure their bodies with hideous paintings, eat nothing but loam for some three months, when the height of the Orinoco cuts them off from the turtles which form their ordinary food. Some monks say they mix earth with the fat of crocodiles' tails, but this is a very false assertion. We saw provisions made of unadulterated earth, prepared only by slow roasting and moistening with water." End quote. Amongst the most curious of the discoveries made by Humboldt, we must mention that of the curare, the virulent poison which he saw manufactured by the Catarapeni and Makiritare Indians, and a specimen of which he sent to the Institute with the Depiche, a variety of Indian rubber hitherto unknown, being the gum which exudes spontaneously from the roots of the trees known as hasio and cucurma, and dries underground. Humboldt concluded his first journey by the exploration of the southern districts of San Domingo and Jamaica, and by a short stay in Cuba, where he and his companions made several experiments with a view to facilitating the making of sugar, surveyed the coast of the island, and took some astronomical observations. These occupations were interrupted by the news of the starting of Captain Baudin, who, it was said, was to double Cape Horn and examine the coasts of Chile and Peru. Humboldt, who had promised to join the expedition, at once left Cuba, and crossed South America, arriving on the coast of Peru in time, as he thought, to receive the French navigator. Although Humboldt had throughout his long journey worked with a view to timing his arrival in the Peruvian capital to meet Baudin, it was only when he reached Quito that he ascertained that the new expedition was making for the Pacific by the way of the Cape of Good Hope. In May 1801, Humboldt, still accompanied by the faithful Bonpland, embarked at Cartagena, whence he proposed going first to Santa Fe de Bogotá, and then to the lofty plains of Quito. To avoid the great heat, the travellers spent some time at the pretty village of Turbaco, situated on the heights overlooking the coast, where they made the necessary preparations for their journey. In one of their excursions in the neighbourhood, they visited a very strange region, of which their Indian guides had often spoken under the name of Volcanitos. This was a volcanic district, set in a forest of palms, and of the tree called Tola, about two miles to the east of Turbaco. According to a legend, the country was at one time one vast collection of burning mountains, but the fire was quenched by a saint who merely poured a few drops of holy water upon it. In the centre of an extensive plain, Humboldt came upon some twenty cones of greyish clay, about twenty-five feet high, the mouths of which were full of water. As the travellers approached, a hollow sound was heard, succeeded in a few minutes by the escape of a great quantity of gas. According to the Indians, these phenomena had recurred for many years. Humboldt noticed that the gas which issues from these small volcanoes was a far purer azote than could then be obtained by chemical laboratories. 
santa fe is situated in a valley eighty six hundred feet above sea level shut in on every side by lofty mountains this valley appears to have been formerly a large lake the rio bogota which receives all the waters of the valley has forced a passage for itself near the tequendama farm on the southwest of santa fe beyond which it leaves the plain by a narrow channel and flows into the magdalena basin as a natural consequence were this passage blocked the whole plain of bogota would be inundated and the ancient lake restored there exists amongst the indians a legend similar to that connected with roland's pass in the pyrenees telling how one of their heroes split open the rocks and drained dry the valley of bogota after which content with his exploit he retired to the sacred town of iraca where he did penance for two thousand years inflicting upon himself the greatest torture the cataract of tequendama although not the largest in the world yet affords a very beautiful sight when swollen by the addition of all the waters of the valley the river a little above the falls is a hundred and seventy five feet wide but on entering the defile which appears to have been made by an earthquake it is not more than forty feet in breadth the abyss into which it flings itself is no less than six hundred feet deep above this vast precipice constantly rises a dense cloud of foam which falling again almost immediately is said to contribute greatly to the fertility of the valley nothing could be more striking than the contrast between the valley of rio bogota and that of the magdalena the one with the climate and productions of europe the corn the oaks and other trees of our native land the other with palms sugar canes and all the growths of the tropics one of the most interesting of the natural curiosities met with by our travellers on the trip was the bridge of Econonzo, which they crossed in september eighteen o one at the bottom of one of the contracted ravines known as cañons peculiar to the andes a little stream the rio sumapaz has forced for itself a narrow channel to cross this river would be impossible had not nature herself provided two bridges one above the other which are justly considered marvels of the country three blocks of rock detached from one of the mountains by the earthquake which produced this mighty fissure have so fallen as to balance each other and form a natural arch to which access is obtained by a path along the precipice in the centre of this bridge there is an opening through which the traveller may gaze down into the infinite depth of the abyss at the bottom of which rolls the torrent its terrible roar mingled with the incessant screaming of thousands of birds sixty feet above this bridge is a second fifty feet long by forty wide and not more than eight feet thick in the middle to serve as a parapet the natives have made a slender balustrade of reeds along the edges of this second bridge from which the traveller can obtain a fine view of the magnificent scene beneath him the heavy rain and bad roads made the journey to quito very exhausting but for all that humboldt and bonplan only halted there for an absolutely necessary rest quickly pressing on for the magdalena valley and the magnificent forests clothing the sides of the trinidu in the central andes this mountain is considered one of the most difficult to cross in the whole chain even when the weather is favorable twelve days at least are necessary for traversing the forests in which not a human creature is seen and no food can be obtained the highest point is twelve hundred feet above the sea level and the path leading up to it is in many parts only one foot wide the traveller is generally carried bound to a chair in a sitting posture on the back of a native as a porter carries a trunk we preferred to go on foot says humboldt in a letter to his brother quote, and the weather being very fine we were only seventeen days in these solitudes where not a trace is to be seen of any inhabitant the night is passed in temporary huts made of the leaves of the heliconia brought on purpose on the western slopes of the andes marshes have to be crossed into which one sinks up to the knees and the weather having changed when we reached them it rained in torrents for the last few days our boots rotted on our feet 
and we reached Cartago with naked and bleeding feet, but enriched with a fine collection of new plants. From Cartago we went to Popayan by way of Buga, crossing the fine Cauca Valley, and skirting along the mountain of Choca, with the Plantina mines for which it is famous. We spent October 1801 at Popayan, whence we made excursions to the basaltic mountains of Hulusuito and the craters of the Purace volcano, which discharge hydrosulfuric steam and porphyritic granite with a terrible noise. The greatest difficulties were met with in going from Papayan to Quito. We had to pass the Pasto Paramos, and that in the rainy season which had now set in. A Paramo in the Andes is a district some seventeen hundred or two thousand fathoms high, where vegetation ceases and the cold is piercing. We went from Popayan to Almaher, and thence to Pasto, at the foot of a terrible volcano, by way of the fearful precipices forming the ascent to the summit of the Cordillera, thus avoiding the heat of the Patia Valley, where one night will often bring on the fever known as the Calentura de Patia, lasting three or four months. End quote. The province of Pasto consists entirely of a frozen plateau, almost too lofty for any vegetation to thrive on it, surrounded by volcanoes and sulphur mines, from which spiral columns of smoke are perpetually issuing. The inhabitants have no food but batatas, and when they run short they are obliged to live upon a little tree called a chupaya, for which they have to contend with the bear of the Andes after being wet through night and day for two months and being all but drowned in a sudden flood accompanied by an earthquake near the town of ibarra humboldt and bonpland arrived on the sixth january eighteen o one at quito where they were received in cordial and princely style by the marquis of selva alegre quito is a fine town but the intense cold and the barren mountains surrounding it make it a gloomy place to stay in since the great earthquake of the fourth february seventeen ninety seven the temperature has considerably decreased and bouguet who registered it at an average of from fifteen to sixteen degrees would be surprised to find it varying from four to ten degrees romor cotopaxi and pinchincha antisana and ilinaza the various craters of one subterranean fire were all examined by the travellers a fortnight being devoted to each. Humboldt twice reached the edge of the Pinchincha crater, never before seen except by Condamine. I made my first trip, he says, quote, accompanied only by an Indian. Condamine had approached the crater by the lower part of its edge, which was covered with snow, and in this first attempt I followed his example. But we nearly perished. The Indian sank to the breast in a crevasse, and we found to our horror that we were walking on a bridge of frozen snow, for a little in advance of us there were some holes through which we could see the light. Without knowing it, we were in fact on the vaults belonging to the crater itself. Startled but not discouraged, I changed my plan. From the outer rim of the crater, flung as it were upon the abyss, rise three peaks, three rocks, which are not covered with snow, because the steam from the volcano prevents the water from freezing. I climbed upon one of these rocks, and on the top of it found a stone attached on one side only to the rock, and undermined beneath, so as to protrude like a balcony over the precipice. This stone was but about twelve feet long by six broad, and is terribly shaken by the frequent earthquakes, of which we counted eighteen in less than thirty minutes. To examine the depths of the crater thoroughly, we lay on our faces, and I do not think imagination could conceive anything drearier, more gloomy, or more awful than what we saw. The crater consists of a circular hole nearly a league in circumference, the jagged edges of which are surrounded by snow. The interior is of pitchy blackness, but so vast is the gulf that the summits of several mountains situated in it can be made out at a depth of some three hundred fathoms, so only fancy where their bases must be. I have no doubt that the bottom of the crater must be on a level with the town of Quito. 
Condamine found this volcano extinct and covered with snow, but we had to take the bad news to the inhabitants of the capital that the neighboring burning mountain is really active. End quote. Humboldt ascended the volcano of Antisana to a height of 2,773 fathoms, but could go no further, as the cold was so intense that the blood started from the lips, eyes, and gums of the travellers. It was impossible to reach the crater of Cotopaxi. On the 9th June, 1802, Humboldt, accompanied by Bonpland, started from Quito to examine Chimborazo and Tungurunga. The peak of the latter fell in during the earthquake of 1797, and Humboldt found its height to be but 2,531 fathoms, whilst in Condamine's time it was 2,620 fathoms. From Quito, the travellers went to the Amazon by way of Lactacunga, Ambato, and Rio Bamba, situated in the province laid waste by the earthquake of 1797, when 40,000 inhabitants were swallowed up by water and mud. Going down the Andes, Humboldt and his companions had an opportunity of admiring the remains of the Yega Road, leading from Cusco to Asue, and known as the Incas Road. It was built entirely of hewn stones, and was very straight. It might have been taken for one of the best Roman roads. In the same neighborhood are the ruins of a palace of the Inca Fupayupangi, described by Condamine in the minutes of the Berlin Academy. After a stay of ten days at Cuenca, Humboldt entered the province of Jaén, surveyed the Marañón as far as the Rio Napo, and with the aid of the astronomical observations he was able to make, supplemented Condamine's map. On the 23rd October, 1802, Humboldt entered Lima, where he successfully observed the transit of Mercury. After spending a month in that capital, he started for Guayaquil, whence he went by sea to Acapulco in Spanish America. The vast number of notes collected by Humboldt during the year he spent in Mexico and which led to the publication of his essay on spanish america would after what we have said of his previous proceedings be enough to prove if proof were needed what a passion he had for knowledge how indomitable was his energy and how immense his power of work at one and the same time he was studying the antiquities and the history of mexico the character customs and language of its people and taking observations in natural history, physical geography, chemistry, astronomy, and topography. The Tosco, Moran, and Guanajuato mines, which yield a profit of several million piastres per annum, first attracted the attention of Humboldt, who had early studied geology. He then examined the Jeruyo volcano, which, although situated in the center of an immense plain thirty-six leagues from the sea, and more than forty from any volcano, discharged earth on the twenty ninth September, 1759, and formed a mountain of cinders and clay seventeen hundred feet high. In Mexico, the travellers were able to obtain everything necessary to the arrangement of the immense collections they had accumulated, to classify and compare the observations each had taken, and to prepare their geographical map for publication. Finally, in January 1804, they left Acapulco to examine the eastern slopes of the Cordilleras and to take the dimensions of the two lofty Puebla volcanoes. Popocatépetl, says Desborough Cooley, quote, is always active, although nothing but smoke and ashes have issued from its crater for centuries. It is not only 2,000 feet higher than the loftiest mountains of Europe, but is also the loftiest mountain in Spanish America. End quote. In spite of the great quantity of snow which had recently fallen, Humboldt accomplished the ascent of the Cofre, thirteen hundred feet higher than the peak of Tenerife, obtaining from its summit an extensive and varied view, embracing the Puebla Plain and the eastern slopes of the Mexican Cordilleras, clothed with thick forests of liquid ambar, tree ferns, and sensitive plants. The travellers were able to make out the port of Vera Cruz, the castle of San Juan Duloya, and the seashore. 
this mountain owes its name of Kofre to a naked rock of pyramidal form which rises like a tower from its summit at a height of five hundred feet after this last trip humboldt went down to vera cruz and having fortunately escaped the yellow fever then decimating the population he set sail for cuba where he left the greater part of his collection going thence to philadelphia there he remained a few weeks to make a cursory study of the political constitution of the united states returning to europe in august eighteen o four the results of humboldt's travels were such that he may be justly called the discoverer of equinoctial america which before his time had been explored without becoming really known while many of its innumerable riches were absolutely ignored it must be fully acknowledged that no traveller ever before did so much as humboldt for physical geography and its kindred sciences he was the very ideal of a traveller and the world is indebted to him for important generalizations concerning magnetism and climate whose results are plainly seen in the isothermal lines of modern maps the writings of humboldt mark an era in the science of geography and have led to many further researches. End of section 47